After a thousand days in hardcore Minecraft, I've built more than 35 unique projects from a starter home to a massively overpowered XP farm. In between, I cleared more than 500,000 stone and other blocks from my mega base and built up this starter village. This is the complete story of days 0 to 1000 from start to finish and contains more than 240 hours of gameplay. Thank you so much for watching. We are what's left of the ancient race. Now we float in space on this ship and others like it. Let me explain. You see, Rendog's recent documentation of the Minecraft Gigaverse makes a lot of sense. If only we could find a way forward from here. In the beginning, there was only one world, but something unexpected and strange happened. A strange energy surged. It glitched and took over. We aren't sure where this energy came from, but maybe from opening portals to other dimensions. Hostile creatures began appearing out of thin air. People turned to zombies and were able to infect other people. Lightning mixed with this new force and caused strange reactions, where pigs turned to men, men to witches. It acted as a conduit to supercharge others. The pig men sought to escape to another dimension and tried to build iron golems as we had done, but they made something far more monstrous. Other friends escaped to the end, but quickly ran out of food as it was difficult to survive there. They turned to the native chorus fruit, but, well, we know what that did to them. Now, strange mobs wander almost every galaxy, world, and dimension. We tried to escape underground. We allied with strong protectors to keep us safe while we researched, but even they turned on us as their infection spread. Eventually, we had to leave everything behind. Now our original world is gone. In its place are an uncountable number of new worlds to explore, but many end up inhospitable. We know in today's Gigaverse there are four regions called Rifts. There's Vanilla, Modded, Dungeons, and Legends. Within each Rift there are millions of galaxies, more than we could ever know. Each galaxy is home to many, many worlds. Some are familiar to us, others much less so. Some we're only finding out about now. Some we explore with our friends, while others we journey to alone. And now, I need to find a new world. Let's go vanilla, single player galaxy, HC-7. All right, Rad, let's just go already. Everyone's waiting. Hi again. This is HC7, my seventh hardcore world. In this world, I'll attempt to survive 10,000 days while building, resource gathering, and taming this world like I've never done. 10,000 days is a lot. And to keep things interesting, every 1,000 days, I'll give you guys a vote to see if you want me to stay in this world or start completely over. In order to complete this world's goal, we also have one rule. No TNT duping until all advancements are completed. This isn't my first run, so I'm not planning to stay in the early game for months, but I do enjoy the early game, so I'm not going to rush it either. We'll build a home, gather and start all of the necessities, work with our villagers, and start some important farms. Then we'll head to the end, kill ourselves a dragon, and get the elytra before coming home. My favorite strategies for the early game are chest boats for shipwrecks, treasure maps, moss, cactus, bamboo, and saplings, or a stony peaks where you can get a lot of coal and iron and make the early game really easy. Looks like there's a stony peak right there, actually. I saw a village behind me so I can get a bed and some food before we head up. Let's make some planks, our first crafting table, get some sticks, and this wooden pick. We'll dig right into the wall here and upgrade everything pretty quickly. So let's talk about goals for this world. In addition to 10,000 days, I do want to complete all advancements. I also want to build and complete a mega base. I have an idea what that's gonna look like and I'm really excited for you guys to see it. I've never built anything nearly as big or as detailed, but I'm gonna focus a lot of our time in this series on building way more than I normally do. In the beginning, that will be a starter home, eventually moving into a bigger place that we can live in while we build our mega base, and of course, village and structure upgrades, fun builds, and those farms that I mentioned. If I waste too much time on adventure, or fluffing around, or even AFK, you guys will kick me out of the world after each thousand day vote. So I'm gonna need to keep making progress. Let's grab food, a bed, and any other resources we can before we head to that stony peak to see how big it is. All this hay will definitely get us started with some bread, it's good to have food early game. Best part of a savannah village though is the orange bed, orange my favorite color. There's a lot of hay in this village. I think I'll leave this one, uh, this one down here alone. This is hardcore, and that looks like a reset. I don't know if I've ever seen a village with this many hay piles. Well, I wasn't planning to stay at spawn when I dropped into this world, but we have a nice village, a stony peaks, ocean access right behind us. We'll head up to the stony peaks next. If you've seen my safe seeds video, you know stony peaks is an early game cheat code, and I'm going to exploit that a bit. 
Up here we're going to find a ton of coal, iron, even some emeralds before we've done anything in the world at all. Well check this out. Okay, that's ridiculous. I mine for practically no time at all. We have full iron, plus a sword, an axe, a pickaxe, a shovel, a shield, and a bucket. Well, I see an easy advancement in our future. Okay, back home, let's block these guys in for their own safety. How is there more hay here? Did we not get all this before? And there's more over there? Sure, we'll take it. Now, for this starter home, I want to be just outside the village somewhere close. That cliff over the water across there could work, so could the stony beach side over here. I really like how flat and open this is though, it should be easy enough to get around as well as survive here. I think this is it. Let's do a bit of light landscaping before we settle down. While I get this place ready, let me catch you up on the previous hardcore worlds. In HC1, I defeated all advancements in my very first try and then left the world alone. Then I started two throwaway hardcore worlds and died early in both. HC4 is my 117 world that's on YouTube. Unfortunately, I abandoned that one after 118 was released. HC5 was going well until a sniper blaze shot me off a fortress. I landed in the one spot a piglin thought was his. Rip me. HC6 is my ongoing Twitch and livestream series. I don't know if we'll continue it, but it exists. I've never really been ready like this though. This is HC7, the world I've been building up to. This is the one I want to build into something amazing. I've lived in three, died in three. This one's the tiebreaker. We'll drop our furnaces, crafting table, and a chest there. We can call this home for now. That's at negative 10 and 95. Cool, looks like we have a pillager outpost just around this corner. Maybe they're holding in a layer three hostage? We can work our way a bit closer to see what we can see, but I don't see anything. Nah, it doesn't look like it. Oh well. This guy's obsessed with me. I tried to run away, but he won't let me. He's one of those annoying persistent guys that won't take no for an answer. Fine, let's get another advancement. And now you're stuck. We can actually get two off of you. All right, let's continue the adventure for all the sugarcane I'm gonna need for books and later on paper. And I found this mesa with a couple of pretty average mine carts. And then of course this one with our first diamond of the world. Not bad. Okay, we're gonna need all of the different types of wood. So let's grab some of this jungle now. We're gonna need some saplings. Ruined portals are nice to explore early on. We'll take the gold. Eventually. This cave looks cool, but it also looks like the end of a hardcore world. Eh, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. Oh, nice, a blacksmith. I have an idea. Let's grab this lava real quick for hot stuff. It I don't want to talk about it. Another ruined portal. These are awesome to find. More gold here. We should also check the chest on the other side here. Are you kidding me? Wait, what was in there? What a chest. Protection 4 gold armor, enchanted gold apple. Did I mention I have a notch apple on episode freaking one? Let's go! Anyways, this seed seems to have a ton of villages near spawn. This is about our fourth and our fifth. Eh, let's go home. What a fantastic start. Emeralds, a diamond, that notch apple. We need to get this sugarcane growing and make this hole a bit safer with some light terraforming. The last thing I need is to die to fall damage, something even that apple can't prevent. Speaking of protecting ourselves, we should light up our immediate home area to keep mobs away. I'll sleep most of the early nights away, but it's a good idea to deal with fewer hostile mobs if possible. It's one reason I love living against the ocean like this. We already have limited areas where mobs can spawn. Early game, there's like a million little things to do as well, like planting these pumpkin seeds and those saplings over there. Getting that advancement's nice though. The first actual project I need to take on is an iron farm. Early game iron farms aren't tremendously fast, but if you can start them before day 10, like I will here, they can run for the next 10,000 days and it'll be rare to run out of iron. If I do come close, we'll just build a much bigger one later. I'm going to build ENXO4's simple day one iron farm because, to be completely honest, it's by far the easiest, best early game iron farm, 
and it doesn't require a massive build around it to blend into the world. In fact, you'll normally barely see that it exists at all. We'll start with the six beds. You need three, but six makes it easier to drop them into the farm. Next, I'll need two slabs and one trap door. I'll need a boat to hold the zombie. You don't need a name tag or to throw the zombie an item with this design, so it is super easy. I'll need at least one ladder to get in and out of the farm. As a side note, while I'm collecting the materials for and building this farm, I am harvesting and replanting and harvesting and replanting. I just don't think you need to see every tree I cut down. Okay, let's start the farm. I have most of the materials we'll need now. We need to dig a three long, seven deep hole where we want the villagers to be, and at the bottom of that, clear out a three by three room that is also three high on the villager side. Facing the direction away from the hole above us, we'll place a trap door at the very top of the middle block and two slabs on the lower halves of the blocks on either side of that. Place the three beds facing what will become the zombie side. We're going to dig out the two tall hole behind the trap door, then expand that to be a two deep, three wide, and two high room, except for the middle, which needs to be three high, so the zombie can walk into the boat. Now behind that, I'll dig a staircase out to the surface, making sure that the bottom stair here is in the staircase part, not in the room. This is super important. Let's dig our way to the surface now and light every stair on the way out so golems and other mobs can't spawn here. And we'll put a torch on the villager side too. The boat needs to go in between these two middle blocks on the zombie side. Look at the line between the two and place it exactly there. Now go out and block off the very last stair so there's a two block drop down. Place the three beds with the pillow over the open original hole. Place trap doors like this on the zombie staircase and open those up. One block away from the bed and even with the original hole on either side, we're going to dig a trench five blocks away from the closest bed and make that nine long and empty out this rectangle until it's too deep. I'm glad we have iron tools at least. This would be a bit of work with a stone pickaxe or shovel. Thank you, Stony Peaks. And there we go. If you're building this in a dirt area, the next step isn't necessary, but I had to dig out one more row to add dirt there that I can hoe later so golems don't spawn here. If you don't, they'll spawn inside the wall and never be killed, thus turning your farm off until they decide to walk out, which they don't. It sucks. I'll show you later. We're going to make room for the chest and a way to access it from one side here. And then we're going to add in the chest a stair block over that, and a hopper going into the back. Put a ladder on one side to get in and out easily. Water will go in the back two corners to push the golems into the lava trap we'll set up now. We're going to put signs on the back of the staircase, and then the upper left and upper right of that. Put a temporary block just behind the hopper here, and a gate on top of that, and then open it up. We need to put a sign on top of the open gate, so I can label this one as Annex 04's Iron Farm, because, you know, credit matters. Now we just need the villagers and zombie in. Let's break beds and workstations so the villagers I trapped earlier will go to the beds I've set up. Working with villagers is always a nightmare, so do this however you like. I ended up using both beds and workstations to lure them over. Just drop three villagers into that original hole. And three. That's it. Sorry, we're all full now. No more. I need lava to finish this off. Ian does have a version without lava, so if you can't find any nearby, just look at his tutorial, which will be linked in the description for how to set up the farm without lava. It's much slower though, so I would take the time and go find some. Remove the temporary block under the gate. You're going to put the lava above the lower sign, the one that's on the stair. I'm just going to drop in, it's easier to do. And now all we need is to get a zombie in, which is far easier than you'd think it's going to be. You just go somewhere near where mobs have spawned, and zombies have a pretty large range to see you, so you can get close to them without triggering skellies, creepers, and spiders to come harass you. Walk him around the trapdoor until he falls in, then cover the hole so he doesn't burn when it turns daylight. He's going to walk into the boat now. I'm going to sleep and the farm should start before I even get out of bed. There we go. We can see the first iron golem dying already. So the area around this farm should be filled in so golems can't spawn anywhere except the 2D pole. I had to do a little troubleshooting on mine as the coastline was just too close. There we go. I fixed it. Let's grab some of this iron. That can go with our other ores. You can see what happens here if the dirt isn't turned to farmland. The golem has spawned inside the wall and is now a pain in my butt. So I'll fix that. Now that we have a working iron farm, we need to get an enchanting set up and work on materials we're missing. I headed out onto the ocean to look for new stuff to bring home. Oh, that's nice, a mushroom island. I haven't lived on one in hardcore before. We'll get coordinates for that. Maybe we'll do something here one day. Ah, oh, nice. Bamboo's always great to find. This is going to help our Emerald Empire plus Minecraft ASMR, am I right? That has to be one of the best sounds in the game, right? During my adventure, I found more villages, more ruined portals. No more apples, sadly. Then we worked on the leather we're going to need for all the books to make bookshelves that will go around our enchanting table. 
more villages, more villages. Oh, spruce, I need spruce. I wanna build with spruce, so we're gonna grab some spruce saplings while we're out here. And another village and another portal, and then it's time to go home. When I got home, I found we had invaders. My sword sucks, give me a second. Eh, dead invaders now. All right, I gotta start getting resources now, chop down a bunch of spruce, maybe start a sus mine shaft or something. I need resources so I can build a starter house. Last episode we explored the stony peaks and a little bit of our new world, and I built an iron farm. But today we need to move indoors. It's time to build a house and start improving our situation a bit. When we left off, I was just about to start a mine shaft to get the resources to build myself a house. About halfway down the mine shaft, I found the first mine diamonds of this new world. It's just a couple, but I'll take it. I really just want to dig my way down to bedrock and start some branch... That's... That's a long drop. I prefer the living part of being alive, so maybe we'll have to go back and go another way. This way is just branching off of the side of that. We'll try and go in this direction and just go around the big draw. Hmm. That's the same problem. Um, okay, so we'll just turn around and go completely the opposite direction. If I just mine down this way to bedrock... A couple blocks down, we're seeing the same thing. Unfortunately, it looks like we mined into the top of a very open giant cave roof. I went back up about 30 blocks, mined all the way back down to Deep Slate. We're still at the top of this. How large is this cave? Over and over, as many times as I tried this, we just kept running into the same cave. So I'm going to close this little mine shaft off. It just wasn't meant to be. I tried it another place, and on the very first try, we went all the way down to bedrock, including finding a nice vein of diamonds right here. I will take every single one of these. You can never get enough diamonds. And eight really early in the game. That's super helpful. Found a bunch of other resources along the way as well. I'll take all of this redstone for later projects. I'm definitely getting together a few resources. The cobblestone, deep slate, and some different wood, including lots of spruce. I'm going to need that. I could use some stone, though. I don't want to waste all my coal on smelting cobble, so I think we're going to need to set up our first villager trade for Silk Touch. Let's grab a couple of lecterns, my emeralds, and some books. I don't have many villagers left after dropping three into the iron farm, but this guy's the closest to me, so he'll do. You want to be a librarian, right? I'm going to suggest you just stay in this corner with some cobblestone right here. Cool. And if I remove this bottom bookshelf, I can simply place and check his trades, and then keep replacing the lectern. I find this much easier than the way a lot of people do this, and minecarts are probably even easier again, but we're not that far yet. It's still not even day 20. There's Silk Touch. Okay, before I put this on a pickaxe, I should set up my enchanting area and see what else we can get. Just need to craft the enchanting table, get myself 15 bookshelves, and set this up behind me. It won't stay outdoors for long, but for now, this, that, and this, and that'll do. If I finish placing those, add an anvil and grindstone. We'll check it out. Efficiency was pretty nice at level 30, but I'm only level 13. I'll take the unbreaking too. It's actually probably better to have the unbreaking at this stage anyways. Okay, where exactly am I building this? I need to do some measurements. Hmm, okay. So if I start from this corner here, I should be able to fit in a decent sized starter home on this flat beachfront area. I'll need to cut back the land here behind it, but I need dirt to terraform anyways, so it makes sense doing it together. I'm building using Andy as Yoda's 5x5 building technique to lay out the foundation of the house, and a few of my other early builds. This is my first attempt at a layout here. I like the 5x5s, it keeps me focused on what I want to build. I'm far from a professional at building in Minecraft, so I'll take all the help I can get. Let's get these foundation blocks in place and start to build up the outline of our frame. I want to strip all of these logs and then start building upward. What I've outlined here is not only the house, but a wraparound stone deck and a hanging side balcony with a small backyard overhang as well. We're going to maintain the same 5x5 cube as we build up. I've put the logs in my offhand so I can simply strip them as I place up. It's place, strip, place, and strip, and I'll do that for all the initial pillars. With my house outlined, I think I'll expand this land out here just a little and do some light terraforming. I actually think terraforming is one of the most relaxing and enjoyable parts of Minecraft, other than end rating. Can't wait to get to the end rating. I love it. As I mentioned, we're going to need to tear down a bit of this hill behind the house just to make a little more space. I'll just grab these dirt blocks and move them to the front and side yards. One thing I definitely don't love about early game is just how slow your tools are. I'm used to efficiency 5 tools on dirt, and this not being insta-mine is only slightly painful. Okay, I've already decided to expand the first floor. Most of my starter homes are either too small, and I immediately regret not building them slightly larger. Or they are way too big and they aren't starter homes. They're a project that takes me a long time to complete. So I've started slightly smaller than I would have liked here, and I'll just expand as it doesn't actually fit my needs. I may not be much of a builder, but I want to use this stone to honor the stony shores along my coast and the stony peaks above that pave the way for lots of progress in this world. If I were actually just moving to this village as my new home, I'd like to think about what natural resources are available and plentiful, and the stone feels like a nice tie-in. 
Let's build the first floor, add an entryway, and show you how it's coming along. So right here, I've marked out our front entrance. I'll just add some slabs to mark that. We can tear down this wall here and make it curve around to go inside the house. I can add a door frame to indicate where the front door will be, and then fill the floor in with some spruce planks. What are you looking for when you build your own starter homes? A cave with a door? Is it maybe a dirt box? Or are you more the spend a week on it so it's perfect kind of builder? Let me know in the comments. I'm just gonna fill in these last few wall bits and then I can work on the stone deck. I wanna wrap this deck from the front of the house around the right side and then put a bit of collapsed stone wall or a stacked stone wall on the outer edge of it. I want a pretty natural, almost rustic feel to the home. This building break is sponsored by I Need More Spruce again. Oh hey, Wandering Trader. Slime balls, wait, that's actually useful this early on. Huh, I turned around and he was gone, weird. Okay, something is still wrong with the iron farm. Spoiler alert, I'm not 200 IQ, but for now, we'll just push him back in. Back to work, I wanna outline the second story for my house. We have very limited space in here, so I'm gonna use a ladder to get up and down. And we'll put that right here, I think. While I'm building this up, let me tell you about my plans for the interior. I'm gonna have a bedroom space, of course, an enchanting area, a food and cooking zone, storage, and a few workstations nearby. Once I need more storage space and more room to expand, I'll upgrade to a much larger home for the mid-game as we start working toward the mega base that I have planned. We'll head to the nether soon, use some speedrunner tactics to find a fortress, kill a few endermen along the way, and then head toward the ender dragon. Unlike most of my previous runs, however, I do want to build a lot more in this world and create a real sense of belonging to it. That means spending time every episode doing some kind of building, whether that's a village upgrade, a farm, and the aesthetics around it, or just making something look super nice. Ow. Okay, the outline for the second story is now done. Let's take a look at that. It's looking pretty good. I love it so far. I have something different planned for the second story that also ties in with our surroundings. But let's finish this stone and brick wall first, then frame the doors in. Now we can close off some of these other options I was considering for doors. I think we'll keep this side door as a way down the shoreline. This is looking decent. I'm just going to square off those walls. Now we'll keep wrapping the front lawn around the front of the house, outlining that with dirt, and then filling it in. This is serving two purposes for me at the moment. I need the stone to actually build the home, and I want the dirt to start spreading around here so it looks nicer when I'm finished. I also hate the pods look here, so we'll eventually remove that entirely. Okay, so we're back up on the stony peaks now, and this is actually my idea for the second floor of the house. I want to use the calcite for two reasons. One, it looks pretty awesome. It's a great natural block to continue the theme of building using the materials that are around me. But also, in my very first hardcore world, I built the world's ugliest box house out of stone brick and polished diorite. So in a way, using stone, stone brick, and white stony block is a tribute to HC1, while hopefully showing off my much improved skills. God, that house was ugly. But I tried, right? That's all that matters. Okay, let's build up these walls with calcite. I grabbed around 10 stacks. We should be fine on material for now. This second floor mirrors the first and is using the 5x5 building system as well. If you don't know Andy as Yoda, check them out in the description below. I was a patron for a few months, so I got to look through the builds and learn whatever I could. Okay, we're almost done. That's looking pretty great. I love the contrast between the stone and the calcite. Gray and white look really good together. Let's build our way up to the attic and add a ceiling. We probably won't use the attic much, but we can decorate it later if we get the chance. Once that's in place, we can start outlining the roof, the balcony trims, and then move on to creating a roof line and plan the entire roof out. The pillars in the middle should be five tall, so I'll make these two outer pillars one and three. We've done that for all three edges of the outer roof. Okay, I've already decided that the enchanting area was a bit too small, so we're going to push this wall back. I'm just going to knock down the wall to the outside and then fill it in. Oh well, better to expand now than later. For the roof, I want to do a contrasting trim, and I had two ideas. I tried spruce and oak, but I think it's too light. When I try spruce and deep slate, it looks much better, contrasting up against those calcite white walls. I'm not terribly impressive at roofs, so I just kind of do that simple thing where you go stair, upside down stair, stair on top of that. I do know how to change the shape with full blocks and elevation and such, but I want to build more with slabs, walls, and other bits in the future as well. From this angle, you can see that I didn't push the left side of the roof far enough out, so we'll have to fix that later. I do love the contrast of the deep slate, as well as the block variety for a bit of texture and wear. And I love how the front section will come back to meet the main roof line. It's going to give the whole build a bit of shape and depth. And back inside, it's time to finish building in the attic floor and walls, using calcite between the pillars to set them apart. And outside, I'll start to add a bit of detail and shape with some stairs, slabs, and trap doors. We'll come back and connect these corner stairs with slabs later to finish the balconies and trim. People have asked me a lot about why I place doors the way I do. It's actually a trick. In hardcore or hard mode in Minecraft, zombies can break down doors. That isn't okay. I want my house to be a safe place to keep my most important things. 
Zombies, however, can only break closed doors. By placing them on the sides of the door frames, like I just did, they're actually closed when they appear open and open when they appear closed. That means if I think they're closed, a zombie thinks it's open and can't break it down. Problem solved. Also, they just kind of look better when inset that way. Let's add a bit of decoration now with a few plants, maybe some poppies from the iron farm, add those around the house here and there for a bit of color. Cool, let's see how we're going. Yeah, it's starting to take shape. I'm gonna add some windows, a bit more decor, and work on the balconies. Enjoy the music and I'll be back after this quick building montage. Seriously, guys? What the heck? Okay, I really like how this is coming out. Maybe I'm biased, but I think this is my best starter house ever. Let's get rid of some of these torches and light it up properly. Now we can start moving in. This enchanting setup is definitely the first to go. It keeps raining and nobody likes soggy books for breakfast. What? Anyway, I'm gonna soak touch these bookshelves, so it's gonna take me a minute, but it means I saved some extra wood, and every resource is valuable when you're less than 50 days into the game, so I'll spend a couple extra moments to do this right. I can also move my bed in. We'll make this a triple eventually, but for now, I have two on me. The enchantment table can go in front of this window here, and we can get the shelves set up around that. I'm going to try and not block off the windows. Add our anvil and our grindstone back. Move the lantern back a bit as well, I think. Now we can move all of this stuff inside. I want to keep the bulk stone and wood downstairs, my valuables next to my bed, and the rest of it can go up to the second floor where I can access it only when I need it. Also, I'm a fairly organized person, but breaking these chests so the stuff flies everywhere is kind of fun, I'm not gonna lie. I'll keep the sugarcane and bamboo separate, actually. We'll put those over near the village, because the paper and sticks will be used as trade bait later. Moving day. It was kind of fun. I really enjoy the big quality of life updates, and this house is certainly one of those. Check it all out. We have our enchanting setup done, bulk storage, valuables next to the bed. We're just gonna finish cleaning up outside, add a couple of paths, one to the waterfront and one toward the village here. My biggest need at the start of this episode was a place to live, and I think I've managed to create a small but beautiful place to call home. It certainly beats coming home to chests in the middle of a field. I will say that resource gathering is currently taking way too long with these awful tools, and we'll need to upgrade those soon. With our full enchanting setup ready to go, we just need to go kill some mobs and start to upgrade. I also, finally, fixed our iron farm. They were spawning on the stairs in front of the chests of all things. Last episode I built this home for myself, and living here is great. But today we need to upgrade our gear because, well, it's kind of basic and it definitely made building difficult. Let's head inside and we can get a bit of enchanting done here. I could upgrade my axe with efficiency 2. If I had 30 levels, that could have been efficiency 4. Let's combine that with our other iron axe and just like that, we're out of levels. Also, mining stone isn't too bad now. That's good because I'm going to need plenty of this for our builds. But mining deep slate and diamond levels is still quite a pain. Speaking of diamonds, we need more of you. Thank you. No, I saw this short. I'm prepared for this. 
As I was saying, give me these diamonds. Thank you. You can't go wrong with early game diamonds. Anyway, back to the story. Mining Deep Slate with an unenchanted pick is awful. Nobody wants to do this. This is the kind of thing Mr. Beast would set as a challenge, like the person who can mine the most Deep Slate with an unenchanted iron pick. Okay, more diamonds. Server, give me diamond. Okay. Only three of you are going to get that joke. Anyway. I came down here to show that mining Deep Slate with this pickaxe was terrible. And we've got three veins of diamonds since I've been down here. I got more diamonds actually just going pickaxe bad than I did when I was actually mining for diamonds. Kind of sad. I was trying to make a point, but let's just go back up to the surface. Okay. Ten diamonds, lots of redstone, plenty of gold, deep slate. We're back on level six, though, after a little bit of enchanting. Let's go kill this skeleton. I need your XP. Would you please die? Okay, thank you. Creepers and spiders aren't a bad option for XP. I don't suppose we're going to find a lot of endermen out here in the rainstorm. I need the spider string for a bow as well. I don't have any ranged weapons, and it makes mob hunting a bit more dangerous than I'd like. This is a, a bit slow. I probably just need to build a farm for XP, though. It's too early to build an enderman or a guardian farm, but I can't keep fighting mobs out here on the shore all night. Building a dark room mob farm is easiest over water. That way, if you fall off the gigantic pillar we need to build, you don't die. It's good not to die in hardcore. We need to build up at least 128 blocks above the surface of the water, but I'm also near the shore, so I'm going to go up a few more than that, too. We'll be able to get creepers, zombies, skeletons, and spiders out of this farm, although spiders are a bit of a pain and can clog up the farm. Now that we're here, I need to expand this platform out a little bit. And once I have a little bit of space to work, I'm going to make sure there's a torch up here and then jump off. Did you think I was kidding? Don't die, don't die, don't die. Okay, now I can add ladders all the way back up so we can get on and off the platform. I think I'm going to make the entire farm out of wood. We have a bunch of spruce, and I know it takes a lot of material to make it. I also don't want to use up the cobbles. It just kind of looks bad at this scale. Back up the platform, we'll start with a collection system. I'm going to start with a double chest and then expand out the platform so I can work all the way around it. I'm going to add four double chests surrounding a 2x2 two two area in the middle. And I'm going to run one hopper into each of those chests to fill up the middle area. Mobs are going to drop onto these hoppers where we'll kill them. Everything's going to go into the hoppers, then the chests. Some people don't use chests there, or they only use two. I find it fills up way too quickly on single player if you build this farm properly. So I always use four double chests and still regularly have to move drops out of them. I'm going to add some slabs above each double chest. Upper slabs are going to prevent creepers from seeing you and exploding and prevent baby zombies from escaping the farm and attacking. These corners aren't strictly necessary, but creepers can see you if you go into them. And I have a tendency to do that. I don't know why. So I put the blocks here to remind myself not to be quite so um, stupid. Now I need to build a tower around this 2x2 two two drop chute. I'm going to continue to use wood, but you could really use any full block except glass. Glass lets light in, and with the new spawning rules, this will drastically reduce your rates. Once I've built the tower up, I'm going to go out 8 blocks away from the 2x2 two two drop chute. Then at the end of that, on the ninth block, I'm going to go up 2, and then I'm going to go out 8 from that again. At the end of that second water channel, I'll also build up a wall that is too high. Okay, that's one high. Uh, two. There we go. This is kind of high up, and some parts of this are going to be over land, so I'll need to be a bit more careful. Now I just have to repeat the first water channel four times and put a barrier wall up too high on either side of each water stream. Now I just need to build some simple spawn platforms. This is basically just a floor that connects the two water channels together until this is completely full. Once the floor is done, I'll just put a too high wall all the way around all of this floor and repeat on all the other sides. I'll do this for all four of the connections where there's two water channels that will meet. And then once the lower floors are done, I'll have to build the upper ones and do the same size floor on either side of the upper channels as well. We're going to end up with 12 spawning platforms in total, which is plenty. Now I can add water that will sweep the mobs into the kill chamber. I brought up two buckets and I can just make an infinite water source while I'm up here and then remove that when I'm done. We're going to place trapdoors over every water covered block and close those down. Mobs are going to think they can just wander over these trapdoors. They're going to fall into the water. You know what happens after that. It's die, creeper, die. I'm also going to put as many trapdoors on the upper bit of the outer walls as I can. These trapdoors will prevent skeletons and zombies from spawning, which will drastically increase the rates of creeper spawn. I don't want to cover every spawnable spot, just most of them. Zombie drops are pretty useless and skeletons. Well, I only want one decent bow and then some arrows, and then it's just bone meal after that. Now I just have to cover the entire roof in lower slabs and this farm will work. I've let it fill up here so you can see how it's going. Unfortunately, the XP will get stuck in the hopper sometimes, like it will here. We can fix that by adding some carpet over each hopper, and then the XP will come directly to us. It's a pretty easy fix. Alright, let's look at how great this farm is already doing. 
When I started building the farm, I was on level six. Already with a few swings, I'm on 17, 18. I'm just gonna stay up here for a few minutes, I'm on 25. This is a heck of a lot better and safer and faster than killing mobs on that shoreline was. I do see one problem though. Sometimes mobs aren't falling down. I have a feeling it's because I didn't spider proof, so I went to check the footage. I did want some spider drops, but as you can see from the replay mod footage, because I didn't prevent spider spawns, it fills up quickly with spiders and then they clog the drop chute and nothing else can fall down. And then no new mobs can spawn and it slows down the farm. We're gonna have to fix this. I knew that would happen, but I didn't have wool so I was being lazy. All right, presto changeo, there's an hour of my life I'm never getting back. I had to remove a lot of the roof, shear a bunch of sheep, put these carpet bits up here so there are no three block spawnable spaces anywhere within the farm, but as you can see it's worked. Let's take a look at all the mobs in the farm now, it's much, much better. With that mob farm done now, it's just a matter of getting levels, enchanting, here we're a good fortune 3 efficiency 4 pick, and some better prot 3 leggings. Then we have to go back to the farm, get more levels, which is obviously working so much better now. Then it's more enchanting, another efficiency 4 on a book, and then we can add that to our pick to give us an unbreaking 3, fortune 3, and now efficiency 5 pickaxe. Back down to the deep slate level, oh yeah, that's better. You love to see this. Breaking deep slate isn't fun even with efficiency 5, but that's a lot better than efficiency 2. Finding diamonds is actually so much more rewarding the first time you have a fortune 3 pick to collect them with. I was so into this that I just stayed down and collected a few more diamonds. I wasn't really down here for the diamonds, I just wanted to test out the new pickaxe, but now that mining feels nicer, it's time to put in some stairs to our mineshaft to make getting up and down a lot easier. I will actually put a build around this later. It's a big build though, so I'm gonna need a lot of resources. For today's village slash personal building project, I wanted to make a little dock and a boathouse out front of our home. I talk a lot about the stony shoreline and how much I love living on the coast like this, I thought we should take the time to build up a welcoming dock for any ships that may come by. Unfortunately, the in-game recording did not save as my hard drive was full and I didn't notice. Video editing can be, yeah, weird like that. I mean, some parts of this needed to be shown from replay mod, but that footage had already been sped up. So now it's slowed down with super fast footage. And that, ladies and gents, is how you drop a ton of frames. Moving on, I started with a design that incorporated oak planks into the walls with stone. But I didn't like it, so I went back to all stone and stone brick. The strip spruce carried over from the house, and I stuck with this 5x5 building method that I've been using to create a little L-shaped boathouse. I wanted to create a little viewing platform on the second floor, so I built a small little room around that. The acacia template on the dock is what I thought the dock may look like. It's not staying, so I had to replace this with spruce planks, then add some stairs and a few support pillars near the land. I topped those with stone slabs and then built up some rails. The roof uses the same spruce deep slate color palette as my starter house, and the same stair, backward stair, stair angles to make it feel like part of the same build. Then I just had to connect the lower roof to the upper tower, and that was looking good. Originally I put in these glass panes to match the house as well, but I hated them here, so I replaced those with a fence which I think looks a ton better. The glass didn't really work for me when half the building is just open air, it looked too formal or something. The fence used this way looked a lot more like you'd actually see here, just a couple of cross beams to keep the mobs out. I feel like there's plenty of storage in the boathouse, I should probably add a few boats for rent, on the dock, I added a couple of barrels, some cargo being delivered, a couple of piers, and then added my boat. I really like how this looks now, I just need to remove this podzel. I'll need to grow all the spruce somewhere else because I just can't keep having it make my home look like cows pooed all over my lawn like a thousand times. Podzel's a great block in the right area, but this shoreline surely isn't it. Let's take a look through the completed boathouse and dock. Inside you have plenty of storage, crafting table, this open window here to provide service from. If I just hop out front, you can see it was looking pretty clean. When we head upstairs, we'll be able to go look from the deck that I wanted to build, and also there's an attic for a bit more storage if we need to use that. As we head down to the end of the dock, you'll see that I added a gate to keep mobs from attacking me while I'm down here. Only trident wielding drowns and phantoms are a real threat now. I also have my fishing rod and the fishing loot in this barrel on the end. I actually need to do a bit of fishing, but not with that rod. I've also upgraded my sword to a diamond sweeping edge sharpness sword. That's helping. Let's go enchant this diamond axe. That's efficiency 4, and then this chest plate with prot 3, not bad. When I went back up to the mob farm, I looked down at the work from the last few days. Seeing the house in the dock really made me want a boat out front, but not a little Minecraft boat. Okay, first of all, let's go enchant this book, and then my boots, and then if we just add the book to the iron chest plate we already have, protection 4 on breaking 3, that's not bad. Now let's build this boat. I'm going to need a sail. I can't believe I'm already shearing more sheep. This actually hurts me. Okay, let's put a temporary block at the top of this kelp so we can build off of this. I don't want the boat to be too big. The dock isn't meant for a cruise liner, of course. It's just a private little dock. 
We'll go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. That should be plenty long enough for what I want to build. I've seen a lot of small Minecraft boats, and while I'm not following a specific tutorial for this, I would say it's a mashup of probably three or four small boats I've seen plenty of times in the past. I just need to create a little shape at first and then refine that as I go. I like the way these stairs pointing out and the other ones pointing toward each other will give a little bit of a unique shape here. From there, it's just a couple of barrels, a crafting table. We'll figure out where we're gonna put the mast. Somewhere in maybe there's good. Once that's up, the sails can go on it. Then I just wanna add a crow's nest and finish out lining the boat's shape. Stairs are a real lifesaver on this build, as are the slabs. Everything on a small scale like this, it's super important to be able to create diagonals and curves. And doing all that at this tiny scale is really difficult. Now I just need to build up a room in the back here for a captain's cabin. It doesn't have to be huge, just a place to duck off and go to sleep. I'll give that a bit of shape, add a door to it, and a couple of trap doors, and voila! Let's extend the sail up the crow's nest, throw a bed in next to the chest. I'm going to widen this middle section of the boat so we can actually walk around the mast without having to jump around the side. It was just a little too cramped. And I'll just round the front bit here with some stairs. And let's just fix this one. I'm going to add a few lanterns to the fence post for some proper lighting. And then go up front as well and do the same thing. Alright, let's take a quick peek at it. Yeah, I think that's looking super nice. I didn't want to go overboard, just a little vessel that's coming into the dock. I'm really liking that. I need to make one more fix to the house before we move on. I never set the auto composter back up after we removed it, but the iron farm doesn't stop giving me poppies. I need to compost those, so let's quickly get the composter upstairs on the wall here with a chest below that and a chest above, and hoppers will just connect the two. Then we'll just need to fix the floor with slabs so we can reach into the upper chest. And then our last enchanting for the day, let's grab Lure 3 on this fishing rod, Power 4 on a book. We already have made a really decent bow with the mob farm, and this will make it up to Power 5. Well, I'm going to hang out and fish now. I'm desperately low on food and we'll need to take care of that next time, but a few cod and salmon will help in a pinch. Last episode we upgraded our gear a little bit and built a dock and a boat to celebrate, but I finished the episode very, very hungry and I was fishing just so I would have dinner. Yeah, this wasn't just a way to show off the dock. I really am living off my fishing rod now, every single time I eat. So today I need wood. Lots and lots of wood. Yeah, I guess that's something I've said now. But listen, it's true. To get all the oak wood I'm going to need for today, I need, yet again, better gear. Also, I'm pretty sure I need an observer, so we're going to have to go to the nether. I'm going to upgrade my armor so I don't die when I get there. The nether will be the hardest challenge in the world so far, and since it's hardcore and you all seem to like the series so far, I don't really want to die. We're moving the enchanting setup to the mob farm for convenience. I'm going to be here killing and enchanting and killing things for a while. Also, the audio for my endgame sounds corrupted, so imagine all the pretty XP sounds here. Ding ding, ding ding, ding level up, ding. The next thing on my agenda today is to start thinking about the future now. I'm going to need villagers soon. I think we only have four in the village. One is the silk touch guy, two are in a room together, and there's one trapped up at the very top of the village, but I think that's it. I've had quite a few disappear mysteriously, and if any more leave, we're in trouble. So I kind of want to breed more, get a villager trade sorted soon, and that means I'm going to need more food, carrots and potatoes in this case. That's simple enough, we'll just get a little farm set up here. What I'm going to do today is collect some local animals, build a barn to house them, and inside the barn, tuck away a cow cooker. This will give me all the food I need until we can get to the nether roof and build ourselves a hogland farm, or something even better. I think I'm going to build the barn in this area here, so I'll need to move the sugarcane and terraform this area. I want to keep it close to my house in the village so I can access it often. I've had sugarcane growing since almost day one, so I've collected quite a lot already, but we're going to need to replant this. Long term I'm thinking about all the rockets I want so I can fly everywhere, and short term I'm also thinking once I set up villagers I can trade paper for emeralds. With that put aside, we can start the process of filling in the holes in the two small ponds, flattening the ground and preparing the area for my build. I'm also going to replace the sand with dirt to both make it look better, but also so I can use the sand for glass or TNT later. Running in circles and placing dirt has made me a very hungry boy, so I had to do a little bit more fishing in between projects. I also managed to catch a fishing rod. It's quite an upgrade, so that worked out pretty well. I'm also maintaining my farming and expanding my carrot plot. 
I decided to plant my sugar cane over near these carrots so I can harvest both at once when I come by. Having all these manual small farms in one area just makes the most sense and keeps the rest of my home area looking clean. I'm putting in four long rows that I can harvest quickly. I know I'll automate sugarcane later, so I'm not trying to solve any long-term world issues. I just want to have some here and there. After we take on the dragon, I'll want netherite fairly soon, so I'm considering making a separate creeper gunpowder farm for TNT. You think that's something we should do? Yes, I realize I'm back at the mob farm now. I wanted to combine my fishing rod with the new one. It should help. I still have less than half a stack of food, and I've got a long ways to go before this barn is done. Sorry, I know I'm neglecting my sound effects duties. Ding! 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 I guess I'll fix that for next episode, huh? With that fish cooked, I've got about a stack now. You're probably wondering why I'm here. You see, I made the dumb mistake of thinking it would be funny if I had a goat horn to celebrate milestones with, but there was no goat horn in this outpost. I did manage an advancement or two, so I want to show you how I got those. I got old Betsy there, almost got knocked off to what might have been my death. These pillagers were actually quite pestery, so I shot this guy, and who's the pillager now? That's enough screwing around though. I need to get rid of all this spruce wood so I can plant oak here. Today's build won't be the spruce and deep slate palette I've been using, but rather a nice oak and deep slate palette. It all makes sense right next to a bright red and orange acacia village. I know, but it's what I like. Before I go kidnap, I mean, find and coax the animals home, I need to build a quick pen for each of them. I'm going to keep cows, pigs, sheep, and chickens here, so we'll need four pens. I'll also bring horses, donkeys, mules, and other animals home later, but this should do for now. Let's get some animals. Listen, I'm already down over 20 food. I don't want to talk about it. Yes, I'm back here on the dock. Yes, I'm fishing again. But I also got this great Frostwalker 2 book. That'll help as we build the gold farm later on. Hope I don't forget that I have that. Finally, our oak trees have grown, so we can collect these. I'll need oak logs and planks for the barn. I need a lot of oak, and I know this won't be enough, but it's a start at least. Also, I decided to move my bamboo over to the manual farm area. I want a lot of bamboo because I can trade the sticks for emeralds as my main trade currently. Just to get more quickly, I also filled up the entire inner parts of the barn with bamboo saplings for one extra large harvest. Yes, I'm aware how much bamboo this is. It's okay. This guy up here is my Fletcher. I like him. He takes all these sticks and gives me shiny emeralds for them. He's also trapped in this house, which is good. It means he has no idea how much bamboo I have. I am actually aware that this episode is all over the place. However, I came up to make an efficiency 5 axe and got these feather falling 4 boots. Thought you'd want to know. They ended up being really great boots, actually. So yes, I'll stick to building a barn for now. I'm sorry. Ha! <laughs> Just kidding. I need deep sleep for the roofs. I know Minecraft YouTubers get a bad reputation because some people have been caught playing their worlds a bit dishonestly, so I thought I'd show you what I do when I go mining. It's a bit ridiculous. This single strip mine went for well over 400 blocks. I found diamonds, redstone, and other valuables, but mostly, yeah, I just needed the deep slate. Just running back through this tunnel takes a ridiculously long time. I actually enjoy strip mining. It's kind of peaceful for me, so these things get a bit silly down here in my worlds. As we near the end of this tunnel, just know that I'll show you whatever you really want to see anytime you want to see it in this world. I'm playing this world straight up. If I die, we start over. If something's hard, we're going to do it anyways. That's a lot of diamonds. With the nether trip lurking, it's time to finish some upgrades. I have a lot more diamonds now, so we can make a diamond chest plate. We can also make these leggings, and then we're going to make a helmet as well. Now I can finish upgrading all of my gear, including pickaxe upgrades, putting protection on the leggings, making my silk touch pick efficiency 5, and then upgrading a sword to sharpness 4 instead of Bane of Arthropods. Yeah, I had Bane of Arthropods. While I was at the mob farm, I saw the bones were collecting and I thought it was time to go find Loki. If you don't know, Loki's my Minecraft dog and our channel mascot. It's about time I went and brought Loki home. This is Loki. I was very happy to find him. Very, very happy. Loki and Red, riding in a boat, going so fast, cause we are afloat. Okay, let's fix this collar and give you a name. Isn't he cute? Say Loki's cute. Say it in the comments right now. Who's the best Loki? You're the best Loki. I have never been so distracted from doing a project in my entire life. Okay, let's clear out the bamboo so we can actually start building this thing. 
There are at least a dozen styles of barn that I could have chosen to build today. From the Dutch, to a gambrel roof barn, and down to a circular barn or tobacco barn, but today I've chosen to build a monitor barn. Outside of Minecraft, monitor barns were actually developed to increase ventilation over traditional designs, which reduced bacteria and improved the lives of the livestock. Fun fact for you. It also looks the coolest, let's be honest. The foundations for this will be stone brick, one high all the way around, so let's do that. As we start framing and building the actual barn, if you're enjoying this chaotic adventure today, please consider hitting the subscribe button. It's free, it helps the channel, and you can change your mind at any time if you find that I'm not for you. Finishing the bottom floor of the barn is now as simple as just connecting these vertical pillars and then connecting a space for the second story. Once that's done, we can begin building up the next floor. This story is a bit taller, so the central tower will extend and give us plenty of space and that needed ventilation. We can then connect this ridge line or the top bit to give us a roof line. The next step will be to start building up the side walls. They're going to be made of mostly oak planks with some stripped oak for a bit of texture and variation. These will wrap all the way around the barn and on the second floor. I'll definitely need more oak before this is done. Well, we had just enough to get the first floor done. Back to chopping and then planting and then chopping again. I'm going to take a moment inside the barn to build each of the pens. I want animals to get in and out easily so there will be a lot of gates. And I'm going to make eight total pens. I know there are four main livestock animals I can start with, but I do want horses, donkeys, mules, and llamas eventually in here. I won't keep a ton of each animal inside because this is near spawn and it will lag me out later in the game, but I do want the pens to be big enough to hold them and give them a bit of space. I'm also going to section off the back area for the cow cooker build, and then outside I'm going to create two additional pens. These can be for untamed horses and llamas that don't love me yet, or foxes, we'll see. Out front I want to create a bit of an entryway. We'll give that the space to exist and these pillars to hold it. And then we're onto the roof. With a monitor barn, the lower roofs are less sloped than the upper roof generally. So here I've chosen to make a less sloped slab roof for the lower sections and a steeper stair roof for the upper floor. The slab sections only go up half a block per level and the stairs will go up one full block, so there's quite a difference in the angles. I'm mixing in cobbled deep slate with deep slate bricks again for some variation in the texture. And getting the roof right on a monitor barn does seem to be the most important thing, so I'm really happy with how this is coming out so far. I am from the northeast US, and normally what we have is a gambrel roof barn, so that's what I'm most familiar with. And these monitor style barns are quite unusual for me, and I love building something a little bit more unique. I'm going to add a quick ceiling here, and then we can start on the upper roof. I'm using the same block palette for stairs, and just keeping it simple with the stair upside down stair pattern that I've used before. After that, it's just a matter of filling the whole thing in. Back on the ground, and with most of the structure itself built, I need to start making it look like it's actually being used. This path extending inside will help make it look like I'm actually walking through here. Outside I have a few structural items left to finish. I want to add a roof overhanging one side to make the barn look asymmetrical, and to give some shelter for the animals that will be in the outdoor pens. This will continue from the lower roof and use slabs as well, and that asymmetrical finish to the roof line just makes it look more interesting overall to look at. Let's finish up this entry with some extinguished campfires and the trapdoors that will hang off of those. I've also added some red stained glass to the upper window to make it stand out. I tried yellow here, but it wasn't very good. Now I can move some of the animals into the barn. We'll move the sheep and then the chickens, and then finally some pigs. I'm going to leave the cows alone for now because I need to move the ones I have into the cow cooker later, and I'll have to find some new ones for the actual pen once I'm done. I went out to find the obsidian for the nether portal that we're going to need to complete our observer, and found some crying obsidian along the way, so I took this advancement. I wanted to start on the cow cooker now, and while I'm not going to show you everything step by step, I do have a 5 minute guide to setting up this early game really useful farm. It should be linked in a card above, in the description below, so check that out after this video. I added these two large hay piles to the back of the barn to cover up the cooker. Now I can start decorating inside with some of these ladders, and replacing some of the torches with lanterns. Also, we can start decorating outside a bit. And this is how we're looking now. I've added some hay bales, sugarcane, berries, flowers, some tall grass all around. There's a log pile on the side of the barn over here that's tied down. I also want to think about adding a window awning on the side and then maybe a small tower over on the other side. And back here, the cow cooker is almost completely finished except for two obvious things. Number one, I need cows. 
And number two, I still need the quartz to make an observer to finish the build. I can drop the cows in any time, but I do need that observer. So while I grab my protection for golden chest plate for this, I want to be clear. The nether only scares me for two reasons. Number one, you can spawn directly into danger your first time in. And number two, lava and fire. Fire pots can take care of the second and elytra will help with that later on, but nothing can really prepare you for your first entry. It's either a good spawn or not. All I want's like another waste. I'll be happy. Before I go, I just have to say Loki, I'll come back. But if I don't make it... Yeah, 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 I know. It's enough procrastinating. Let's go to the nether. Wish us luck. Woo 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 woo. Uh, what? I spawn in a fortress, but not in a fortress? Where exactly are we? This is... this is different. Well, I didn't die instantly yet. I'm really not sure where I am. Let's see if I can dig my way out of this little hole. Maybe we can get somewhere recognizable. I'm aware that digging straight or down could immediately drop me in lava. This opens up, maybe into a hallway? I kind of just spawned on the side of the fortress. It's a weird spot, but it's kind of safe. Could be worse. Maybe I can just block the side of this off and then safe to jump up here? Yeah. This is actually okay. We're in a fairly quiet hall. Looks like we're already on the blaze spawner side of the fortress. So we should check this out. I'm going to block off each pathway so that wither skeletons are always contained. The only thing I'm really worried about dying to inside a fortress is getting pinched. If you have wither skeletons on both sides of you, it can be quite a challenge to push your way past one group and still avoid the other. With these barricades, I can very safely go from one hallway to another and know I have a place to run if I need it. This quartz is why we came into the nether, so I guess I should get this while I'm here too. I didn't exactly expect to find a fortress, but we're here, so maybe we'll explore it for a little bit at least. If you don't know, fortresses are split into a treasure side and the side that has the blaze spawners. The lava pit you'll find in a fortress is the midpoint, so it's always easy to tell where you're at. We're on the blaze side now, and this is the lava pit that I'm talking about. Back where we came from is a blaze side, and down here is the treasure. I heard a wither skeleton. It's my first of this world. Surely it'll drop something for me. I do have looting too. It's always chance. Nope, nothing. Nothing good. Ah, nether wart. This is actually really good. I'll take this home. We can do some potions with this. I'll take some of the soul sand as well. Okay, I've moved back to the other side of the fortress now. Our portal's right here, but I think I can take on this blaze. I'm actually way more concerned about hitting the piglin than dying to this single blaze. Okay, time to die. Nice, our first blaze rod. That's another advancement. Well, emboldened by that success, I'm going to head in to find the closest blaze spawner. I'm not ready for the dragon yet, and I only have two ender pearls, but finding the spawner shouldn't be that dangerous. We also found all this extra quartz, so I'll grab that while I'm here. Then just a couple of halls down, I found the blaze spawner. I'll grab coordinates quickly for that and make this area safer. Having this super OP bow early in the game has made this kind of easy to get into. I did think the glowstone being this close would prevent blaze spawns, but well, here they are. I killed a couple of rounds of spawns, then I wanted to collect my loot, but I'm always afraid of them spawning directly on me. Their melee attack does way more damage than the fireball, so I kind of waited. Eventually I did run in and grab a few of my blaze rods. I don't know what I was worried about. This isn't so bad. I'm gonna grab this one in the back and then just run out. Easy- Ah! Yep, one spawned directly on me. Of course he did. Once I was done killing those ones, I could actually still hear blazes, so I did the logical thing, went around the corner, and yeah, that's a that's a second blaze spawner right next to it. Double spawner, pretty nice. I cleaned all of them up one by one and then ran straight in to get my loot. This bitch- What? Okay, they spawned right on me still. Please don't watch that in slow motion. I may have jumped panic and swung my sword and hit the floor. Nope, I'm out of there. I'm back, Loki. Uh, my first stop was to assure Loki I was home and lived. My second was to change my pants. Loki seemed far less scared than I was. We did end up with a good haul from what was meant to be a very short trip. 65 quartz ore, 7 blaze rods, nether wart, and soul sand. I immediately found a spot in our manual farms area for the soul sand and nether wart. I must have been gone for a bit, everything's grown over. So then I fortuned the quartz. I only needed one from the nether, but all this extra will come in handy later. We ended up with two and a quarter stacks and this observer. Priority number one is to get that into the cow cooker so I can turn it on. It goes right on top of this hopper from the back like this. And the farm is now done. When I push the button, we get lava. That will kill the adult cows after the babies drop into the side chambers and then grow up. By flicking these switches, I can put the trap doors down and then I can breed the ones that I do have and fill up the top until I have 24. You just kind of have to push them in. I keep hitboxes turned on when I'm doing this to make it far easier, and that was the last one. 
Now I can push this button to bob them up in the water and then breed them. And with those trapdoors down, the babies will stay at the top and grow up, which will allow me to increase the population in the upper chamber. I'll keep the wheat handy in this chest. Last thing I need to do today on this barn is finish the awning and tower that I mentioned earlier, so let's get that done. With that done, I moved some new cows into the barn pens, bred my cow cooker repeatedly, and moved my extra wheat over into the barn. I then caught up on all the rest of my chores, combining iron, composting, harvesting, a bit more harvesting, and again breeding the cow cooker. Now we have some adults, so we can test out the system. You can see the lava take out the adults, leave the babies behind, and drop all the cooked steak directly into the chest. Finally, I need to change over the rest of these torches as they look too basic. I keep using the cow cooker and then keep breeding more cows. Well, that was a heck of an adventure. We upgraded a lot of gear, built the barn, went to the nether and returned safely. We're no longer starving, so I think that's been a successful day. Today we're going to imprison, I mean employ, over 30 villagers to become OP. I want mending, unbreaking three, and all the trades that provide emeralds and hard to get resources like quartz, lapis, and most importantly enderpearls. I also have this chest right here, but I'll tell you what that's for later. I did a little bit of scouting and we're going to build the trading hall right here. So I need to do some terraforming, but while I do, let me explain the plan. If you remember last episode, we went to the nether and found two blaze spawners. So we have blaze powder, but without the ender pearls, we can't go find the stronghold. I would normally just head into the nether and do some trading, but we spawn in a fortress, remember? I have no idea what biome we're even in or what my real nether looks like yet. We're also accumulating quite a bit of iron from our episode one iron farm, and I'd like to start trading that for emeralds so I can buy more important things. All right, let me start laying out the villagers and where they'll go. Each of the dirt blocks will represent a villager. I'm gonna have four villagers facing four villagers on each of four wings, so that's 32 total. I'm also gonna have a few empty slots in the back later for any expansion I need or things I forget. I already have silk touch so we could get stone to build with early, but I don't have any other librarians. I want mending. My gear's pretty good now, but it's starting to wear out as you can see. I also know that infinity bows, while great, do break. So I want at least villagers for power 5, unbreaking 3, flame, punch, and of course infinity. I know I could set up a system where we can zombify these villagers easily and I can get trades for nearly nothing, but remember I'm not even on day 200, so I don't have a lot of gold, golden apples, or even weakness potions. I'd rather just set up a good system for now and get their ankles bitten later. Now I can start to lay out which job blocks will go in which sections. I'm going to have all the librarians together in the front of the hall, and you can see that there will be 16 total. Other than the trades I mentioned, I'd love to have access to Efficiency 5, Fortune 3, Thorns 3, and a bunch of other trades that come in handy sometimes. Now I just dig holes that are three deep. If you don't know this villager trading hall design, it's by enx 4 and the link will be in the description. It's so simple, it actually makes me wonder if I'm playing the same game as Ian, but I've thought that a lot before, so yeah. The access to the villagers is actually below ground, so I need to clear out this whole section in between all of the workstations. Now I can move workstations to the bottom of each hole and just cover them with a trap door. This will make changing the villager trades very easy before I lock them in. I don't know why I've never done it this way. Thanks Ian. I only have like three or four villagers total, so I'm gonna need to breed them like crazy. I don't want them to escape, so it's time to build the- oh. What did he say? No, 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 not that. Make a fence around the whole thing. That's what I meant. Uh, anyways, okay, let's move some villagers into the fenced area. The first will be our silk touch librarian and that's an interesting way to go over when there's a gap in the fence right there, but anyway, he went straight into a hole. That's the trick to this trading hall. 
Villagers will attach themselves to one of the workstations. They can only claim it by going on top of the trap door. And when they do, boom, they're trapped in a 2D pole. We can just cover him up and move on. The second villager I have is this Fletcher. You may remember him from such things as, I'm glad he has no idea how much bamboo I have. We can just lure him in with his own workstation and then lock the door behind him. Next up, we have this cleric. I actually forgot I had this guy. Come along then. I don't want him to jump into a hole yet as I need to breed him, so let's catch him quickly and I can row, row, row my boat down onto the beds. Knowing I only had a couple of villagers, I actually threw in a bunch of beds and food with these last two, so there's four or five in here now. We can move them in. And these are the last two here. That one did not want to breed and became a librarian immediately. Everyone else is inside so I can break the boats. I've made the walls at least too high all the way around so nobody can get out. Yeah, I've been saving up some carrots for this. You can have some, and here's some for you too. I can hear the sweet sounds of food being shared. And yes, they spawned an iron golem. Spoiler alert, I'm gonna hit a villager later and I will have no idea where the golem is. With everyone moved in and fed, they just need to breed. And breed they did. Our population grew and so I added more beds and then it grew again. At night I can easily count them. We currently have 11 that are not yet in workstation cells. That's a start. Now if the golem would just stop waking them up. So many hearts, so much love. This is going great. What? Okay, not great. I have too many down there now, let's move some up. I started moving some into cells and sometimes you can get two in one like this. But it's easy enough to fix, you just... Why did that happen again while I was explaining it? It's pretty rare. Seriously? Okay, well, we'll fix you two. Get out! See? Easy. Okay, it should be working again. And I should shut up. Let's move more out. I see all of your love hearts, but please quit wasting my food. I know you're trying. Mr. Gollum, I wrote you a letter. It says, Dear Gollum, I'm not your biggest fan. Love rad. From here, it's just trap villager, trap villager, and uh-oh, I made a mistake. Some of the workstations don't have trap doors. That's why two were falling in one hole. I had to let everyone out. It's very painful seeing them trying to breed and knowing there's about 10 too many down there. Yeah, I knew that wasn't gonna work. <sighs> All right, time to walk more into holes. That is a lot of librarians. Pick a hole, guys. Any hole. There you go. Yeah, they keep wasting my food. It's fine. Here, have some more carrots. Anywho, with some villagers locked in their cells now, I can start to try trading for emeralds. And I'm going to need a lot for these librarians. I'm also going to lock in easy trades like clerics. I like being able to trade for lapis and redstone. That helps a lot. Their key trade is enderpearls, so you just have to get lucky as you upgrade. Now we just cross our fingers. And we did get the enderpearl trade. That definitely helps us. Yeah, I'm sick of coming up here for carrots. Let's just get a lot. Now, this wasn't very smart of me in hindsight. You see, these two guys that rushed right in on the lower right-hand corner, I thought they were the Iron Golem. He was pretty close by though, so I kind of got lucky. If he had been about two steps closer, that was the end of the series. Well, that was enough for me. I removed this bridge, let the Golem pass, and put it back. Now he's trapped. What a sucker. Everything after that was pretty smooth sailing. I'd just get the villagers up here, let them fall in a hole, and then I could block them in. I also learned a fun party trick. Throw food in the hole, they walk straight in. Now it's time to clean up this mess and move our last few villagers back into this house so we can breed more if we need to. And they're gonna basically walk themselves straight over, which is no problem at all, barely an inconvenience. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. Oh, look, I was right. This is how we're looking. Villagers have claimed all the available workstations and I can start trading with them anytime I like. The first villager I wanted to level up is the Weaponsmith. After just one upgrade, he can trade for iron, and I have plenty of that. The same goes for the Toolsmith, the Weaponsmith, and the Armorer. And with lots of emeralds now, I can also afford to level up more clerics. Eventually, I will have to move on to the Librarians. They're just a bit more work. I have to break the Lectern, replace it, check the trade, and do this over and over, checking all the trades until they give me what I want. I will, however, take this Infinity for five. Let's lock that in. When you lock in trades, it's helpful to know what the minimum prices can be so you know whether to keep it. For level 1 trades like Infinity or Mending, the cheapest you can possibly get them is 5 emeralds. For each level of enchantment after that, the minimum goes up by 3. So something like Punch 2 has an 8 emerald minimum, Fortune 3 is 11, Feather Falling 4 can be as low as 14, and Power 5 could go down to 17. Once you know that, making choices is far easier. For instance, Mending for 12 is an okay price, but I know I can get better, so I didn't take it. Not five minutes later, his neighbor gave me mending for 10, and I took that. Actually, lots of that. I took enough that the price actually dropped to eight, and I took even more. And then that dropped the price to six, and you guessed that, I took more. I really wanted these mending books before my gear was any more damaged. You can see that basically all of my tools are suffering in some way. 
I don't really want fire aspect, but I will keep this sword for now. Now I just need to put mending on everything else. Finally. I could just repair all of my gear now. A few swings my sword will do it. If I'm tired of any part of the world at the moment, it's this jump into the water. I won't normally trade rotten flesh, but hey, I just came from the mob farm, so this was actually a freebie. Free emeralds plus some levels and a working anvil back at home, that'll let me add mending to the hoe, shield, and boots. I can't wait to get rid of this ladder. It's so slow and repetitive when I need to get to the mob farm and back. I just want to get all my gunpowder from the mob farm, but it's up the ladder, jump off the farm, hit the water, and it's drop off the gunpowder from my inventory, and then it's back up the ladder, collect the gunpowder, and yep, jump back off the farm. If you can't tell, I was considering my options with throwing pearls now that I have basically unlimited, but it's drop off the gunpowder, back up the ladder, jump off the farm. I need to do something else. Let's go make some emeralds. I know I've procrastinated the librarians, but locking in 16 isn't a quick and easy job. I'm gonna cut out most of the boring rolls and only show you the keepers. Well, isn't this a moral dilemma? I locked in Punch 2 for 16, knowing I'd probably only need one book before I could zombify the villagers. The very next guy gave me Punch 2 for 8. Long term, that's way better, so I locked that in too. This is a problem. Sorry, so sorry. If you're paying close enough attention, you'll realize I actually did it again too, with Unbreaking 3. I'm so sorry. Yep, I'm climbing the ladder again. Can you feel my pain? It makes me want to jump off a- oh, right. Have you guessed what's in the box yet? So with our trades locked in, this is where I'm at. The build I have in mind to cover this trading hall is a bit of a Roman inspired meeting hall. I'll probably turn the upper floor into a breeder later, but today we're gonna focus on the outer building. I do feel way behind on chores after days and days of playing with villagers, so let's quickly catch up. I didn't wanna show this part as it's a minor spoiler for later, but I kinda have to given that happened. That's how we got spooky scary skeleton. For the base of this build, I really want a heavy stone wall surrounding it with stairs leading in about here. The land in the village all looks the same, it's kind of boring, and a bit of a heavy base would suit this area pretty well and separate it. I also want the floor to end up over the villagers' heads so we can go up one more. Also, I'm not saying my mineshaft is in the way, but my mineshaft is in the way. I played around with a few ideas but settled on this design. I think the chiseled pillars will look nice, and adding those fences adds some contrast without being overwhelming. I may move the entrance to my mineshaft completely later, but for now, I just need to turn it out of the way. It's really annoying here. Okay, let's build this wall up. I'm gonna use a mix of blocks from gravel to tough, stone and cobblestone and andesite. The way that I want to protect the villagers is to remove the trapdoors but put upper slabs above them. This will give them plenty of space and nothing can get to them. With the main floor in place, this is how the trading hall area looks in the village area now. I do think that we're going to need to head back up to the stony peaks for more calcite. I think calcite inside the spruce pillars will look perfect for this build. 
I do have a bit of a secret weapon this time. The last time I was up here, I didn't have efficiency five. Resource gathering will go very quickly this time. I know I haven't unveiled the secret of the chest in my house yet. Have you made a guess as to what you think's in there? Put it in the comments. We'll get to that shortly. If you're new to my content, you'll need to learn that building doesn't come naturally or quickly for me. So often I'll have to try something, back off and look at it, maybe go in and try something else. This is just part of my process as I hopefully get better at building. I do like it with the calcite inset more than flush against the spruce wall. All right, now that we know what this is gonna look like, let's just get it built. I think that stone retaining wall looks great with this build. I've now built the main floor, added the spruce columns I was talking about, built the inside walls up with calcite, added a bit of detail with the stairs and the trap doors, and then connected the top with cross beams. I also moved this staircase down inside because I hated that it was right in front of the door. Onto the roof. I'm continuing that Roman theme with a clear story gabled roof. I'll add windows to it later, but for now I'm gonna put in solid walls for the verticals. In Roman architecture, many great halls were lit with clear stories, and I do wanna open this up as soon as I can. I have these windows at the end to provide extra light for now. In a more classical Roman build, I'd bring the roof line together in one solid triangle, but I don't think an exact replica is necessary or even fits with my existing builds. So I'm just gonna outline this with deep slate, fill it with spruce, and then I'll tie it into the rest of the builds that I've done up to this point. At this point, I'm just finishing up some detailing along the roof line. Then I'm gonna add more stairs in between the pillars to tie the whole look together. Here, kitty kitty. Uh, okay, we have a cat now. It spawned in the trading hall, so I'll give it a name. I'll pick from the best ones in the comments, leave yours below. No more distractions. Let's finish with the campfires above the trap doors for a bit more detail on this roof line. I'm really liking this. I can do a little bit more with it, but I'm just gonna add banners out front, I think, for now. This time I'm climbing the ladder for a good reason. I wanna see the meeting hall build from above. Yeah, I think that fits in pretty well with the builds that I've been doing already. I'm pretty proud of this world so far. I've never had this much built in such a short time in a world. The one thing I do still need to work on is this trading hall design. It looks kinda of ugly with the stone and the dirt and this isn't really my vibe. Let's replace these with spruce logs and I'll put a stair above the middle of each one. Spruce planks for a floor will tie it all together. And then a barrel at each villager's feet will help me organize trade materials, emeralds, etc. Yeah, it's already looking way nicer. Let me build up so we can take a clean look at this. I think this fits our world really well. As more of a farm builder and adventurer, these builds really challenge what I know how to do. Okay, time to reveal the surprise. And here's what's inside the chest. During the filming of this episode, I've been slowly gathering all the materials we need to go to the end, fight the dragon, and earn wings. Next episode, there is no resource gathering, no messing around, no sidetracking. We're gonna head straight to the stronghold and kill us a dragon. I'm climbing to the mob farm exactly zero more times. As promised, we are not messing around. There is no sidetracking today. 
This fall damage, walk everywhere, climb the ladder to the mob farm stuff, that has to stop. Time to throw the first eye of this world? Let's go find us a stronghold. Of course it broke. Don't tell me today's gonna go like that. Oh well, east it is. I've got about 1500 blocks out before I'll throw another pearl. The top of this hill is as good a spot as any. It's obviously best to throw them when you're in an open area like this so it's easy to follow. I'm gonna go another few hundred blocks. We'll take another throw. Okay, we're still going this way. Can't be very far now, I'm almost 2,000 blocks out. I should get to the clearing on this hill and try again. Is it gonna be behind me or in front of me? Um, where'd it go? Where'd, where'd the pearl actually go? I don't see it. I lost it. Did it, hold on, did it go under me? If so, it should come back up through the ground. It should pop back out. I'm gonna take a look around for it. Where did it go? Why am I the guy who purposely walks up to the tallest, most open spot and has no idea where the pearl went? Well, this is why. If we look at the replay, I'm looking up and it broke before I even looked down. If I look at coordinates, it turns out I did go almost exactly 2,000 blocks. That's pretty far. There are three strongholds in the first ring around your spawn area. And those rings can be as small as 1,280 blocks, or as large as 2,800. The eye would have gone to the closest one, so all three of my strongholds were at least 2,000 blocks from spawn. I hate to lose an eye and have to throw another, but I just couldn't find it, so... Are you kidding me? That had to go under me, right? Well, I just checked this side of the mountain again, and I really couldn't find it. It has to be on the other side, right? Let's just take a quick look. I don't see... Oh, wait, there it is. Let's go down. It's right on the edge here. So the stronghold must be almost directly below me. What a place to throw our eye. Well, now I can start to dig straight down. I'm just gonna mark it quickly. I would normally dig a two wide hole down, but I don't normally have efficiency five. So I think I'll just power through a two by two. It'll give myself an easy way to get in when I return here and much more likely to find the stronghold. This is quite a high Y level stronghold. I've been finding in a lot of other worlds and servers that strongholds can generate quite low into the deep slate, but I didn't even hit deep slate level here. One day I'd like to tear out all the land above this portal and do a build here, and this not being at negative 40 really helps a lot. All right, let's jump down into the stronghold. It's a fairly safe place to start. I'm basically at the starter staircase here, so that's good. The portal room is usually closer to the starter staircase than you'd imagine. I think the rule is that if it's more than five rooms and or hallways away, you've gone too far. You should go back to the starter. Speedrunners have their own ways of doing this, and I don't really know it, but I kind of understand that it's usually pretty close. This was actually pretty easy to find. I'm going to extinguish one side of the lava, and then I do want to kill at least one silverfish for monsters hunted advancement. We'll take those two there and then break that. I need to consider if I want to spawn here or back at home. I think home, so I'm not going to set my spawn point here. I did build a nether portal inside this room. I won't go into it yet because I want to connect it on the roof eventually, but I'm not up there at home yet. All right, let's finish getting ready. How do I look? Do I look ready for the fight? I think I'm a bit overprepared. The dragon might just run away. I have an infinity bow, full protection four armor, feather falling four, slow pulp potions, and the pumpkin on my head. This isn't really necessary. Well, I said I wasn't gonna procrastinate. Let's go in. Ah, we spawned inside a room. This is actually my favorite spawn. I know I have to dig out, but I generally rather have this than a big open area between me and the end island. I know that's easier for farms later, but once I have elytra, I won't care. Right now, I don't have elytra, and I do care. Are we usually this far underground? This seems like it's a bit much. There we go. Maybe we were under a hill or something? No, it all seems pretty normal. Anyway, I can't hear the dragon yet, but I know she's out there. Let's go get into this fight. Huh, I hit my first shot. This is gonna be easy. See? Easy. 
I'm just kidding. Let's get this done. If you beat the dragon early game, all this XP is super valuable. With the mob farm and most of my enchanting done though, it doesn't really feel all that important. I did pass level 69 though, nice. Let's grab this egg. Okay, it's on the bedrock, that's perfect. One more time, alright. I hate how slow you move with slow falling on. Alright, let's just throw a torch below this. Break that and collect the egg, there we go. Let's go through our open gateway to the outer islands. It's actually just above where we came in, so we can easily bridge up to this. I don't like it when the first gateway is over the void, but this is fine. I don't trust purling through, so I'm gonna just use a trap door. That got me through safely and easily. That's our coordinates. Let's just crank up the render distance to 32 so we can see as far as possible. We'll take a look around. There's nothing, nothing, still nothing. Oh, there's a city. It looks like there might be a ship over there. I think I see one right behind this. Yeah, there's a ship over there. My wings are over there. Let's take one more look around, just to make sure nothing's closer. No, I don't really see anything. Let's go get that. I'm always fairly paranoid for the first bridge over the void. Imagine, you go to the stronghold, defeat the dragon, find your wings, and fall into the void a couple hundred blocks from them, losing the world forever. That would be devastating. That was not the case here, however, as I just bridged my way safely across. I don't like how it looks like the boat is floating over the void there, but oh well. Let's just keep going. Alright, let's skip to the good bits. In good news, the ship wasn't really floating over the... Oh, yes it is, actually. I want to point out that I do have slow fall potion on at the moment, so if I fell here, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Now I can just bridge straight across here. I know there's two shulkers and they both want me dead, but I should be fine, right? We're almost there. Here we go. Oh, of course he did. Let's just kill this one here, and done. Stop it. Nope, stop hitting me. We're getting a little bit too high, actually. I do have pearls if needed. Remember that slow fall potion I said could save me? It has three seconds left. And down, there we go. That didn't go too poorly. Okay, into the ship we go. I always feel bad for this last shulker, like, you were chosen as the last line of defense between me and what I think is the most important item in the game? You don't really stand a chance. It's like if you got between me and a buffet. I'm getting that fried chicken and mac and cheese, one way or the other. And there it is, my very first elytra of the world. And my favorite advancement. Remember, I did come prepared so we can immediately stick mending and unbreaking on this. I'll call them freedom flies. Do you guys even remember freedom fries? Eh, it might have been before some of you were actually born. Anyways, let's make some rockets and my first shulker, and take my first flight. Now it's all about doing a little light and busting before I head home. The easiest way to get into this room is to stand on the lower bit of the stairs here and punch into the lower blocks and access everything from outside. If you're not interested in the shulkers, they can't even hit you this way. I am interested in the shulkers, so I'm gonna break in and go kill everything in this room. Ideally, I'll end up with 27 to 30 shulkers before I leave the end, so I can fill my e-chest and start organizing. These three high rooms are the most common loot room and the one I found most during my end busting. Again, I'm just gonna break into the lower bits, check out the chest, but I do want the shulkers as well so I can break through, silk touch the e-chest and then kill everything in here as well, including the one that'll be at the front door. Once I'm done with this first city, it'll be time to move on and just keep finding new cities to raid. While I'm up here, I might as well get one more quick advancement. I know this isn't what the game developers had in mind, but by far the easiest and safest way to get a great view from up here is to levitate, throw a pearl down, and hit the ground with it. Technically the advancement is to move up 50 blocks in either direction, but that works. Only slightly cheesy. Alright, let's go ahead and bust.
Just like that, we're back to the first ship and I can head home. We're back on the main end island now. One thing I know I'd like is a bit of obsidian, so I'm going to grab that before we head out. This end island's pretty nice. It's mainly flat. It won't be much work to build something here in the future. Oh well, let's go complete the story. And we're back home just like that. Okay, I promised this, but the very first thing we're going to do is take down this dirt pillar. It's ugly, stupid, and slow to get up. I know I need an early game, but I don't need it anymore. Now I'm back with my end rating loot. Don't judge me too much. I do have plans for most of the gear. I do think the 11 elytra may be a bit much. I guess it makes any potential trip to the world border just a little bit easier. Look at all the advancements I got just from going through the end portal, beating the dragon, and going to the end rating. Before I go organize all my loot, I do have one thing to do. In the last episode, I said I'd name our new cat from the comments, and you guys suggested a lot of great names. Now I actually have two cats. So I'm going to go with Art Fanatic's suggestion of Blaze for this cat up here. Hello, Blaze. And for the second, I'm going to go with Percy, which was suggested to us by Fuzzy Hill. Thanks, everyone, for the great suggestions. I appreciate it. Hi, Percy. Now that I have the shulkers in an e-chest, it's time to get hyper-organized. I'm fairly organized to begin with, but now I can put my gunpowder in one shulker, paper in another. Basically, I'm going to color coordinate all of my shulkers and carry quite a few resources with me at all times. I always carry backup elytra and other gear, necessities like flint and steel, shears, and of course a chest plate. I'll have a shulker dedicated to redstone components, then others for wood, blocks, dyes, food, and other item types. I also keep about 10 empty shulkers in my e-chest to store anything I collect while I'm out adventuring, building a project, or just moving things around. With most of the organizing done, I can show you what's going where so you'll know what I'm carrying at all times. The orange shulker is going to be for our valuables. This red one will be for redstone. This other red one will be nether items. The dark green will be our trees and wood. Lime will be for other plants. Cyan for dyes. Brown is for food and yellow for lighting. I know people don't like me using brown for food, but I mainly eat pork chops and steak. They're brown. Get over it. Blue is for blocks and glass. Light blue is going to be for spare gear, you know, color of diamonds. Black will be for rockets. Gray for gunpowder. Light gray for paper. Purple is going to have mob drops in it. Pink will hold our transportation items like rails and carts. And finally, magenta will be whatever our current project box is. I may need more than that for projects, but this will be the primary box. With that done, we can take a look around and we're done organizing. Most items have been moved into these perfectly organized shulkers, and I'm ready for just about anything now. So this is how it looks when completed. Most important stuff, rockets, gunpowder, papers, all up front. Valuables, spare gear, redstone, food and lighting, all in the top row. And then dyes, nether, and all that other stuff below. With 10 spare normal colored shulkers left over as I planned. The very last thing I want to talk about today is our long-term megabase plan. Now that I have everything I need to speed up the work in this world, I want to go into overdrive on a few projects. The first is laying out the megabase. After that, we'll be back and forth working on some automation and farms to gather resources and grow the world. This mushroom island is just a few hundred blocks from spawn. I found it on one of our early adventures and I told you that I explored it a bit, but I didn't show you so I could keep it a secret. I want to reveal the island now and show you exactly how massive this island is. What I found was more of a mushroom continent than an island. If I fly up high enough, I can get a good view of the whole thing. From up here, it doesn't look massive, but I guarantee you it's at least 400 blocks in both directions and in the main area. So this is where I want to build our megabase. I can't complete the megabase in one, two, or even five episodes. So what I plan to do is slowly work on areas within it. I know we did no building today, but each episode from here on out, I'm going to be trying to do either a village upgrade, as I've been doing, or some big section of work on our mega base, and a plan to eventually take over virtually this entire island. With the dragon down and our wings sorted last episode, I want to get a lot done today. What kind of things? Well, I want to fix a few bits about the barn that I'm not happy with, build a nano crop farm, add the clear story windows to the trading hall, terraform a bit of the village so it's not quite so crap, build an easy villager breeder for short term use, build a cactus farm, work on our mega base, build a shoreline defense tower, and then get the three wither skulls I'll need for my first beacon. I told you it was a long list, let's get started. With this barn, there's really two things I want to fix. The two towers are unsupported and look weird from inside, and the roof line has a gap between the wall and the roof itself, so I want to fill that in. Okay, the first tower was easily fixed. Let's go fix this second one. At the moment, it's just unsupported and unfinished. I was so excited to be done with the barn that I completely forgot to fill in these details. It would be okay, except I have to come in here all the time. At the moment, it's my main food source. So I see this incomplete, weirdly hanging tower thing literally every day. 
All right, let's turn these the other way as well. They were temporary so I could build on top of them, but at the very least they should be vertical now. The roof shouldn't sit above the wall like this. It should sit on it. I guess like a lot of projects in today's episode, it's not a difficult job, but one that I don't want to overlook. I do get a lot of happiness out of making these feel more complete though, so that's good. Let's take a look. All right, both sides are now supported. The roof line is fixed. That looks a lot better. The farming chores are getting a bit tedious now that there's so much to do with carrots, wheat, bamboo, sugarcane, dripstone, netherwort, iron trading, all that stuff. So I've decided project two is gonna be a nano crop farm. I'm gonna rip out the carrot and wheat farm from down here and move a simple redstone contraption up to the mob farm. I'll need to put a piece of dirt where I want this, spot for water behind that, and then a dispenser on the left, right, and if I put a temporary block there, one behind. Then I can break the temporary block, put a redstone dust here, an observer facing down, and a piston off of that. I need to till the ground, then put a stair in front of it. Now I can come back with blocks and just fill in the rest of this farm. Then I just need to put more redstone dust on all of these blocks, including the observer. Put a lever on the front like that, and we're done. This is potentially the world's easiest food farm. Now you'll see I put this at the mob farm because I need bone meal to run it. So I'm going to collect more bone meal up here than I know what to do with. So we're going to quickly turn the bones into bone meal, fill up each of the dispensers, and start to run the farm. You just need to aim the crop down onto the farmland and then hold right click. Sometimes it's a bit weird and you'll need to right click a few times to get it started. But look how fast we can get carrots now. I went from basically having none to there's over a half a stack in my inventory in, in seconds. It works for wheat and potatoes as well. Once we get a gold farm up, it's free golden carrots, all the villager breeding food we could ever want. There's no more daily farm work for me on this one. Let's speed this up for a moment. Yeah, that should do it. I use the farm for about 50 seconds of real time and we have five and a half stacks of carrots from basically nothing. This farm's loud, so I've muted the sounds. It does take an absolute ton of bone meal to run, but we'll make my hogland farm design eventually for our permanent food source. Both golden carrots and cooked pork are great food, and it's definitely worth showing you how I would source both. Before I leave here, I'll show you wheat seeds quickly. You get a ton of both wheat and seeds this way, so it's another great farm. This is another quick fix that I should have taken care of in an earlier episode, but I was out of time then. Building this clear story roof, the plan was always to add proper windows to it, otherwise it's just a bit too similar to the barn, and a bit boring looking. This is simply a matter of counting out spots for windows, filling them in with panes, and then once we go back and look, that looks so much better with that simple, simple fix. The next thing I did was lay out a spot for the tower that I want to build along this shore near the trading hall, but we'll come back to that later. First, I want to clean up this village a little bit. The land has always been a total nightmare here. There are holes throughout the town and source water that just goes everywhere. I'm not going to redo everything, but I do want to make it look a bit more like a hillside village and less like a bomb site. That's much better, let's move on. As I only have two villagers unlocked from trading at the moment, once again I feel vulnerable to one of them disappearing, suffocating in a wall, or somehow randomly dying. So I wanna create a small pool of extra villagers, but I'm not ready to build like a full on logical geek boy style villager breeder or anything close to that. I decided to make a couple of small farms behind a wall. I was originally gonna keep all the spare villagers inside the wall, but I thought about how I'd get them out and that seemed complicated. So I decided to let the babies go through a small spot in the wall and then grow up in the trading hall. This wasn't my smartest plan. I should have left the beds inside the wall and then boated them out later. I, I just should have left the beds right here, but I moved them outside anyways. While I finish preparing this breeding room, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing that now. This hardcore series is gonna continue getting better, but one of the many things I'm doing on the channel is every 1000 days, I'm gonna run a community poll to see whether you want this series to continue or if I should start again. I'm also gonna be playing things like One Block Skyblock, SMPs, servers with friends, and a lot of other great Minecraft stuff. So if that's what you're into, please consider hitting the button. Okay, the villagers are in. I can just drop them a bit of food, break one more block here, and then put a trapdoor above that. The babies can come out of the farm area to sleep, the beds are on the other side of the room, and the adults can't leave. After a day, we can check back in, see how this is going. And we already have some, oh, jeez, that scared me. Uh, Yeah, we have a couple, it's working. 
this is going well so far. We have a couple more babies, a couple of adults have grown up, excuse me, and the farmers are still in here working away. What could be better? By now you know when I say that, that things have gone wrong, right? I didn't think about this creating a village and summoning iron golems. I know they're safe in here, but they don't know that, so they summoned one. This is dangerous, annoying, and can break my iron farm. Die. Thanks. Okay, well, no more beds for you guys then. All right, and you get in a boat. And let's see, you get in a boat. I would love it if you would get in a boat and please hop in, thank you. Then I just have this one more golem to take care of. This is how I can ruin the iron farm. They can spawn outside. That should get us back to normal. Onward and upward. I want to build a cactus farm for dyes and eventually an XP storage bank. Cactus is useful for three different dyes. Green, lime, and cyan. There's nothing new or special about this build I'm going to do, so we just need a cactus farm. Let's get it built. All right, I snuck a cheeky little advancement in here. I'm trying to show you all of those. Imagine living next to a village, getting voluntary exile without starting a raid. Nice. Okay, we are on to what was meant to be the main project for this episode, working out where my megabase is going to actually sit. First, I need to get some coordinates for the edges of the island. The island is fairly round and I want to put a large circular build here. But the first thing I need to do is figure out exactly how large this circle can be and still fit in on all sides. It looks like I can fit about a 320 by 320 circle onto this island. I'm going to make it very close all the way around. The island is larger than that, but not in all spots. So I'm going to pillar up in the center and then start to build some diameter lines out so I can see where the center is and all the quadrants around that. I also want to do some terraforming while I'm here. I'll try to keep as many materials from this as I realistically can, especially early on when every block counts. I also really enjoy building with brown mushroom block and mushroom stem, so those will be important to save as well. All right, let's build these center guides. I'm gonna go 160 blocks in all four directions from this center post. That'll give us a maximum outer limit of 321 by 321. Just outlining a circle that size is gonna take us 1280 blocks or exactly 20 stacks. So you can see the entire island from up here and these are where my guidelines are at. You can see I've used basically the entire island. All right, we're gonna keep collecting some resources. I am also going to need a temporary storage here on this island. We'll just build a little platform in the middle and put a few chests down. And then we can start filling them up with things like dirt, mushroom blocks, stone, and any other goodies from the island. This is also one of the reasons that Wither Skulls are on the list. I'm going to need a beacon for the stone soon. Okay, onto this tower. I see a lot of these gradient styled towers on Reddit or Pinterest, but the original idea for this came from a user named Kraos13, 
who did a wizard tower in this style? I've laid out the gradient, now I just need to decide how tall it's going to be. One of my big plans is to build a massive tower around the mob farm, and I don't want to overshadow that or compete with it, so I'm thinking something like this. That's big enough to be a part of the village, and not so big that I'll compete with the larger project nearby. I saw another build that used this gradient upside down, and I thought I'd try it that way, so I'm going to build this from the lightest colors, in this case calcite, and move on up to the darkest colors, something like blackstone. I use a website called Hue Blocks, and if you put calcite on one end, blackstone on the other, and set a custom number of blocks to something silly like 100, you'll see a great selection of appropriate blocks for the build. The first step is going to be creating layers of each of the materials in straight lines, a couple of layers per color. I tried a few colors that didn't work in here, like polished diorite. The edges were just too sharp to make it a blended build. So that looks like this so far. You can still clearly see the defined borders between lines. We'll need to start blurring those lines a bit, and I'll do that by removing some blocks from each layer and then mixing it with the next layer up or down. So it's a bit random which of the two touching layers we'll use in a particular space. If it's random enough and not overwhelming, it should blend the two sections together well. You can see how that's looking when I do the diorite and calcite, and it's starting to blend it a bit more. I do need a little bit more diorite at the bottom so the calcite doesn't look quite so blocky in areas like this. It's mostly calcite because there's nothing to blend with below. I do have to bring the diorite lower here on the bottom level. And after I fix this lowest section that blends into the ground, I'll need to move up and I'm going to start from the top. I actually found it was way easier as I could build a little platform, blend a few layers together, then lower the platform and repeat that. And here's how it looks as the tower starts to come together. Yeah, the walls are looking a lot better now. The next thing I want to do is bring a spiral staircase up through the middle so I can move between the floors. I have an idea how this will look, so I'm just going to build a solid post all the way up, and then I'm going to experiment with wrapping stairs and slabs around it until I like it. I did try with just slabs to keep it minimalistic, but I do like how it looked with the stairs more. So I'm going to put a slab off the back of each stair and connect them, and then that'll feel pretty nice to walk up. Yeah, that's definitely what I'm after. Okay, I'm going to add floors to this, I think four floors in total. So I can start to lay out where those will go now. Speaking of floors, I'm going to need to replace the bottom story floor as well. And then next on the agenda will be to fix the windows. These windows or door frames are pretty plain and I need to sort out some sort of framing around them or some details here. I do like a little roof with some sides and maybe I'll change the floor to be more rounded into the building with these stairs. I like where this is going. I can probably work with this. I do think I'm going to use materials that match closer to the tone of the blocks. So birch at the bottom, oak as we go up, spruce, and then dark oak at the top of the tower. I'm still playing with the design. I didn't really like where it was at. Yeah, if I just go maybe with two slabs like that in the middle, I like that a lot more. I think I'm gonna go with that. Now, if I continue that gradient wood pattern all the way up, I can replace the spruce floors on the bottom and we'll go with birch in here as well. And I'll continue doing this all the way up and change all the materials as we change floors. With the build starting to feel more complete, I decided to add these fences in the corners so it was a bit more rounded and less squared off in sharp edges. And then I continued the same gradient pattern all the way up to the top that we've been using previously. And I just had to repeat what I've done on one side all the way around the tower. When it came time to add lighting, I decided to hang some lanterns from the top corners. Elytra is the best scaffolding in the game, right? And got it. And got it again. And nope, this one I had to build up too. I missed. I really like how this tower is coming out. I might just round the top turret into the body of this and call this a build for now. We have some other dimension stuff to take care of for now. I don't think I'm going to take this chest plate anymore now that I have elytra. I will, however, need the flint. Let's go make a new golden helmet and with the villager trades, add a bunch of useful enchantments onto that. 
There's no rule that your golden gear has to be garbaged here, right? Protection 4, Unbreaking 3, Mending and Thorns 3. Look, if something wants to attack me, I'll at least have Prop 4 on a helmet that bites back. I probably should have added fire protection, but oh well. Time to head to the nether. I did look for a while for ways out of my spawn fortress. I found a few, but nothing that seemed very promising. Luckily in this room I was able to hear the piglins, so I decided to just dig until I could find it. I figured it would be my way out, maybe. I had blocked off these stairs originally, but I thought that it must be coming from above, so I dug up and didn't find anything, but I made a few paths around, most of them were lava. Eventually I did put a staircase in the right spot and found my way out to a crimson forest, or what I thought was a crimson forest, but was more like a crimson crawl space. At just one high I was of course most scared of ghasts. I cleared out a little spot and then I found an area that was slightly taller. I found some piglins there and decided to lure them back into the fortress with some gold. I'm really in the nether for two reasons. The first is obviously piglin trades. I do need blackstone. I used it all up building the tower. I'd also like some fire resistance to make the nether safer, quartz for redstone components, and various things that the piggies will give me. Second, I'm in here for wither skulls. I did a bit of base terraforming earlier, which gave me some resources, but I am critically low on stone, cobblestone, and a lot of other material. A beacon would get me started on some of the Mushroom Island work, although I will need a wither skeleton farm to cover the island completely. Eventually I locked a couple of piglins in with me and traded a bunch of gold. I got quite a lot out of these trades, all of the fire resistance they gave me was splash pots though. If you know how my last hardcore death happened, you know that wasn't going to be what I'm after. At this point my trading journey was going well, but then it quickly ended. Ow! I had been using the shulker the whole time, but the piglins started attacking me for opening it. I didn't realize I had accidentally picked up all the gold and they decided trading was not on, only killing was on now. I tried to think my way through this, but decided just to murder this guy and move on. You can actually see the 61 gold in my shulker here, that was the problem. I did eventually find another couple of nice piglins and traded with them. They traded the rest of my gold. Yeah, rad from the future here. I could have used all this gold in episode 8, it would have saved me a ton of time not to trade all this here. I didn't know. Oh well, back to the overworld. During the filming of this scene, I actually saw someone pop a totem to a creeper that had wandered through a portal. It wasn't that long ago that I saw someone lose a 4,000 day world in the same way. My portal area is lit up, but I'm not taking any more chances, so I quickly blocked it in, and then I headed back to the nether. Now it's onto the wither skulls. Most of my fortress is now protected, so I can just stand behind these barriers and simply chop chop until they drop drop. Battle scene! And with those two swings, I now have all three skulls. Back home, safe and sound, and now I have everything I need for the wither. That's gonna have to wait though. Let's run through our agenda and see how we did today. Barn fixes? Done. Nano farm? Check. Clear story fixed? Yep. Terraforming? Yep, that was easy. Easy breeder? Built. Cactus farm? Done. Mega base and shoreline tower? Check and check for the work done them. And with the skulls? Yeah, we got those. That's everything we had on the list. Welcome back to my 119 Hardcore World. Last episode I took care of a bunch of little projects, and today I'd like to focus on the Mega Base, or at least the early planning for the Mega Base. I'll need to do quite a lot of terraforming on the island, including taking it all down to one equal level at one point, and then I'll sink a little recessed area into that. What I'd really like to do right now is outline exactly where the base is going to be within the island. I would normally do that with some bright colored wool so I could decide on size, shapes, placement of buildings, etc. I don't have wool like that, and until I do, we can't outline the project. So we're going to spend today taking care of the wool problem. I'm back at the nano crop farm so I can get wheat to breed plenty of sheep with. This won't take long and we'll have all the wheat I could possibly need. Now my initial thought is to build this close to home so it's running when I'm around. I only have a small pen at the moment, so we'll need to expand this and do a bit of breeding while we find a place to build this. Okay, I'm taking a look around and there are a few ideas I have in mind. The thing is, I want to build quite a sheep farm. I'm not going to waste time and build small farms unless I absolutely have to. I want to build a wool farm with about 50 sheep. I think past the tower on the way to the mob farm is one potential area. It's mostly flat over here and a pretty wide open space close to home. I spend a fair bit of time at the mob farm and with the villagers, and that will definitely keep this area loaded enough. Let's see how big this area is. It's not terrible, but 50 blocks or longer is actually quite a ways. The traditional wool farm design allows sheep every two blocks, so I could need up to 100 or more for this build if I did it in a straight line. The other area I'm looking at is behind or beside my starter house. Obviously I'm home quite a lot, and again, that's just convenient. Over time, perhaps it's too convenient, and there has to be some consideration of how many farms and which types we put in the spawn chunks. 
I've built the same wolf farm as Farzy, Cookie God, and pretty much all those other hardcore players you know for the last couple of years, but today I think we're going to do something a little bit different. I just don't know where I want to put it, but after thinking about it, it's probably not at spawn. Let's fly around and see if we can find a flat area fairly somewhat close by. This savannah is pretty nice and flat. This cave entrance is pretty cool. Let's check this out. Oh, it's not even a cave. I can fly right through there. Let's go. Oh, actually, where? Wait, this is really good. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's land and check this out. Okay, the first thing I see is that there are actually quite a few sheep right in this area already. I wouldn't have to breed or import sheep to make this work. Hmm. This is very flat. It'd be easy to fit our build here. The idea of a giant sheep grazing on that grass in the plains? Kind of funny. I could make it work. Okay, I need to head home and get some things. In between episodes 7 and 8, I started thinking about getting my 5 minute lava farm up and running. To do that though, I need lava. Unfortunately, my nether is a bit weird. Yes, I'm in the fortress, but that's about all that's been good so far. Finding buckets and buckets of lava isn't actually super easy. So I want to whip up a small dripstone lava farm here so I can start to passively accumulate some buckets and prepare to make a lava powered super smelter, the likes of which you've never seen before. All I need is a couple of buckets of lava to get me started. I don't know where the footage of the third went, but oh well, who cares. I flew around, we found lava. Let's power this small little farm. One, two, and three, and some dripstone under here. Now I'll just put a chest next to this and collect buckets whenever I see them. I'm also gonna collect resources for the rest of the build now. I do want a bit of wool to work on the fun part of this farm project later. I'm also gonna need a lot of wheat to breed since I'm not starting with my farm's worth of sheep in here. Let's get started filling the project shulker, all the things I'm gonna need. I'll have to go through all the bows and make dispensers as well. I find dispensers to be one of the worst things in the game to craft. You can't do them in bulk, and they only allow the recipe to show up if you have full health bows. I use bows from the mob farm, so that's an oof. Okay, back at the job site, the first thing I need to do is terraforming and then rounding up some of these local sheep. I also need to pick an exact spot for the build, but I think this flat level here is looking like a safe bet. Let's start tearing it up. I did say there's quite a few sheep around here, right? I rounded up 16 just from the immediate area. I'm also breeding them now as I go. Let me explain the two types of sheep farm and why I'm using the one that I've chosen. See, this is the farm everyone is pretty much aware of. If you built an automatic sheep farm, it's likely it's either this version or one that's based off of this version. There are a couple of different ones, but they all function the same. The sheep eats the grass, which triggers an observer. It fires the shears, shearing the sheep, dropping the wool into the hopper below, and then we wait for the grass to grow and we do it again. Sound familiar? This, however, is what I'm building. It's more expensive to build, but it's more than twice as fast per sheep. Each sheep is on a powered Minecraft rail in a cart. They can then choose any of the eight available blocks of grass to eat, and they grow their wool back much faster this way. This has been running for the same length of time as the standard one, which had 63 wool. This had 135. This wins. This design also uses no observers. It doesn't require quartz. It does require a lot of gold for the powered rails. The detector rail will fire off the dispenser every time the sheep comes by, but it only uses up the durability on the shears if it's a successful shear. The other thing that's great about this design is it's one wide and tileable, so it uses a lot less space per sheep than the traditional design. When you want 50 of these, well, technically 48, that makes a lot of difference in the space you're going to need to build it. Here's a working version with 10 sheep. The collection is also simplified. Instead of needing 48 hopper minecarts going into 48 hoppers into 48 double chests, I really just need these three long rail systems and three carts collecting everything. They can then be dumped into a sorting system and we can collect the wool all in one place. Finally, if I want to put on a very simple shear replacement system on the back, I'll never run out of shears. I probably won't include that today, but it is easy enough to add on later. Okay, it's time to actually build this thing. We'll run out of materials at some point, but let's get as far as we can. Ideally, I'd like to have one set of 16 fully up and running ASAP so it can start collecting white wool. I'm out of dispensers, so I'll just use stone to represent the rest, but this will represent the 48 stations, which will give us three sheep of each color. Because the farm is twice as fast as other designs, this essentially is six times faster than a standard set of 16 sheep. That's why your favorite YouTubers are constantly out of materials. They build slow farms that are too small. <laughs> 
Let's get these detector rails set up and then I can count out eight blocks here and on the ninth I can add the return block or stopper. Any shorter than this and the sheep don't eat quick enough to make the farm fast. Any longer and they take too long to get back to the shearing station after they eat, so eight blocks is actually perfect. I do need to keep breeding as I don't have 48 sheep yet. I will say this farm is not my design, I found it on a video by Borcon. This video has only 16,000 likes which is way too low for such a big brain farm, so definitely check it out after you watch this one. He goes a deeper into the mechanics of the farm and how it all works. I'm going to clear the block under each of these stopper blocks, and then I'm going to put a redstone torch on the back side of each one. This torch is going to power our entire rail system. You'll see me add a couple redstone blocks later, but those are actually for the collection system below the farm, not to keep any of this top bit running. Once that's done, I can just fill it all back in, and now I need to dig out the area where the collection system is going to actually be. I have no idea how big this actually needs to be, so I'm just going to dig out a bunch until it's usable. I do know that it'll be at least three cart lines down here, and let's say one row on either side for access and maintenance. Maybe I'll go five wide. A couple high should be enough. I don't want to overcomplicate this. I'm also going to run a line of hoppers from the bottom of the collection off to the side here. What I'm hoping to do is set up 16 filtered auto sorters and eventually collect each color in its own chest. For now, this just means running a long line of 18 or 19 hoppers away from the cart lines, and that should be about enough. Having this much storage is also going to require a lot of chests and even more hoppers, so I did need to fly over to the nearby jungle and chop a few trees, then I could just fly back over and start adding these chests. I also need to widen this area a bit more, it's getting just a tiny bit cramped in here. Now if I come back to all these chests and connect them up with hoppers, this whole collection system will be working. It's not auto sorting yet, but we'll get there. Once I add the double chest to all of this, we'll need to go back and work on gathering more materials. I'm at the mob farm because I need dispensers. I still need a lot of dispensers, so I need bows. I don't have an easy way to get string, and I don't have an easy way to get spiders since my mob farm is spider proofed. I'm relying on the skeleton drops for this. That makes me want to tear this farm down and build a flushing mob farm for now, but I still need the XP for this. Maybe I'll make an enderman XP farm, then I can blow this whole farm up, make a flushing farm. Or I could just cover this farm with the tower I have planned. I don't know, we'll see. For now, I have quite a few bows so I can go make these dispensers. The next resource I need is gold. This isn't going to be nearly as easy as a 15 second montage of swinging at a couple of mobs. I actually need a lot of gold. I would normally get this gold from a gold farm, but I'm still too early in the game and I don't have one yet. So I tried a few different things. First, I mined at negative 16. That's the best level for gold in most biomes. I found a little bit, but it really wasn't worth the time investment, so I moved to a mesa. I know Badlands have way more gold, and you can find it at any Y level, so this should actually be better. Unfortunately, I chose this area kind of poorly, and it wasn't very productive. I dug my first tunnel straight into this water. Obviously, that wasn't going to work very well. Then I did a small tunnel that showed me that the mesa was worth mining, but I probably needed to find a bigger and better area. While flying around, I had the idea that surface gold and cave openings could be productive, and boy, was that right. I'll tell you right now, if you need a stack, two, three, maybe five of gold, do this first. I found a significant amount of my gold ore flying from cave to cave without going underground at all. It was actually a surface ore that got me back into this underground. I started mining this tunnel where I found a lot more gold, but then it was back to the surface, and yeah, in a big Badlands area, this is easily the fastest way to find some easy gold. Even before I land here, you'll see three different veins in this one chunk. It's also pretty safe, despite it, it's like these guys trying to ruin your day. So I mined as much gold as I could. Powered rails are not cheap and we need a ton of it. Another way I got some of the gold was to check all of the ruined portals as I flew around and found them. A solid block is nine ingots, which is great progress toward our goals. Finally, I also checked mine carts in the mesa. You never know what you're gonna find. For example, this one had nothing in it, but this one had gold. I also found this weird temple in a village. You can see all the way down to the TNT, check this out. Adventuring around Minecraft and finding stuff like this exposed lush cave in a desert always makes me happy. I could fly around forever and just see the new stuff. Maybe one day we'll do nothing but a world exploration and take down some coordinates for future projects. This cave is actually unbelievable. Okay, I don't have a totem yet, so I'm glad I didn't take too much damage here as I flew in a bit too fast, but wouldn't it have been hilarious content if I managed to open the minecart as I flew by, saw the enchanted golden apple and died on the landing? I didn't, but that would have been funny. Wait, I just got an enchanted golden apple. I'll be honest, when I checked the cart and saw the golden apple, my heart skipped thinking I had another enchanted golden apple. This mine shaft is exposed to the sky. This is pretty cool, I do really love the exploration. Time to check more carts. All right, I've already checked this one. I did see another one as I came in, but I've kind of lost it. Is it over? No, it's not down there. It is not this way, back this way. There it is. All right, let's check this last cart, I think. Oh my God, are you actually kidding me? Well, we went from one enchanted apple to three and just one adventure out. That's not bad. I know they're more common now because of ancient cities, but it's still cool to find them. I did have to go find a bit more gold and then I headed home to fortune the ores and cook it all up. This is a lot of ore, let's just speed this up. 
Cooking all this ore with just three furnaces and some coal made me realize we're going to need a super smelter soon. Spoiler alert, my next video will be a tutorial for a custom design I created myself just for this world. As you can see, six gold ingots make six powered rails, so each ingot equals one rail. It's definitely expensive to make this many powered rails, but let's make them all and let's go back. I have all the dispensers here now, so we can get those placed. Oh yes, I'm still going to need more of them. Now it's time to get the first set of 16 powered rails up. Rails aren't that much fun to work with, are they? I don't know if they're ahead of or behind villagers, but they're close to as annoying. All right, there we go. The first section is going to be finished just like that. And I need to move some powered rails to the collection system, so we'll go do that before making more of the farm above. It's fine if we only have 16 set up for now. It can be collected. There's no point in setting up 48, but none can be auto-collected, I suppose. Now I can add the rest of the dispensers and get as far as I can with the powered rails above. I'm going to add an empty minecart to each of these 16 tracks now. Then I'll break a few sheep out of the sheep jail up here. My plan is simple. Hold the wheat until they come my way, then run to the other end. Place a block, lure some out, and then break the block. This is going to be a mess. Nah, it was actually way easier than I expected. I just had to walk them over the track a few times and most jumped straight in. I had broken 14 out, so I needed to get two more. At this point, I learned something new about Minecraft. You can breed two sheep who are in minecarts next to each other. Once I had this baby, I just let it down to the empty cart. And get in there. Thank you. Then I bred these first two, and poof, I'll have my 16 sheep. Now to dye them. With the first batch done, I can put the shears back into the dispensers and let the fun begin. Please work, please work, please. Yes! We have wool. I'm going to need to AFK this for a bit so I can do a build for this farm. But first I need to block the sides and raise the back. Wool was escaping and we don't want to lose any. Here you can see the progress of the farm. If you watch, some of it will be sheared for you. Over time, I'm going to cover this in grass so it makes the grass below spread much quicker. I'm also going to build around these guys and enclose the entire farm. I can start the build now, and if you didn't catch what I said earlier, my plan is to put a giant sheep laying down in this field, getting very fat off the grass. Very, very fat off the grass. I want to make the face as close to a real Minecraft sheep as I can. Real Minecraft sheep? Huh? What? That's not an oxymoron. It just sounds like it should be one. Sheep in Minecraft look flippin' derpy, actually. Let's see if I can make this look derpy enough to be a real Minecraft sheep. As long as we make it cross-eyed like this, I think we'll be fine. Let's just see how it looks. <laughs> yep, that looks like a derpy Minecraft sheep. I know I'm not the first, and I certainly won't be the last to make giant mobs or some oversized Minecraft figure into a farm. But it's fun, I've never actually done it as far as I can remember. It's overused, but it's just a derpy sheep farm, so I'm gonna have a little fun with it. I need more wool, so it's time to AFK. I'm gonna go into this box. I don't really like AFKing in this world, and I've barely done it. I couldn't just stand here. So actually, I'm gonna go back out and start mining the sand next to the farm, so I can collect this for future projects. There was a ton of sand just sitting there, and it was still running the farm. Two birds, one stone, all that. I ended up with about a shulker of sand, and the farm was still running, so that's great. However, I did come back and just stand here for a while. Once that was done, I decided to see how much wool I had. Holy! That's with just one third of the farm run, and oh my. That's actually a lot of wool. A lot more than I was expecting. Everything seems to be running up here as expected. I did have to replace these blocks with stone. Endermen were taking the dirt and the farm did stop for a little while. Let's see how outside is looking. Somehow these carts managed to sync up almost perfectly, but in two batches. I wonder if lag or something else does that. At any rate, I need to finish the farm, so we're back in the mines getting a lot more gold. I would really suggest building this version of the farm after you build a gold farm, but hey. Lessons for next time. We took all the learning from the earlier gold exploration, this was a lot easier to find this time. I kind of cruised through this part of the mining. You don't suppose. Ah, just another gold apple. Okay, I'm getting greedy now. Home again and we'll just repeat the process from last time. We'll fortune the gold and then smelt it up as well. You can practically hear the fireplace crackling as the gold smelts down. Yeah, I realize I should use blast furnaces for this, but I'm a simple kind of guy sometimes. I should have enough powered rail now. And this is synced up even more than before. It's so weird. Anyway, let's lay this track down. Well, this is certainly going to be the fun part. Let's let him out. Okay, you're all free. Just do what I ask. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me better. You're all free to spend the rest of your life in one of these minecarts. Pick the one you want. I can see how this wouldn't sound like an attractive proposition if they speak English. 
Let's hope they don't. They're derpy. They probably barely speak sheep. Let's color this last one in. Now we can start to outline the body for this. My overall plan is to bring the white all the way around, but I may end up covering the top of the body with a bit of a rainbow, almost like a saddle or a blanket to represent the colors. I'll also need to collect more dirt and grass to put a natural roof over the sheep before I cover them in wool. As I mentioned before, this roof actually spreads grass going down to the layer below. So once it all grows in, it's a very good feature to have and makes the farm even faster. With that built, I'm just gonna add a few more grass blocks here and there so it can grow a bit quicker. I probably need a silk touch shovel for this overall. I have decided on that rainbow. I'm only gonna go down a few blocks on the side here. I don't wanna cover all of the white. I just wanna give it a little, nice little cover. If I go three stripes of each color, it'll match what's inside, and then I can do the rest of the sheep in white, whatever that means is left over. With that done all the way across, you can see the three stripes of each color, including the white at the end. There are actually a few more than three of the white just finished off, but that's okay. Inside the farm is now working away quite quickly, quite efficiently. And I'm now collecting a ton of wool, which we'll need for upcoming projects. Now I can AFK with the full farm ready to go. I've AFK'd the farm for a little while now. I also came inside and set up the item filters I was talking about earlier. You can see each column of chest now has its own color. They're simple impulse SV item sorters, nothing fancy, but they work. This has been a very involved project, but it's actually done. Now I can collect all the wool we need, but for now, I'm out of here. So where am I flying to? Well, let's go see actually flying to the mushroom island that will be the home of my eventual mega base. I brought a couple of shulkers of wool with me now that we have some. I'm going to use pink, purple, and magenta to start laying out the shapes that I want and the locations. They're very bright and will show up against the mushroom island when I actually start building. We'll also take a break from this giant layout to do some trident hunting, biome seeking, and bring back a few friends. I should warn you though, the series could have ended in this episode. I made a huge mistake. We'll get there. It's definitely my closest encounter with death so far. I don't really know how to explain this mega base concept, except to say it's the biggest project I've even considered doing in Minecraft, let alone actually began. I'm actually laying out a circle that is 321 by 321 from side to side. To make this single layer is gonna take 1280 blocks or exactly 20 stacks of wool. These blocks are the center of what will become a very large stone wall enclosing the main area. Inside that main area is a city and castle. My base itself will be a massive multi-structure castle on the back side of this area. And inside that castle zone will be approximately seven smaller but still large buildings and one extreme main castle piece. My thousand item auto sorter with shulker unloaders, lava powered super smelter, and a bunch of farms will sit inside the base as well. Outside of this will be two rivers and two large structures that I'll leave more secret for now. Those two large structures will extend pretty much to build height or near that. And within the rest of the city, I'll carve out another very large circle that is about two thirds the size of the main one. The inner circle will recede into the ground and I'll do a bit of digging and terraforming to make it large enough to hold an oversized bridge and two sides of the town. On the one side, factories, farms and such, and on the other, education, military and trade. Between the outer and inner circle where the castle doesn't sit will be all the residences, cathedrals, other small and large buildings. As I said, this is easily my largest build I've ever even considered building. I've shown people who think that it's quote, unachievable, and some just wish me luck and laughed. We'll see. You can tell from how I'm doing this how complex this project is. I'm actually using the two different colored wools to create the circle, mainly so I can track where I'm up to while building it. There's no easy way for me to construct such an oversized wall without losing track, and the two wool colors keep me on pace. When I get back to the same color that's in my hands, it's time to do the next layer. So I'm trying to do this from each of the longest four pieces and flying from side to side to place the next segment of the circle. I actually tried doing this by simply counting it out, like, okay, this is 12, 10, 8, 6, and a bunch of fours and a bunch of threes. Uh, there was no way. It was almost impossible to do that way. I lost track multiple times. By the time you can figure out which ones overlap, which ones don't, which ones connect, where the dividing line should be between the quarters of the circle, it's really impossible to do that way, at least for me. Let's take a look at how we're going so far. You can see the circle starting to come together and exactly how large it is from up here. Not enough work done though. Let's jump back to the end of the circle. This is where it'll connect. Oh yeah, that looks way better. I've been placing blocks for what feels like hours, because it was. I'll decide which of these sides will be the front, which will be the back, and figure out where the rest of the layout is going to go, but for now I'm going to sidetrack into another mission. I want to remove every mushroom block from the island. Yeah, it has to happen sometime, now's as good a time as any. I'm going to do it a quarter of the circle at a time and just see how I go. I'm trying to collect every block though from this, so I'll use my Silk Touch Axe. There aren't a lot of better light colored blocks to build with than mushroom block, but it's such a pain to get. Clearing this whole island will give me so many blocks I can use later. We'll do this with a bit of a time lapse.
Ooh, I like this. I left some mushroom outside the circle, but I don't know if they're going to stay. I'm tempted to remove every mycelium block and replace it with grass. If I do, we'll have a very bright green island, but it would definitely mean removing the remaining mushrooms. What do you think? Should I turn the island green or just build around the mycelium for now? The next step in outlining the base is going to be to create the smaller inner circle. And this will take up about two thirds of the island and will be the area I dig down into and lower a city into. It will also be surrounded by a massive retaining wall. The circle isn't quite as complicated as the first, so I think I can do the whole thing in pink and just go for it. And the inner circle is now done. Let's take a quick peek. You can start to see the city coming together. That'll be the sunken in bit in the pink, and it's about two thirds the size of the outer edge. The area closest to us will be the front gate, and the back will be where my castle sits. I'm going to take a break from placing wool and do something else that's productive. This traumatized me in the last hardcore series, but if you've been around the channel, you probably remember back when I went trident hunting for 10 hours. It stands out. I needed some redemption after such a terrible run last time. Do you have a trident? Nope. Okay, we're just gonna keep looking for guys that have a trident. You don't have one, you don't have one, and you don't have one. How about you? No, no. Oh, I thought he did. He's got a fishing rod. Nope. This is a big group, but no. How about you? I always keep hitboxes on for this, it makes them easy to see. Oh, there's one here with a trident. This is a pretty big group. Kill some of these guys before I go after the trident guy. Make him kill some of them too. That's always easy. Let's get this trident now. This will be the first guy with the trident I've actually seen in the series. Nah, nothing. How about, no, you don't have one. Another big group here. Do you have one? No, something just came flying by. Oh, wait, I see one. I think he's over here. We're gonna circle around a bit. I wanna stay safe. They still hurt quite a bit. Trident's actually hurt. Even though I've got, oh, there's actually two. Okay, I'm gonna use the building and shield a little bit so I can get this guy. Oh, of course you did. Let's get him. We're gonna try and kill this one first and then focus the other one. Oh, there's a lot of mobs here. Okay, no trident from you. That's two. Let's go fight this third guy. Oh, ow. That hurts. Stop hitting me. Ow. God. Okay, this guy needs to die. That actually hurts. Can I make him kill his friend here? Nope. Ow, that hurts. Stop it. Okay, how about... Oh, he did kill his friend. Nice. Good job. You kill everybody. Get hit. I'm gonna grab this stuff. Ow. That hurt. Stop it. And... Ow. Did he just kill himself with thorns and drop a trident? That's nice. There's my trident there. Alright, we'll go back and do some enchanting on it then. It took me 10 hours to get a trident last time. It took me exactly three drowns with trident this time. We're going to do an enchanting on this and get channeling and loyalty, put some books on it, and eventually we're going to end up with this pretty awesome trident. It's got impaling four, not five, but that's okay. It's got mending now, so we can just repair it quickly, and there it is. A near-perfect trident. Most hardcore deaths have a moment where you think, I should have done this instead. I had a small, peaceful little idea in mind for the rest of this episode, then I decided to go out adventuring. I should have done my small idea. But I saw these LAs and I wanted to rescue them. I thought I'd shoot a few pillagers, break them out. Come here, little LA friends. I gotta break these ones out. And then I'd run away with them, kill a few more pillagers on our escape, and I could lead them away and we'd go home. Anyone who has moved to Lays is laughing at me right now. You don't have to laugh that hard at me, do you? Moving a Lays is no joke, and you don't just lead them where you want to go. Leads don't really work the way you'd like on a Lays, nor does luring them like you can with cows or sheep, even if you throw the block they're holding. They basically hate you being happy and go out of their way to break leads, make your life miserable, fly the opposite direction, and yeah, I thought it was copper golems who were meant to push people's buttons. I think we got scammed. Sometimes they're just there and then you turn around and three of them are gone. How? What? Okay, so I grabbed the leads, put them back on, and... Yeah, I, I don't learn. I put them back on. Luckily for me, we're only 2,700 blocks from home. I may have to kill these guys. After losing them over and over and over... No, where is he? Serious? Where? I remember the lays can fly, but it's not helpful in any way. Eventually, my luck did turn. This ocean is 2,200 blocks from home, but it's just ocean. I can simply boat the LA's home and do this in peace. 
And thankfully, it's pretty easy to just get LAs into boats by putting a boat next to them. Row, row, row my boat with annoying LA. Merrily, 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 merrily. You lucky, you're cute, that's all I'll say. I wouldn't cut you up into little blueberry-sized bits, would I? I would. I really would. While heading to repair my elytra, I'd thought about becoming a villager. Hmm. Hmm. Back and forth I need to go now, traveling over 10,000 blocks total to get all the LAs home. And then eventually, I'd get past the third, and finally the fourth trip. I really do like the view coming home at night, though. It's so rare for me to be in a boat, on the water, just calmly rowing toward all my builds like this. I really like how the village is coming together. Since I'd been out adventuring, I decided to keep going. I am at 42 out of 52 biomes located for Adventure Time. I wanted to see if I could finish that up. So I flew over some snowy mountains, found this nice ice spikes, did some gravelly hills, kept flying around to try and find as many biomes as I could find. Along the way, I found plenty of ruined portals and villages like this one down here. Kept going and flew through this snowy taiga here. I'd opened up into a lush cave that was exposed to the surface. I don't have lush cave yet, so I'm gonna jump into this and get, at least get this bio. Found this zombified village. That's pretty interesting. Saw this hole, almost went by it, but decided to turn around and come back. I should have kept going. It was about here that I lost every brain cell I've ever had. I thought this looked cool, so I thought I'd take a closer look. I just want to make sure nothing's going to fall on me. It looks like a huge lush cave down there. Uh-oh. How unfortunate. And then I died. At least I died on the inside. Here's what really happened. That window sound was me alt tabbing out in a panic. This is what actually happened. The creeper was above me in the corner there. You can see him from this angle. I couldn't see him. I looked up. Don't see him. Looked back down and he dropped right on me. Thankfully, he knocked me onto the block below. And that actually saved me. This is as close as I want to get to dying, okay? Was the cave below worth it? Well, this is what's actually down here. Using replay mod, I can jump into the cave and see. This is how easily you can actually turn placing wool and calmly row row rowing some alays home into a drop creeper less than a block from ending your entire season. Despite the short episode, I think it's time to nope on out of here and go home. I went to the place that was safe. There are zero mobs and lots of wool to place. The blue wool will represent the two rivers that I want to come from behind the castle, and laying it out seems like a small thing, but if I get it wrong, the rivers will be too straight and make the castle look too square. If they're too far out, it'll make the castle look like it has a chonky behind, like me. Here's my first attempt. That was too small. This is my second, but yeah, too square. This is result number four or five, I don't know. It's looking better. I might still fix this up, but I'm not sure. The yellow will represent a large bridge that spans over the lower sunken city, while this pink circle will be that sunken area. Actually, let me try this. Castle, houses, the rivers will come from the back here and feed into a fountain that will sit here. And this river will come on this side and do the same into a fountain that will also sit here. Then we go bridge down the middle, sunken city here and on this side over here, and then towers here and here. I've added the spots for the towers and the front gate to go now. Today we're going to build two overpowered farms that are overpowered for very different reasons. The first farm we're going to build is a Wither Rose farm. For this farm, I'm going to need two to four stacks of pumpkins, and I don't have that, so we're going to go over here. Why are you hanging out way up here? Huh, oh, well, you got slime balls. Those are cool. I'll take those. Okay, let's get out of here. Ow. Anyways, I need a lot of car pumpkins, and I don't have enough, so we're going to build the temporary pumpkin farm next to the wool farm. Why here? Because while I tend that, I can collect more wool at the same time. Two birds and all that. I'm going to quickly plant the seeds I do have, collect a few batches, and start gathering the rest of the materials. To speed this along, I'm going to bone meal the stems. You can't bone meal the pumpkins into growing, but you can bone meal the stems from seed all the way up to full grown. This definitely speeds up the process, so it was worth doing for me. Also, while the pumpkins here are growing, I can fly around the nearby chunks to find other pumpkins. I can't get too far away, or the pumpkins won't grow, but I'm better off looking for a batch of 10 or 15 or 20 than I am just waiting for a couple to sprout anyway. I can't get them all this way, but batches like this will speed up the gathering and staying near the wool farm will give those new stems ample chance to grow. You can tell I haven't gone too far out as most of these pumpkins are actually growing now. Let's gather these up and head back out. If you don't know it already, the farm I'm building is by ENX04, the designer of my iron farm as well. He builds a lot of super easy and overpowered farms and this Wither Rose farm is no exception. Ooh, this looks like a cool cave. Let's check it out. It's not like last time I said, ooh, cool cave. Let's check this out that anything bad happened, right? Yeah, let's play it a little more safe this time. That is actually really cool, but we're going to leave. Before Ian designed this farm, we would collect shulkers and shulkers of eggs, dispense them under the end portal, let them grow up, 
poison the chickens, summon the wither, and then let the explosion kill them all. Ow. Resulting in a stack of wither roses per shulker or two of eggs, at best. That's pretty gross. Ian's farm produces, well, infinite wither roses, as long as you wish to keep gathering them. I plan to gather about a shulker plus a few more for projects like a magma farm. I now have just over four stacks of pumpkin, that'll do. I'm gonna head back home and and this guy's still here. Oh, no he's not, never mind. The next thing I need is snow. See, unlike the traditional farm, we aren't killing chickens today. We're killing snow golems. So I need to be able to create snow golems in the end. I'm going to make eight stacks of snowballs to go with my four stacks of pumpkins. See, math, school is good, stay in school. I'm back at the wool farm because I can't do this at home. We're gonna let more pumpkins grow and also more wool to be collected while I just set up the world's easiest snowball farm. This doesn't work in the savannah at home. I'm gonna set up a little one block by two high chamber, drop some snow in it, add the pumpkin, shear that, and we've got a snowman. Now all I gotta do is aim down at the ground like this, use my shovel to break the snow layer, he's gonna instantly replace that. This is the fastest way to collect a valuable building block in all of Minecraft, to be honest. I featured it in an old video showcasing five farms that took me less than five minutes to build total. Very powerful farms, you should check it out. Back home finally, and we have our snow golem bits. Let's get our wither bits out too and drop those in the shulker. I'm gonna need some iron to craft shears with. Shears don't stack, so I'll just take the iron directly to the end and craft them once we're there. I'm gonna need a few solid blocks, a couple slabs, a trapdoor, and the rest of the building blocks now. I don't really wanna do a tutorial on this farm, so just follow along or watch Ian's video, which will be linked in the description. I have a few more things to gather, including redstone components, some barrels, and we'll take obsidian, but not for the farm. I want to move my nether portal from the fortress to the nether roof, especially now that I have access to the end. Before we head back to the end, I do need to shear all four stacks of pumpkins. There are redstone ways to do this, but by the time I put one together, use it, take it down, I could already be done. It's also quite satisfying to watch the seeds go everywhere and actually do this. Okay, I have my ladders and my ender pearl. If you don't know, getting to the nether roof is quite simple on Java. You just need to find a block that's located at wide 127 in the nether. So we'll do that now. I'm gonna staircase up here. Should let me block this kid in and you saw nothing. All right, I'm gonna keep digging this staircase all the way up until I find bedrock. And there we go, that's where the bedrock starts. Now I just need to find a block at Y127. Normally what I do is just create a little room up here and then just poke holes around and see where we can go. Usually it doesn't take too long to find. I poked a hole right here, that's at Y127. Now I'm just gonna fill the room back in so that nothing can spawn up here. I'm not really concerned with making it fully spawn proof, just reducing the spaces. Then all I have to do is get my ladders and build up to the top here like this. Then I'm gonna grab my ender pearl. I'm gonna climb up the ladder, aim at the space between the ladder and the next block up, and then just throw the pearl and then jump. Let's just mark that block for later. Once I get to the coordinates, I can just build my stronghold portal up here. I'm gonna pay for the top corners because I think I'm a fancy rich boy or something. Then I can just light this portal, go on through, and this isn't the stronghold, and that is very dark. Hmm. I watched back some old footage, and I didn't light the stronghold portal. It wasn't very smart. So we'll have to go back through the 2x2 two two hole I made. Oh well. We're back in the portal room, and yeah, as you can see, I didn't light this here. We can do that quickly, and then jump in to test it. That should take us back to the roof. Perfect. We're back on the roof, then we can just go back in and go through the stronghold. Excellent. Let's go build us a wither rose farm. Basically, the farm works like this. I'm gonna spawn the wither in under the end portal here. Most of you already know that that will keep the wither from escaping, but he'll occasionally shoot explosive skulls. Those skulls can damage the snow golems we're gonna put in, but they can't damage us even when we stand up straight. Normally the pumpkins would be used up with each golem, so the resources I've brought would make four stacks of golems and thus four stacks of wither roses. But I said I want a shulker. So how does that math work? Well, the genius of this farm is that there's a dispenser with shears that will shear the pumpkins back off the golems as soon as they're created, before the wither kills them. That's such a genius mechanic, right? Those pumpkin heads will go straight back into my inventory and I can load the whole system up again and do it again. Won't the wither suffocate in the bedrock? Sure, if you don't touch him at all, he will. But if he kills things, he recovers health. So each golem he kills restores a little bit of his health, and because I'm feeding him so many, he's never gonna drop too low. You can see how incredible this farm's already gonna be, right? I can make an infinite amount of wither roses with just the materials I brought. It's also a very simple farm to create. I'm about halfway done building this already. While I finish, let me tell you some of the things you can do with wither roses and why I care about building this farm. See, everyone knows you can kill stuff and make black dye with wither roses, right? Well, let's assume I'm probably never gonna use it for black dye. I'll make a squid farm before I ever do that. 
So what do I want to kill? Well, first of all, I love making a magma cream farm. With that, you can make fire resistance potions. You can create magma blocks. I like magma blocks because almost every good gold farm uses thousands and thousands of them, and I don't want to go mining them. I like gold farms though, so I need them. Wither roses can also be used in creeper farms, iron farms, wither skeleton farms, and a lot of other good designs. Having some around is never a bad thing. Wither roses will also kill ghasts, and I like a good ghast farm as well. I may use a portal based looting farm this time, but it doesn't hurt to have options. Before long I'd like to respawn the dragon 19 more times and open all the gateways. That way if I decide to do builds on the end island, they won't get destroyed later on. Let's add this trapdoor, open it like this, and the farm is actually already done. Again if you missed the build, just watch it on Ian's video, he deserves the view. Now I just add the final head to summon the wither, always fun. Get the advancement, run away, and then he'll explode for us. This farm is very loud, probably louder than the nano crop farm. I'm gonna mute it right now. Now all I have to do is place snow blocks on this end stone piece here. Once two are there, the pumpkin will be dispensed, creating the golem, which will then get sheared, giving me the pumpkin back, and the golem drops into the kill chamber with the wither down here. That'll happen over and over again. Here's what's happening in the kill chamber below. Once I'm out of snow, I can simply refill the dispenser with pumpkins that I've collected. Then I'll be able to drop into the farm and start collecting the wither roses and the snow I need to make more golems. The wither's still bashing away, but he can't hit me, so I'm safe down here. You'll see the snow golems are leaving quite a bit of snow behind, so I can just craft that into the blocks I need to make more golems. The entire farm is renewable. And once I have some wither roses, I can use those as a filter in my inventory and just go collect the rest. Once I pick all this up, I can head back to the surface. You can see that in just one round I picked up two stacks of wither roses, and now you can settle it. I'm just going to do this over and over again until I get all the wither roses that I want. Let's save some time. I did this for more than a few rounds. I'm now almost at a full shulker of wither roses, and with one more round I've filled the barrel, and I will have some more left over, so I think I'll be good. And I'll leave the snow here in case I need some later. To collect my nether star, all I need to do now is come down and kill the wither. You'll notice I'm using my axe, not my sword. My sword actually has knockback too, and unfortunately that can dislodge the wither from the end portal. Not every time, but well, let's just not dislodge a wither, huh? All right, we finished that off. Eventually I'll fight a wither alone in a field just for fun, but let's just slay this one for now and collect our nether star. Let's get out of here. All right, let's craft up our first beacon, take it to the mushroom island, and then make our first full beacon. I know this won't cover the island, of course, but it's a start. I can terraform in peace now. Of course, the beacon's good for stone, so I'm going to start by terraforming some dirt. But what's a little trolling between friends, right? Alright, let's put haste 2 on this, get a couple of advancements this way, and we're good. Let's ruin the island. At least I get to haste mine a little bit of stone here. That's a start. I will have plenty of work here to do. It'll be fine. All right, let's head back for now. You've probably seen me collecting lava from this very small, very simple dripstone farm. If you haven't seen it by now, check out my recent video on the lava powered super smelter. I'll be making that eventually, so I need 44 buckets of lava to get started. That's what that's going to be for, but not today. I'm going to start making the enderman farm now, so I need to collect the resources we're going to need, including this name tag. I'm going to build the farm from stone brick and gray carpet for now. We'll do something different later, but I don't have the materials I want and I can't afford to wait in building the Enderman farm. My gear isn't perfect, we're 10 episodes in, and if I'm going to keep terraforming, my shuffle and then my pickaxe is going to get worn out over and over, so I need the farm now. We're going to head back up to the nether roof, and this time I'm going to do something a bit different up here. I need to be able to get between home and the roof easily, so I'm going to break a hole in the bedrock. I'm going to grab the coordinates, jump back up to the roof with the pearl, same as before. Now that I'm up here, I can confirm that we're on the correct block and we're going to replace the torch here. Now I'm just going to grab a few materials. This is the simplest way I know how to break bedrock. There are a lot of ways, but this one to me makes the process absolutely easy and you won't take a lot of damage or kill yourself in the explosion. So it's really perfect for hardcore. I'm going to put the piston where I want the bedrock broken. That's where the torch was. I'm going to put a piece of obsidian behind it and one beside it. Then I'm going to put a trap door on the front of this front obsidian. I'm going to flip that down. Then I'm going to put a lever on the back one. I'm going to put two TNT behind the obsidian like this, add a redstone dust next to the obsidian like that. Now you can use an auto clicker, but what I'll do is rebind my right click to a keystroke. In my case, I always use B. Keystrokes are way faster than you can click yourself, so this is by far the easiest way for me. You can just repeatedly press right click if you like. 
Okay, let's blow up bedrock. So I'm gonna flip this lever, flip the trapdoor, get into a crawl position, and then I have to put myself with the extended piston head and aim at the top corner just like this and hold down that B key, and that should be done. The bedrock is now broken and I can come and go as I choose. Easy. Don't forget to rebind your right click. This is painful when you forget. I'm gonna mark the home portal here and then we can fly to the end portal again. It's this way, so I'm just gonna mark it for easy reference. And then one rocket away and we'll be basically back to where we need to go. It's time to build an Enderman farm. For this, I'm gonna go off the back of the spawn platform as it's always pretty close to the void and we can make the job of getting away from the end island a lot easier. Yep, that's pretty much the void right there. I'm gonna to need to fix this ground right here. It's a little bit uneven. I'll make the mistake of jumping into the void one day, I'm sure. Now I just need to add a bit of lava and let that flow down. Once we add the water, people will always say, ride the water down and then place your block at the bottom. Oh, hell no, we ain't doing that. There's a much simpler way than bobbing in the water and trying to stay afloat. We've made a cobblestone pillar. Simply mine it down until you're at the block that's at Y0. Just don't swim over the void in hardcore, please. Thank you. I'm sure these one-hit Enderman farms aren't new to most of you, so let's do this with some music, shall we? Okay, it's time to test this thing out. Oh, look at all that XP. Feels so good to have an Enderman farm in the new world. You can see the Ender Pearl dropper working just fine, even though we can't really hear it from here either. Gotta love the automated pearl disposal. I'm saving one double chest of pearls, as you may have seen with the hopper alignments, 
but I'm putting the other eight hoppers into the void. All right, let's take a few more swings. It's very satisfying. All right, let's get out of here. Actually, let me take a look back at this. We will do some sort of build around this later and change the materials, but I'm not exactly sure what it'll be yet. Now we can get back to doing our mega base terraforming. The shovel and the pickaxe will still wear down way too quickly. We should see about maybe blowing up the nether next episode. Anyway, I need to get some work done. By the end of this episode, I'll be at day 500. That's halfway to our first community vote on keeping the series or starting over. What do you think so far? If you had to vote right now, would you vote to keep going or would you vote to start again and build a fast, technical world with a lot of farms before starting our big builds? I'm curious, leave your answer in the comments. For me, I've never built this much this quickly in a world ever. The builds, the farms, I think it's all been going well. If you do vote to start me over, that's okay, I promise. I want to build a world you want to watch, but if you don't, we're going to keep going with this mega base concept, build out the best world that I know how to create. Right now, I'm going to focus on digging out the lower city so we can start to create the different levels and get terraforming to a place where the whole build can start to make sense. I can't do all of the terraforming or we'd never make progress in the world and you'd definitely vote for me to restart, but I can't just do the smaller village type builds because you'd likely see the progress is too slow and would also vote for me to restart. So we're trying to do a little bit of balance, build some farms, work on the village, work on the mega base, and adventure some to get the advancements done, like this one. Actually, let's get a few more advancements done today. Some are very easy. I just need to throw this trident at something. Maybe let's go hit, uh, ooh, I see an iron golem. Easy, and, oh, don't, don't throw that there. Oh God, I forgot about the lava. We could have just lost the trident. Let's make this a bit easier and throw it at a sheep or something. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Okay, I didn't know that was gonna kill it in one shot, but advancement done. Oh, next I need to summon an iron golem. I know where this is going. Don't mind me, I'm not doing anything over here. Nothing at all. Oh, hi. Get him, big guy. He got him. Let's keep looking. What else can we do? Light as a rabbit? Sure, we just need to find powdered snow. I have a lot of snow biome that I already know, but it doesn't seem that there's any powdered snow here. It's quite a nice area though. Anyway, let's try something easier. What about this glow ink one? This should be easy. Let's put a sign here. Replace with lava smelter. Yeah, I wanna change these furnaces out soon. And let's make it glow. Advancement, done. I did manage to also get whatever floats your goat and light as a rabbit, but for good reasons, I need to keep those a secret for now. You'll see why at another time. So that's it. We're now on day 500, halfway to our goal of the first thousand days. Minecraft is a fun and peaceful building game most of the time. And then sometimes you go to the nether and detonate an entire shulker of TNT. Today is that kind of day. Let's go blow some shit up. Welcome back to my 119 hardcore world. Last episode, we built an enderman farm and finished gearing up. Well, I'm still in diamond gear, so I don't know if I'm all that geared up. I want netherite. Lots of netherite. Enough to waste on a hoe, a lodestone, and whatever else I want. Maybe a netherite boat. Oh wait, they never made those, did they? You're probably wondering what any of this has to do with me flying up to the mob farm. And that's a good question. In fact, if you weren't wondering about this or that random shulker of crap I was putting together, we need to talk. This is the part where I'm going to explain the next 20 minutes of what in the random Minecraft heck is happening today. In order to blow up an entire shulker of TNT in the nether, we're going to need a lot of resources. So maybe you thought I was coming up here for some gunpowder. And that's not wrong, but in this case, it's not exactly right either. I'm here for string. I need to make a different kind of mob farm. I considered making a large creeper farm, but the idea of breeding that many cats from just Blaze and Percy was terrifying. So I decided to build a scaffold-based flushing mob farm. And you probably already know this, but it's by ENX04. Why would you know that? Well, he designed my iron farm, my villager trading hall. And let's be honest, I'm gonna build more of his farms before this series is over. He's not paying me to promote him but his work speaks for itself. This is not a great way to get string. What if I just let them accumulate up the top, break in, and that's a creeper. Be careful here. Sadly, this is my best way to get string currently. Also, when I went back down to clear out the mob farm, this happened. I would like to know how in the fills of Minecraft this baby zombie escaped the farm. Was it knockback on the chicken jockey? I don't know. Oh, those are back-to-back -back sentences that won't make sense unless you play and watch Minecraft, and those are creepers. Okay. The problem with manually coming up for the spiders is most of this farm only produces creepers. When I open the walls, one of two things happens. I see enough spiders to fill a Stephen King novel, or I'm face to face with a creeper coming out from the dark, which also kind of sounds like a Stephen King novel. Let's just get more string. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Say, ow. Nope, I'm leaving. The string is collected, at least enough for a few layers of the farm. We can always build more later once the farm's running. For now, I need to find a place to put it. I'm thinking of building it in the desert near the pillager outpost. Deserts produce a lot less rotten flesh. This area is pretty flat. I dig it. This mob farm is unique for a couple of reasons. Obviously the use of scaffolding instead of slabs is pretty interesting. Mobs can spawn on scaffolding but won't pathfind on it, which means they won't fight the flow of water that's pushing them off. The flushing mechanism is similar to other farms with an observer and dispenser tower activating each other all the way up. This bottom one just observes the scav stack that we will then update with a clock from below. The clock for the flushing mob farm is normally at the top of the farm, but this one's at the bottom, which allows me to add more layers onto the farm later without moving the clock when I want to do that. It's also super easy to build a diamond shape with scaffolding because it simply won't let you build in places you aren't meant to. The pieces will fall to the ground below. You can just watch the extra pieces simply drop off. This farm basically builds itself. And then with just one more piece of scaffolding on the middle, I can repeat the entire process of observer, dispenser, and platform with the extra pieces falling off as they did before. Before today, I've never built this farm, but I can honestly say I would build it in every world I had from now on. It's easy, fast, fun to make, and the rates are incredible when it's full size. But I won't make it in every world because Minecraft patched it out, at least in the first snapshot for 1.20. I'm out of scaffolding, so it's time to build a roof for this farm. For now, these are just some slabs covering the top platform and extending a few blocks past the farm to provide a little bit of darkness. When I do a proper roof later, it'll be much larger and create total darkness within the farm. Now I need to test that I didn't mess anything up by manually flipping this trapdoor. Uh-oh. I miss scaffolding blocks. Welcome to Niagara Falls, America's oldest state park. Here you can experience a natural wonder of the world and the largest waterfall in North America by width. Crap. Found it. I don't have enough scaffolding, so we'll add one piece of scaff there, and then a piece of stone on the end like that. All right, let's test it again. No Niagara Falls, that's good. The clock for this farm is as easy as it gets. Basically, it'll open that trap door every so often, which will change the state of the scaffolding blocks below it. Those scaffolding blocks will then send a signal up to that first observer, sending a pulse to the dispenser, which will dispense water, and send the signal to the scaffolding above, which continues the cycle all the way up the tower. I'm going to skip the building of the collection system because it was the worst part. I didn't enjoy it, and it doesn't collect 100% of the drops. I already want to find a way to change it out. Let's jump to the part where I build up to an AFK spot, Put some slabs below me and another one over me, and now I can run the farm when I want. Before I do that, let's start to make some TNT and see how far I can get with what I have. I've collected sand today and from the area near the sheep farm when we flattened that. I have gunpowder from the original mob farm. A shulkerful means we're after 1728 TNT. That's a lot of gunpowder. Using this whole shulker isn't even going to get us close. I have some stores of gunpowder up in the ladder in the attic. Almost another double chest up there. After crafting everything I can currently, I have about six and a half stacks of TNT. Eh, it's a start. Back up at the mob farm, I still have a lot of gunpowder too, so let's clear that out. Each of these chests will have between 10 and 15 stacks at the moment. Surely this will get us a lot closer. With this much gunpowder, I'll need a lot more sand though. If I had completed all advancements, I'd just go make a sand duper, but I haven't, so we're gonna dig some more.
Then this wandering trader found me and he had small drip leaf. Never pass up small drip leaf, it's too rare. Then I crafted some more TNT and I now have 12 stacks. We're definitely getting closer. After grabbing the rest of the gunpowder from this farm, it was time to AFK the new mob farm. You can see now I've expanded it and given it a more permanent roof so I could increase the rates. Mobs are now pouring out of this farm, so I don't think gunpowder is going to be a problem for much longer. I'd like to add an item filter to the storage below, but not today. I've now crafted up all that gunpowder into this full shulker of TNT, and we can head to the nether. This is where the fun begins. I often find the hardest part of getting netherite is safely getting down to Y15 without running into lava lakes that make you turn over and over. This world was unfortunately no exception. As I dug my staircase down though, I did manage to find this ancient debris here, and this was my first in the world. I also found this second piece in the wall, grabbed that, and kept going. And I find this to be the non-glamorous part that YouTube never shows you. You're going to occasionally run into a lava lake. Then you're going to go backwards, turn, and run into another lava lake. Eventually I did manage to find a path down to Y15 where the highest concentration of netherite is. To be honest, when mining with this much TNT, I would have used Y18, but I really didn't want to have to explain why in the video. For those who know, just know that I know, you know? Okay, I'm going to start small, I'm going to dig a tunnel too high, and I'm going to lay some TNT down at regular intervals, blow it up, and get some of the netherite that I need. As much as I want to lay it out all at the same time, blow it up all at once, it's super inefficient, and I may not even get all the netherite I need for my gear that way. So let's take care of my gear, and then we'll blow the rest up in a couple of big explosions, okay? All of the TNT that I do lay down can be set off by lava, skeletons, gas, or me missing a shot with my bow. A little bit of fire spread, one tick of fire, the TNT gets ignited, and the whole chain can go up with me still placing the- Ow! Ow, stop it! Oh great, there are hoglins spawning out here, fantastic! Anyway, let's make some boom boom. This first tunnel was really bad. I found a lot of XP, a little bit of blackstone and quartz, but zero ancient debris. That's fine. We didn't come down here with one stack of TNT. Let's go again. Okay, so the new plan is dig a tunnel, lay some TNT, check for hoglins, lay some more TNT, and after a little boom boom this time, I was a lot luckier. We got some ancient debris. That's two, and this makes three, four, five, and six more pieces. Along with the debris we found in the staircase on the way down, we now have eight, and that's getting us somewhere. Let's lay some more TNT. We still need a lot of ancient debris, so we're going to dig tunnels, lay TNT, and explode it over and over. Let's quickly collect all that now. Why do I always forget this? I'm wearing gold and for some reason that makes me feel invincible when it comes to piglins. But then I'll just, you know, casually open a shulker and then... Ow. Ow. He wants to go to war. It's not that I can't kill one piglin. It's the sudden bashing of me that scares the heck out of me. Ah, uh, yeah, I've used a whopping two stacks of TNT so far with all the explosions you've seen. I have 26 ancient debris already, which is really good. It means my gear is coming along quite nicely. I grabbed a few more in that tunnel, but saw my pickaxe was getting a bit low and came back to repair and upgrade. There's no point wearing down a diamond pick when I have plenty of netherite for it now. Once those scrap come out, I'm going to need this gold. I don't have the most gold ever. I think I can get through the episode, but we'll see. Depends on how lucky I am, I suppose. Okay, let's get this gear repaired really quickly. This should be pretty easy. If I do have to start a new hardcore world, this will be one of the first farms I do. I'm back and we're going to need to put down a smithing table, so this should do right here. The debris is cooked into scrap. Let's grab that. I also cooked a little bit of gold as well. I do need more, I think. I can make seven netherite ingots, so let's make all of those. That's a pretty good start. What would you put your first seven netherite ingots on? Well, more importantly, what are the first one or two things? I usually use my pickaxe every time. The silk touch pick is my main pick in the world. That's a tool I burn through the quickest and one I use every day to mine almost anything that's in my way. So I'll always start there. After that will always be a shovel for me. For all the sand I need and the terraforming, that's definitely the next best pick. Usually then I'll go to armor. In this case, I'm gonna do everything except for the chest plate because I use elytra most of the time. Obviously do a sword. Look at me, check me out. How am I looking? And I could do the axe, but I'm going to do the fortune pick. The pick is more useful when we head back to the nether and dig tunnels. Oh look, we're back in the nether about to dig tunnels. What a segue. Alright, let's use up a little bit more of this TNT. I'm less concerned with the spacing now. We're going to keep laying TNT. And, uh, what? Uh-oh. 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 Run. 
Run, this is what I was talking about earlier, run. That's what I was talking about with the TNT setting itself off. That can happen sometimes. I'm gonna take a little safety measure and block this side off here while I do the rest of this. I've laid two tunnels at the moment, so I'm gonna set this one off and it will actually ignite the other side as well. All right, it looks like it's all going. All might have been a bad choice of words. Once we reignited it, it actually did clear out the rest of the two wide tunnel. That's actually pretty cool. I like that. That's quite a lot of uh, ancient debris to go find. What do you say we start cranking up the amount of TNT we stuff into these tunnels? I'm guessing that at this point, like me, you want to see a much bigger explosion. Cool. I'll dig this tunnel out. You push like and subscribe. And in two seconds, we'll set off something that's really big. Okay. It may take me more than two seconds to lay all this TNT out. We're going to go seven wide, quite a few deep. This isn't our grand finale, but it's getting close. Let's see what kind of a mess we can make with this. I'm going to stand back here, shoot and run back a little bit. Put some blocks at my feet so I really don't blow up. I don't think it'll come this far back, but we'll check it out in a second. In total from this giant hole, I collected 11 debris. But let's be honest, that explosion had nothing to do with how much I could collect and how big of a boom we could make. I mined a few pieces for an even 32, then came back to the surface to cook that up. A full 32 will give us eight more netherite. That's pretty great. After a bit of playing around, we have about five more stacks of TNT. We're gonna set that all off at once once we go back down to the nether. First, let's get these netherite related advancements. That's gonna be serious dedication with the hoe right there. Then when I do chest plate, we'll get cover me in debris. Obviously, I'm going to want my axe now. And then all of my tools and armor are netherite. We need to repair it all. This is again easy. I really love having this farm. Now it's time for the last netherite advancement. I need to make a lodestone. A lot of people would never have even used one of these. But basically, you can right click a compass onto it to make the compass always point back to the lodestone. This is useful in hardcore because I don't use a map. And even though my base is pretty close to zero, zero, I can put the lodestone anywhere I like in the world and use it to return to that point without coordinates. For now, I'm just going to stick it below my door, right click the compass, and there's the country load advancement. Full netherite was the goal and we're obviously there now, so I decided to head out to the nether and do a few other advancements. I want to get them all done, remember? One of the first thing I said in this world is I can't dupe TNT or falling blocks until I complete all the advancements. It's a bit of a gate and I want to get it done before the thousand day vote if I can. How did that one go through the ghast? Anyway, next one was return to sender. Oh well, the next advancement should be pretty easy. We're gonna fly about a thousand blocks on the roof, put a portal there, light it up and go through. This should be subspace bubble. And it is. Of course I'm in a cave. Of course I am. All right, it's grand finale time. I'm gonna dig a two by two tunnel here and I can't dig anything at the moment without finding netherite, that's fine. As I was saying, we're gonna dig a two by two tunnel here and then we're gonna fill it with the rest of our Seriously? Okay, big two by two tunnel done and we're gonna fill it with TNT. You can see that when I get this done, all of my inventory will be empty. There'll be no TNT from that shulker left. This is gonna be the end of 27 stacks of TNT. Let's light that and run back here. This is what it looks like from up close. Replay mod can give us a view we normally can't see without dying. Well, that was a fun one. Let's go check it out. Holy, I see so much debris already. I'll save you the collection. We went home with 26 more ancient debris. I'll cook that up, and through the magic of television, I can show you the results. I now have everything geared up, plus four ingots, plus the scrap for another seven ingots. I don't have the gold, so I'll definitely need to collect some more of that, but that's for another episode. Today, I'm going to build my 50 furnace lava super smelter, terraform the mega base island, and lay out where my castle, auto sorter, and other main buildings will go. Let's grab all the lava from this dripstone farm and head over now. As we fly over this island, let's imagine we're flying in from the main bridge. 
This bridge will be raised above the lower city and lead directly into the front gate of my castle. As we fly in, you'll be able to see where the castle will be and how it'll open up with the castle inside these two rivers. And the end of the bridge here will run straight into the castle. I'm going to need to tear this beacon down and move it because I want to do a lot of terraforming today. All of the outer areas should be at one consistent Y level, something like Y70, and then the inner area can be lowered in the future down to about Y45. The terrain's pretty rough at the moment, so we'll have to do a bit of work to level it. I'll set the beacon up back maybe around here. It'll be at Y81, so we can easily work below it as we get going. I really wish we had about 10 more beacons to cover the island and not have to move these all the time, but that's for a different time. Over at the wool farm, I'm going to grab red for the outer castle walls, orange to outline the castle itself, green for the auto storage room, and teal for the few aesthetic buildings that will sit alongside the castle. I don't think we'll need a whole lot more than that, but if we do, this wool farm will definitely make it easy. So this red will represent the outer castle walls. Even though a large stone wall will protect the island itself, I want a secondary castle wall with a few towers around to give a good vantage point from home. I'm going to maximize my space inside the castle, so this will stretch almost from one river to the other, and from the inner city all the way to the back wall. As we fly up to take a better look, you can see the outline for our main castle area. This is going to be pretty huge. The orange is going to represent the main castle body. The castle itself will extend beyond this, but there are main rooms, halls, and a storage area. It's also going to be the entryway, the guards, and an armory. I'll also have a throne room and a main hall in the middle, with the throne hiding the storage entryway. I struggled with the size of this castle. You can see the many attempts I made before settling on the size we're going to go with. First one was too small. Second one was too large. This one was a little bit too thick. Finally, I got to this size here, and I kind of like that, so I'll just fix that up. Then we can move to the back storage. The storage is going to be represented by the green lines. I had to move that a little bit once I readjusted the wall. I didn't really love where it was. As I finish up this corner, we can go take a look. Yeah, it's looking almost perfect. I just need to connect those side wings to the main castle now. And done. Now you have a pretty good idea what my mega base floor plan will be. Just behind the beacon will be my throne. The area in front of it is the main hall. Behind the throne room will have the storage, and in front the armory, guards, and the rest. The yellow is the long raised bridge, and the blue are the two rivers on either side. Finally, for the inside of the castle walls, I have these two large open spaces. I want to fill them with mirrored cathedral-style buildings. They'll just be aesthetic builds for now, and we'll have other builds inside them and under them later. Those will sit here, next to the front entrance. Now it's time to start digging out a room for the super smelter. I want this to be underground because it's not a great looking build on its own, but I also want it near my main base and accessible anytime I need it. I also want the lava filling up when I'm at home and working around the castle. I'm not sure what Y level the entire island will sit at yet, so for now I'm just going to dig a staircase down and see if I can place it down into this sunken area near my front door. I'm going to start by making this space 20 by 20, but I know I'll need to adjust it as I go. The smelter itself is also about 8 high from bottom to top, but I want to submerge it into the floor and be able to stand on it, so We'll start off making the room 10 high, and again just adjust as we go. You can see the placement of the smelter from this angle. It's not going directly under any one building, just more underground. While doing this dig, a thunderstorm started, so with my new channeling trident, I went to get a couple of advancements. I flew to a nearby village and was there just in time to prove that you don't actually need a lightning rod to get the surge protector advancement. This is kind of like a great view from up here. There are ways to just sort of get this. That's one of them. I wanted to get very, very frightening, but the storm stopped pretty quickly. I ended up doing some repairs before heading back to the island, and this will be a theme for the episode. I should probably make it nicer here, I'm gonna be here a lot. Okay, well I'm back now with this area at least started and planned, I can begin the terraforming. We're gonna do a lot of work to make this island usable, so let's get into it.
Well, that was almost two hours of work, but what a massive change to the castle area. It's no longer nearly as lumpy or bumpy. The next thing to do is finish lowering this wool. You may have missed it during the time lapse, but I started lowering the wool wireframes into the ground at Y70, which will be our chosen Y level. Now I need to finish doing that to the green, red, blue, and eventually the pink wool guides. I couldn't really do this before because I wasn't sure where to go with them. But now that I know that, let's do a bit more digging, some more repairing, some more lowering the guides in, and then back to more digging. And ooh, a thunderstorm. Let's go get this advancement now. Hi, how you doing? Oh, that was easy. Back we go. When doing hours and hours of terraforming like this, it's great to have little distractions like that. But I really want to get this done today, so let's keep going. If I ever do another project this size, remind me to get multiple netherite shovels and pickaxes, okay? Moving the pink and blue wool down is next, and this will definitely take the longest time today, simply because I have to count out the pink. The blue is easy enough, and you can see I can get that done pretty quickly, but the pink is tricky. Here's a better look at the pink first section done and all the blue lowered in. It's looking good. With the final Y level now chosen and much of the terraforming looking good, it's time to work on the smelter room. We'll start by lowering it a few blocks. The roof I put on makes it no longer 10 high. I've spent so much time with this Enderman farm repairing my tools today. My outline for the series says we do an advancement push and then a hoglin farm to secure a permanent food source, but I may prioritize an XP guardian farm so we don't have to leave the mushroom island in order to repair our tools. I'm thinking about all the digging I need to do for the lower city area, and ENX04's XP guardian farm is sounding way too nice right now. Well, for now it's back to the mission, lower the paint, strip some of these higher platforms back, and of course terraforming. Did I mention that this single episode took more than 20 hours to film? It'd be very much appreciated if you'd give it a like and maybe even a comment. I reply to every comment I get and will until it becomes completely impossible. So if you say hi, I'll say hi. Oh look, it's the Enderman farm. I almost forgot what this place looked like. And I'm not making frivolous trips here, look at my shovel. What is that I smell? A guardian farm in our future? Terraforming all night. Terraforming all day. I hope you hit that like button, that's all I'm gonna say. I need another break. Let's go smash some copper ore. This will be one of the things we smelt when the smelter's completed and we need to test it. I'm also going to sidetrack and round up some of the mushroom cows. I want to clear off the island, but I don't want to delete all the native cows, and then I don't want them to fall into ravines and go extinct. I'll keep a small group and then make sure the island is clear. Pretty easy to round up quite a few and then secure them. Some of that group safe, well, the rest of you aren't safe. Enough messing about. Let's build the super smelter. The reason I'm building my smelter is not because it's the fastest, but because it will never require more fuel. Once I power this up, I can smelt forever, and it doubles as a lava farm, so building things like my hoglin farm later will actually be way easier. It does have 50 furnaces, and while they are our faster arrays, there aren't many mid-game smelters that are going to be more powerful overall. If you want to see a detailed build for this, I'll link my block-by-block -block tutorial in the description, and hopefully in a card above if I remembered. Alright, let's get to building.
That's a lot of progress, but I need to sidetrack. This time I don't want to, but I need to. As you may remember from the previous episode, I have no gold and no powered rails. I didn't even have enough gold to finish the netherite ingots, and I haven't found any since. We're going to need to collect a lot for powered rails, but at least this time it should be easy to collect. I've exposed quite a bit of nether in the netherite tunnels with that shulker of TNT, but now we can just go back and collect the easy resources. I really didn't do this as I exploded each tunnel, so there should be plenty here. Let's do this quickly and head back. That was super easy, barely an inconvenience. Two stacks in just a few minutes. Let's cook it up, make some powered rails, and head back to the farm. And just like that, I have a working super smelter. Let's check out the progress for this episode. We've done a massive amount of terraforming, all of the castle area, as well as some of the pink inner city. This is what it looked like at the start. And this is how my island is looking now. Inside, I now need to fill the smelter with lava buckets. I could go grab a couple of shulkers of lava from the nether, but honestly, this is a lava farm. I just need to run it for a little bit. And now that I have, it's full and we can test it. I'm gonna drop nine stacks of sand in here. When the hopper fills the cart and then fills to plus 24 sand in the hopper, it'll send the cart off, it'll distribute the sand to all the furnaces, and we can see what that looks like right now. Let's check out the furnaces and see how it's working. Okay, the left side and the front both seem to be okay. The back also seems to have completely filled, and the front right is, yeah, great. The whole thing works. You can see glass is already pouring in. While that happens, I'm going to move the rest of the buckets to the hopper system. You can already see glass coming in. I'm just going to keep running the farm while we're here waiting for things to smelt. The glass is nearly already done, so let's go load up the copper. I'm going to load up the minecart itself to speed this up and then drop the rest into the double chest. We'll finish loading it up and this is going to be a lot of copper. This will be a great full size test as I put the rest of this copper in here. I'm going to use about 36 stacks of copper, maybe a little bit more than that. Check this out. Before I even finished loading the copper, we're already getting some back. That's really great. While the rest of the copper cooks, I'll just grab a bit more lava. The thing is, the first item you smelt starts using up your bucket. That's gonna make 50 buckets you need to fill again. If you smelt under 75 stacks of items, you only need 50 to refill the entire smelter. We have so much copper already. This is gonna come in at about three times speed now. Let's see how this looks. That's so much copper so fast. I have K'd for another few minutes, and here we go, the copper is all smelted up. I actually chose copper for a reason too, we may use it for the roofs of some of the buildings in the mega base area, so I'm going to lay it all out, let it start aging, and over time I'll have more than I need. Welcome back, no time for an intro today, lots to do, advancements plus a whole guardian farm all in one episode, 3, 2, 1, let's go! We're going to start with the respawn anchor, let's take that to the nether, charge it up with some glowstone, there's our first advancement, not quite 9 lives. While we're in the nether, let's speed run some of this and go distract this guy. Ooh, shiny. That's number two. Next up is one of my least favorite challenges, Bullseye. I'm going to set up the redstone for this because the bloom in Minecraft means that you never hit exactly where you've aimed. I'm not going to move the mouse once I feel like I'm on target, but you'll see how far widespread my arrows go. While I fire a couple of hundred arrows off, let me tell you about today. I'm attempting to complete at least 25 advancements in less than 50 Minecraft days, and we already have quite a few of the easy ones done, so there's a lot of harder ones to go. One of my rules for this world is I can't use TNT duping or gravity dupers, free cam mods, or anything like that until I've beaten all advancements. And I'm no Feinberg. This is going to take me a lot longer than three hours. I'm not moving the mouse here even a little bit. 
This is a super frustrating challenge to me because it's completely 100% luck based if you don't cheese it. You can get close all day, but a direct bullseye is so random and it's not fun to do this. Yep, I've had about enough of this one. Okay, if you remember great view from up here, the shulker advancement, I threw a pearl down to get the advancement for floating up. I'm not against making this easy. I wanted to try it, I tried it, now we move on. I'm gonna make and carry a jukebox with me so we're ready when we find a meadow. I'll also try and overlap a lot of other challenges like that. We need to fly around a lot for things like complete catalog, so we'll do a bit of task overlap at the same time. Like these weakness potions can brew while I fly into the ocean just near my base and go find a geode. This exposed geode's obviously the easiest way to find the amethyst shards for a spyglass, and I'll need a couple of those. Then I can easily flap to the mob farm, craft up my spyglass, and continue on to the small jungle near the wool farm. I just need to find a parrot. I see you. Now I really see you. We'll need the spyglass for two more advancements later on, but for now we're moving on. Meadows are generally these flat plains looking areas on top of higher land like this. Let's throw a disc in here and vibe to the sound of music. It's not my favorite disc, but it's the only one I had. It'll do. Oh yeah, we have so many bee advancements to do. I think I'll set up a little ad hoc bee farm today. We need some flowers to lure them around with. We'll also need to breed them because we need to breed everything. All right, get in there. That's two, that's three. Total bee location. While I'm out and in the forest, let me grab a few more nests. We need eight total. This area here was actually wild. Look at all these nests. There's one there, another one over there. Let's grab those two quickly. Then they're around this corner. There's three and four right here, all in this one little area, and another one behind that. Home quickly, and we got the eight we need, so we can move on from the bees for now. Speaking of being home, my potions are finished brewing, so I suppose we can lure some zombies into my villager hall. Drag them back this way. I'm gonna let them jump in one of the boats here with the villagers. Zombies aren't exactly known for being fast. Come on, guys. Now that they've infected my villagers, I won't be needing you, and I won't be needing you. Splish splash. Have an apple. Splish splash. Ow. Okay. Why is this boat rowing itself? What is going on? It just keeps going? Okay, you saw nothing. Oh well, we wait a few minutes and zombie doctor is done. The second guy just keeps rowing, just keeps rowing, just keeps... Once he was converted, I was able to jump in and make the rowing stop though. Take that, Dory. Time for a super scuffed bee farm to get a few more advancements. We'll convert this to ENX-04's bee farm in a few minutes, but right now I just need access to the nests. By completing 25 advancements today, we won't finish them all, but we'll definitely put the world in a position to do that soon. There's 102 advancements in 119, and I started this episode on 63 out of 102 completed. What won't we do today? I'm definitely not doing Furious Cocktail, or how did we get here? I need a raid to do Monsters Hunted, so we won't finish that either. 2x2, two two, the breeding advancement, that takes a lot of time, so we'll do that later. And I have a plan for Post-Mortal, but I'd like to do it last if I can stay alive without a totem until I've done everything else. Once we complete all advancements, I'll swap from shield to totem, just to make sure I don't do something stupid that loses the world, but I think a thousand days of proving I can stay alive totemless is fine for now. I need Mr. Miyagi's help for this next one. Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. Thank you for that. These hives have filled up quickly now, so we can get Be Our Guest and take some bottles. And with those, we'll make a honey block, stick that here, and slide down it for sticky situation. So many bee advancements done, that feels good. Now I'm gonna make a proper little honey farm. This is just a quick job, probably only takes about five to 10 minutes of real time. I'll make a much larger version of this later with proper storage and filters and such, but for now, this is easy enough. Small little farm will do 80% of what I need with about 5% of the work. I like that math.
Okay, the next advancement I want to get is a newer one and kind of interesting. I've seen people do this in a lot of ways, like flying machines and all that, but I'm going to make a simple water elevator to the top of the world. I'm going to go back down, bone meal this kelp until it grows all the way up. It takes a lot of bone meal to grow from Y80 to Y320. Let's actually speed this up. It's a fun trip to the top of the world. Get in there. Get in there. Get in there. I guess I should follow him. For us, this will be advancement number 12, Star Trader. Once we're done, I'll just fly off this platform. For the villager, though, it's a one-way trip. This is, sadly, the last trade you'll ever complete. I'm going to leave him alive up here, though. I built him a little chamber, put a torch in it. He can be our own little star in the world to remind us of how we got this advancement. I saw an opportunity to get two birds, so I bonked these guys once each, but when I hit them again there, they didn't die. They weren't low enough, so I missed that chance. Oh well, we'll revisit it later. For now, I need to fly around the world and look for new villages that have cats so I can tame them for my complete catalog. After flying out one way, I came home to recharge my elytra, grab some more rockets. I decided to knock out another easy advancement along the way. I'd just give this LA a birthday cake, and then go drop another over here by this note block. He'll grab it and throw it back to me. That's happy birthday. Well done, little blue guy. Alright, let's head back out. My world file definitely got larger in this episode. I was flying thousands of blocks in each direction looking for villages, easy challenges to knock off, gold blocks on portals. Oh look. A natural rare pink sheep. That's cool. I also have coordinates to what I think is a deep dark with an ancient city. This is what I didn't show you in a previous episode, so we can fly over there now to get adventuring time. The area is gorgeous, and I believe the deep dark is the last biome we need for the massive advent. I'm sorry, what? How was deep frozen ocean the last biome I needed? When did I possibly get deep dark? I reviewed a lot of footage to find it and show you. I'm pretty sure one of those silly little caves that I dropped into and then immediately rocketed back out of must have been a deep dark. So we possibly have a city much closer than I imagined. That's a little scary. This is what I wanted to show you. How amazing is this snowy peaks valley next to an ice spikes? I'm fairly sure there's an ancient city below this, but now that I don't need to venture down there, we can do that another time and focus on it more then. Look how incredible it is. All that flying has made me pretty hungry. It's time to eat every food in Minecraft, which does also mean taking some damage to get hungry. Ow. Rotten flesh, mm, my favorite. I try and eat all the poisonous, bad foods first. That automatically makes you hungrier, so you can stuff a lot more down. I still need to find the beetroot seeds, but with plenty of villages now mapped out and located, that's going to be pretty easy. Ow, stop, ow. I'm going to go sit in here and be safe. Well, I guess we know what my lowest health for the series was. Half a heart. Okay, a balanced diet always comes down to the enchanted golden apple. And before you yell at me, just know one thing. I'm gonna do it anyway. So for absolutely no reason except getting the advancement, let's delete our first god apple from the game. Told you I'd do it. No regrets. 15 advancements done. The next thing I need to focus on is frogs. There are quite a few advancements around frogs, including breeding them as part of 2x2. Two two. We need to get some slime. Slime and frogs are both here in the swamp, so this becomes kind of easy. Now I'll just let them lay their frog spawn. I'll just have to wait, and then I can collect the tadpoles. I did a bit of tree clearing while I waited, but eventually one breeding hatched, and then bucket bucket. And I did collect all of these guys because I need them to grow up in different biomes to get the different colored frogs. I got quite a few for just two frog spawn patches. They spawn in groups of two to five, and I think I got all ten. I also remembered to tame the black cat while I was in the swamp. I flew home and out toward the wool farm to set up for a hidden advancement. I'm going to use the plains animals to get our ballistic. All I need to do is create a little one by one chamber. Then I can use a lead to drag them into the hole. You need five mobs, so I'll use sheep, cow, chicken, and pig. But that's four, you say. Right. I also have a really easy fifth mob, a snowman. I can place him wherever I... Oh, no. Wait, wait. Oh. I deserve this pain. 
I placed my setup about eight blocks into the savanna. The snowman melted instantly. I'm so S-M-O-R-T smart sometimes. Okay, let's move you to the plains. We were so close to this. All right, so if you don't know, the poison will get everybody down to half a heart. That way I don't need to worry about how much damage they've taken. Then I just line up the shot and... Arbalistic done just like that. This area with both the plains and savanna did give me an idea though. I need to grow up three types of frog, including a temperate, which is the moderate climate, and a hot, like a savanna climate. With these two areas super close together like this, I can just watch them both grow up at the same time. Then all I have to do is just wait, put them on a lead, on a lead, put them into a boat, boat, and then I can take them home. Grow up. There we go. Lead. Boat. I had a Loki in a boat song. I had an Alay in a boat song. I don't know if I have a frog in a boat song. If I did, it'd probably be something like froggy in a boat next to a portal. Please don't die. I hope you are immortal. Getting the cold biome frog home would have been a problem because most of the terrain around my base is garbage. However, you can grow a tadpole up in the end and it counts as the cold climate frog. I mined obsidian pillars for the 20 minutes while I waited. However, knowing it was going to take 20 plus minutes, I turned the recording off with the intention of turning it back on as soon as this froggy grew up. Unfortunately, I mined a bit longer than 20 minutes, forgot, and now I don't have a recording for when the squad hops in. This is the cold weather frog back at spawn, though. The idea of using the end worked because my spawn is just behind where I actually need him. And now with just a little bit of wrangling, I can get him into this boat here. And as you can see, I haven't even left the game. I just didn't record. That unfortunately won't be the last time. What's next for these three frogs? Well, let's take them to the nether and then get them into a basalt delta. This should do. And I'm just going to make a little spawning platform. And what I'll do is fly around a little bit to get some magma cubes to spawn. This only took a couple of flybys. And there we have one right there. All I have to do is break this guy down and whack. Once I break them down, I can just let all the frogs loose like this. And then I'll just go behind them and clean up. And that'll be our next advancement with our powers combined. And now we have all three frog lights. Again, I need to stay in the nether to work on the next advancement. I need to dig a very long tunnel as my nether spawn just isn't all that great despite being literally in a fortress. There's no way out of it. I had to rip through hundreds and hundreds of blocks just to break out here. Oh well, at least this is safe. And I just heard a ghast. Ah, is it a balloon? No, but it's 20 advancements done. By killing that ghast, I got my fourth tier that I needed. I'll take these pumpkins out, put them somewhere safe while we respawn the dragon. This is my first time respawning her in this world, so we'll get two advancements at the same time here. That's not loud at all. You know what else is kind of loud? Getting two advancements at once. Let me quickly just take our friend out. I have wings now, so this fight isn't much of a challenge. I didn't do anything crazy, I just killed her quickly. You don't get an advancement for looking at the dying dragon through a spyglass, but it sure was nice to see. You know that whole forgetting to record thing that I did earlier? I really need to stop doing that. I went to find my axolotl and I couldn't find the coordinates to that beautiful desert lush cave that we'd found earlier. So I flew and flew and flew. I decided I'd record when I found it. Then I found it, caught it, took it home, fought a zombie with it. On the way home, found the cat, tamed it. I was super happy. Then I remembered to record again. This is footage of me being distracted and forgetting. <sighs> well, at least you can see the advancements. Again, still haven't left the game, still haven't changed anything, just forgot to record. It happens. And let me introduce you to our new friend. This is Axostotl. He's the wisest of all axolotls. So yeah, that was 23, 24, and 25 done. There it is right there. Cutest predator, healing power of friendship, and of course, a complete catalog. I told you we'd come back to two birds. It's a fairly significant advancement, a difficult one to get done. After you didn't get to see the 25th, I figured I owe you at least one extra one. People have asked me why I use the mob farm for this. It's simple. I'm now in a spawn-proof, flat, open area. Phantoms can spawn above me, but they can't knock me off. They can't really hurt me all that much, and nothing else can even remotely get to me. It's actually the perfect spot. These two spawned in as I flew into the farm. It's not ideal, let's drag them back. I just need to give each one a good whack. Let's see, that's a good whack. That's perfect. Oh, please don't die. Please don't die. Please don't die. Oh, I forgot about fire. Please don't die. Oh, that was too good. Okay, he didn't die. He didn't die. Oh, this is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Here we go. I need to line him up. And...
What do you mean? That was easy. Let's go build a farm. Unlike a lot of ENXO4's farms that I've built, tested, and I know how to do, this Guardian XP farm is new to me. Last episode I made, I don't even know, like 20 trips to the end to repair my tools. I was so over it and I used every tool right to the last bit of durability before repairing because it was annoying. This monument is about one rocket away from my mega base. It's far enough that we won't see it, close enough that it's a lot, lot better than going to the Enderman farm every 30 minutes. This is the quickest way to find all three Elder Guardians, by the way. Just use TNT, sand on top, light it, and then get the heck out of there. Just do the top and then the two wings. And if you use your elytra to fly into the water, you can use it to fly right back out. Just don't touch the ground while you're underwater. Now I can just use my OP trident to take these three Elder Guardians out and get the build started. The first Elder Guardian actually escaped from the top room, but what's he going to do to me? He can't do anything to me. I have an OP trident. The two that are in the wings, I do recommend water breathing potions, so I went back to get a few. These other two are in the wings, but where will depend. They do move around quite a bit. Let's see if we can go find this first one. We'll go in here. So we're right, and that was easy. He's right here. Actually, this room I'm in is a little bit full, so I might swim past him and then attack him from behind. The good thing about using TNT to get in here, I don't even care about mining fatigue. I'm not mining. I don't care. I have easy ways out. On to the last one. Again, by poking the hole here in the top of this wing, he was super easy to find. Just swim in here, look around a little, and he's right there. They move around a little in these wings, but generally they're in those three places. The top, the two wings, easy enough. Tridents are very effective against both Guardians and Elder Guardians. Highly recommended for finishing these fights quickly and easily. Impaling five and loyalty, definitely recommend. With that done, let's have a nice cold bucket of milk. Then we can place our first lily pad marker above the corner of the farm and get to building. That was actually surprisingly quick to build. Now I'm on level 47. That's going to be important. A quick swing here yields quite a bit of XP, and the farms are not even fully running yet. I turned to organize my inventory when the noise behind me became overwhelming. Oh my god! Excuse me? Alright, let's take this group out and see what we get. Okay, that's a lot of XP. It's still coming in. Okay, so every 15 seconds, the gates in the farm open on the nether side, and it releases a massive wave of guardians that looks something like this. That is so many. Using this farm is very satisfying. Holy. And the loot is amazing too, because we get to use our looting three sword. This will never not be an impressive view. I'm already up to level 53. 55, 57, 59. Let's smack some guardians around. This farm is broken. 
<laughs> in just a few minutes, like literally a few minutes of running the farm. I'm gonna pass level 100 when all of this XP comes in. I have more than two double chests of loot total, and it hasn't even been a single Minecraft day. I think I spent seven minutes doing this. Now we're on level 100. Well, we solved our XP in the overworld problem. Every 15 seconds, I get more XP than anyone ever needs. You're seeing this, right? It's satisfying to watch them fall in, even more so to kill them and stop all their noises. We're starting today with 120 levels. While I tell you about today's plan, I'm going to repair my bow and make two other perfect bows to go with it. There isn't a lot to do with 100 plus levels in Minecraft, but making spare bows never hurts. I'm starting to run low on shulker shells and I want to build a farm for those soon, but I need more gateways open and a big end raid would also be kind of fun. So while I want to work on the mega base, today we're going to sidetrack into opening all 20 gateway portals. That's going to require a lot of gas tiers, so today's plan is to build three farms above the nether roof. Number one, a small version of my hogland farm so I can stop wasting emeralds on golden carrots. Number two, a magma cream farm so we can get magma blocks. For number three, a ghast farm. Building three farms in one episode would be quite enough progress, but then we're going to finish it off with 18 dragon fights. And just like that, we have 120 levels gone. I can get out of here. First of all, these are our new perfect bows. Let's put those away quickly. Obviously, if I have zero levels, the only place I want to go is the new guardian farm that we built last episode. Let's let it load up fully. Having this farm so close to our megabase is going to be so nice long term. This is the first time I've been at level zero with the new farm built. So let's see how this goes from scratch. All right, let's do it. I can't believe how fast you go from zero to 10. It obviously gets harder with each level you go up, so it does slow down by 30. But if you've never seen this, this is a zero to level 30 in 27 seconds speed run. We get so much great loot from this farm and it's really fun to use. It's definitely a cool project. I'm glad we did it. We're almost there. We've already got new guardians in the farm. I think one more swing will feel right, but let's get to level 30 first. There it is, 27 seconds. We'll take these guys out one more time. Okay, let's move on to the Hogland farm. I'm going to need some of this lava for it. I'm not planning on making the largest possible, most OP version of this farm today. I just want an easy source of food so I can stop wasting emeralds. It may not seem like much, but I know I want a lot of quartz, and emeralds are already valuable to me for that. So changing our permanent long-term food source over to cooked pork chops now just makes the most sense. This is one of those times I really love having an easy lava farm, by the way. It would be risky and scary and so much harder if I had to go gather this from a lava lake in the nether. I've put together this shulker back at home that has most of the things that we need. I'm probably going to need a way to the AFK spot, so a couple of these will do here. Okay, I've chosen a build spot on the nether roof. It's all within a crimson forest, and I'm going to build the farm one chunk wide, and then later we can come back and triple its size and efficiency, but I need more powered rails, as I often do. Okay, I told you it was going to be a tiny version of my Hoglin farm. I want to show you how powerful such a small version of the farm can be. While I build the AFK platform, all of this is happening below me. I sat at the top of the farm for a little while, maybe 20 minutes. We're checking our results. There's plenty of food here to feed me for a good long while. I filled a whole shulker and there's more than 10 stacks left over after that. That's a decent start. So this full shulker is my new main food source. We'll put that away in the E chest. And then this shulker of golden carrots and cooked steak is a great backup, and we'll leave that here in the starter home just in case we need it. I'm starting to run out of space in this house, though. Okay, back up to the AFK platform. I'm going to get another couple chests of food put aside so I don't have to do this for a long time. I'll stay up here for like, I don't know, an hour or so while I plan out the magma farm. 
I'm not following a tutorial for that, so I just need to think about the mechanics. I thought about it. The most important thing I need and don't have any of is Powdered Snow. I'm going to use both Powdered Snow and Wither Roses to kill the Magma Cubes that we send to the Overworld. The bottom of the kill area will be an 11 by 11 area, so we're going to need quite a lot of Powdered Snow to cover it. Oh, there's some right there. If you don't know how to easily spot Powdered Snow, the shadows are lighter. It looks much whiter than a regular snow area, so it's definitely easy enough to see as you're flying around. I'm going to need a bunch of shulkers full. Eventually I should set up a Powdered Snow farm for things like this, but honestly it's not that hard to collect a bunch exactly when you need it. I could just do the same mechanism as the bottom of the lava farm though and make it pretty simple. We'll make a nice large farm much later if we survive that long, but for now this'll do. I really wish Powdered Snow could stack. Filling four shulkers is much more difficult than filling seven stacks of like 16. You know, like 16 stacks like the buckets that carry it? I don't know. While I collect buckets and buckets of this, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite farm in the world so far? Is it the OP Wool Farm? Or the insanely powerful Guardian Farm we built last time? Is it the Lava Smelter or something more simple like the Day 1 Iron Farm? We're on about day 700 in the world and I was taking stock of all the cool things we already have in the world. As well as all the farms, we have a few small builds, the mega build started, and so much progress on the future of this world. I've been really enjoying the balance, but I feel after today we should go back and do more builds and more mega build work in the coming episodes. What do you think? I've chosen a build site on the nether roof, and the farm needs to be in a basalt delta. Now I'm just finding the matching coordinates in the overworld, and this ends up being pretty close to our end portal. That's convenient to get here and back. I'm going to build a fairly large portal on the overworld side. I want magma to push each other out of the portal, but I don't want to cause suffocation or entity cramming. They need to die down below, not up here. It's time to get another resource, and yeah, this one isn't much fun to collect, but it's necessary. We'll grab as much as we need for now, and then we'll come back later for other things like the gas farm. That's going to do us. Let's head out. Back on the nether side, I can work on connecting the portals now. The magma cubes will spawn inside these portals, and they should be fairly wide. I want as much spawn space in the AFK spot below me as I possibly can. I have a fair amount of obsidian now, and I want to see how much is really needed before I go all out and take down multiple pillars in the end. With the first portal done, I can just start expanding that now. Unfortunately for both aesthetics and creativity, the best nether farms at the moment are almost always portal spam of some sort. Want a magma farm? Portal spam. Want a gas farm? We're going to do that later with portal spam. Mobs changing dimensions and removing themselves from the mob cap is just too overpowered not to use it. Okay, let me step out of character for a moment and tell you guys the truth. This farm isn't actually amazing until it's massive. The other magma farm design that I normally use is much easier to collect resources for, much better rates based on the time spent, and actually way more fun to build. I probably wouldn't build this version of the farm again unless it was for endgame or I was on an SMP and building a massive version. When we do a froglight farm, I'll definitely be using the other style of farm, unless I simply use this one here to convert to frogs. I'm not rebuilding something like this. Anywho, let's continue. With some of the portals now below me done, I'm going to build the AFK platform and get ready to build the kill chamber and collection area. And back to our wide overworld portal, we'll need to build a minecart collection area. Oh look, it's time to use more powered rails, because I have so many! Most of that is now done. I just need a bit more powdered snow to finish the whole thing off. I found this area here that has quite a lot. Let's get started on this. Hello goat. I'll collect more than a full shulker of this so we have plenty of leftovers. I only needed like 10 buckets, but let's be honest, I wasn't flying all that way to collect 10 buckets. 
Now we can simply finish this off. Shouldn't take us but a minute. There we go. Now I can close the kill chamber up and we'll be good. Let's head into the farm and jump back to the nether roof. That's not great. I was pushing forward there. I could have fallen into anything. So how am I going to get up to the roof there? I didn't light the portals, I guess. I'm glad I carry pearls. All that each chest organizing we did after the dragon fight really came in clutch here. Yep, I didn't light these portals yet. No wonder they didn't work. Let's not make that mistake again. Now I'll just sit up here AFK for a bit and see how much we get. Also, I'm going to need magma blocks for the gold farm eventually, too. Okay, so I'm back. I've been a little bit sick. For you guys, that was about three seconds. But I left the AFK spot at about 11 p.m. Felt kind of bad, so I laid down. I woke up, called in sick to work, and went back to sleep. I forgot that I was AFK and woke up about 10 a.m. I've now AFK'd here for nearly 12 hours. All right, let's make all this into magma blocks. I'm very disappointed in the output of this farm so far. I know I haven't made enough of the portals on the nether side and the spawn space is limited, but that was 11 hours of AFK. This just isn't that much. I was hoping when I remembered to come log off that I had enough for the magma farm and the gold farm, but I don't, even after all that. So this one was a bit of a bust. As I said before, we'll expand and get what we need, but I'd never build this version of the farm again. I know it seems like a lot of magma blocks as I make them, but in the grand scheme of things, it's okay, but not excellent. I don't like mediocre farms in my world, and to be honest, I considered TNTing this entire build and not even letting you guys see that I tried it, but... Oh well, we all make mistakes. I spent over 50 days on the farm in total. I kind of had to show you guys. That's it. We've completely emptied out the farm, except for these two right here. We can head out. So this is a great way to show you how much time has passed. Since I was last home and collected iron, we have more than a double chest of ingots. It actually made more than seven and a half stacks of iron blocks. That's a lot of iron for me. So this is our great haul from the magma farm. I have just under five shulkers of magma blocks, about 8,300 total blocks. The gas farm will take some, and the gold farm by itself requires just over 10,000. I guess I know what we have to do. That should be much better. We're done here for now. Let's go build a gas farm. This farm is a bit more straightforward to build. It's ENXO4's looting gas farm, and for this build, I'm definitely following a tutorial. Essentially, the way this farm works is we're going to build some spawn platforms. Gas will spawn on them and be instantly teleported to the overworld. They'll stay there for 15 seconds, then they'll be teleported back, but this time to the killing chamber. Then I swing my sword. That's easy. We're going to need 72 more gas tiers to kill 18 more dragons. And while you could collect tiers normally just flying around the nether, it would take actually a lot longer than just building the farm. And the farm comes with a few extra bonuses like extra gunpowder, renewable tiers for end crystals as decoration later, as well as tiers for regeneration potions and more. If you want to kill one dragon, flying around to kill a few gas is way easier. But for this many, we build a proper farm and make it much easier long term. This farm is also expandable, but I doubt we'll ever expand it. Ian claims it will do up to 7200 tiers per hour, but that's with a massive array of portals. We're not going to do anything nearly so complex. We'll head through and build the overworld side. Of course, it's nighttime. We'll just flick into bed and call it day. I just needed a safe place to land. Here we go. Great, so the first thing I need to do is break this portal that we came through. It's not where we need it to be. Here's something you should know about tutorials. If you're following one, pay attention to your surroundings. That could have been so much worse. Thankfully, the obsidian spared me from most of that blast, but a creeper just took three and a half hearts off me from four blocks away. Holy. All right, I hear skeleton noises. It's time to despawn this entire area now. Then we can build the farm.
That one's nice and easy, just like that. Onto the AFK platform, and this is what's happening below, I've slowed this down to 10% speed so you can see the guest appear and then instantly teleport out. He's up here, and he can't even see me even if he was looking my way. All we have to do is head over, crouch below the entrance, look straight up. At the moment I haven't even spawn proof for skeletons entirely, so there's a few coming through as well. But every 15 seconds another Gaster 3 comes through and we can kill them. The tears and most of the drops aren't immediately absorbed. What happens is they instantly teleport back to the overworld, wait 15 seconds, and then come through to me on the next portal cycle. I'll kill a few rounds, do a bit of inventory cleanup along the way. I can't believe we've finished three farms above the nether roof in what's been an almost reasonable amount of time, minus the AFK sessions. I've only been at this for a little while now, and I have almost three stacks of gas tears. That's very impressive for the amount of work we've done. And here I am in the end. I've already crafted up the 72 end crystals with all the tears that we collected, a bit of the blaze powder, and the eyes I had. I'm not exactly stocked up on blaze powder anymore, but we had enough. Let's get to summoning these dragons. The plan for this is simple. Stay alive. One way I've seen many people lose hardcore worlds is when fighting later dragons in their world. They get cocky because they have elytra, and they let the dragon into their personal space. I will not let her anywhere near me. No, I won't be underneath her using my sword. No, I'm not going down with the Enderman unless I'm summoning, or I have to. We're going to get this job done, and we're going to do it quickly. The whole sequence of 18 dragon fights took me just under 90 minutes. That's about 5 minutes each, but given the time spent killing Endermen, placing crystals, waiting for her to be summoned, and death animation, it took on average a little over 3.5 minutes per actual fight. Let me show you how that went down. Watch her health here. These two shots were so much fun, so I pulled them out separately to show you. That was a look away arrow. I had no idea where she was. I was just surprised that that hit her, so I threw another one out there. I threw that blindly as well. When I turn back to actually finish the job, she's dead. Both of those shots hit. Huh. I was just waiting for her to come back over to me. That wasn't meant to kill her. Oh well. Back to the safety of home now. Let's check it all out. I'm going to go to statistics, mobs, and the ender dragon, and it says you've killed 20 ender dragon. Yes, I did.
Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that little vignette of today's build. Forgive me doing a few chores while we talk about our project for the day. I've never really made my Minecraft world feel alive, or feel lived in. We've been on a bit of a farm grind lately with the lava smelter, the guardian farm, the hoglin, magma, and the gas farms. I've been out doing things in the world too, like getting netherite, bringing LAs home, completing advancements, and defeating the dragon after dragon until all 20 gateways were open. But it's been a little while since I've built anything just to build, to expand the village, and to enjoy the world we're creating. While I was out doing these random chores around the house that just needed to be done, I thought we should stay close today and build a blacksmith for the village. I saw a concept in another game, I think it was Ark, and I really wanted to see if I could replicate it how I remembered it without actually looking the build up. So today we're going to try and pull a build out of my memory and into Minecraft. I'm not the best builder, so excuse anything that you might consider mistakes, as I learn and have a little bit of fun today. The end of this episode will also bring us just over 800 days into the world, and ever closer to that community vote at day 1000. If you're new or you forgot, all subscribers will have the chance to vote whether I keep this hardcore world, or if you'd rather I start over and try again. Essentially it's my job to create a world you don't want me to lose. That's the ultimate point of hardcore, right? Get you invested in my world, make it a little sad, make it hurt a little when I do die and the world goes away forever. It's no surprise hardcore Minecraft is so popular when it plays with our emotions just a little bit. I have plans for our remaining 200 days. Some pretty big plans. I want to dig out the lower city back on the Megabase Island. I want a wither skeleton farm so we can farm withers and set up beacons all over the island as well. I'd love to complete all advancements so we can start using things like TNT dupers, free cam, etc. But there's a lot to get done in a short period of time. I don't know if we'll finish all of that. So why take the time out and build a blacksmith now? Well, this starter village is very quaint, very medieval. The dock is nothing fancy. My house is simple cobblestone and logs with some stone. The tower is a bit more magical, but the villager hall is again just perfect for this small little village, but nothing more really. The Megabase Island on the other hand will be a bustling metropolis with a lot of villagers, workshops, university, a training ground for troops, and a large prismarine covered castle overlooking the entrance bridge. I want to contrast the two civilizations and show the class difference present in the two. Adding a blacksmith back here should remind us that this village is a bit old, a bit dated. I want someone viewing this village to feel like they've been transported back in time, much like in the opening scene. If you can hear the clanking of the anvil, the open fire roaring, and the people milling around going about their simple lives, then I've accomplished something today. I imagine this blacksmith would have been built the way most shops would have been back then. I've cleared a flat space for myself and I'm going to lay a flat stone floor. It's a very simple but effective one and it creates a foundation for our structure to sit on. I'm also going to be building this block by block and bit by bit today. I'm not going to rush through it with time lapses and speedy clips. This is the project for the day. I want to show you the build process that I go through. I imagine this blacksmith being built in the way most shops would have been back then. So I've cleared a flat space for myself and I'm laying a flat stone floor. It's simple but very effective and it creates a foundation to build our structure on. That structure will have three parts. First will be the smith itself. Here we'll have a forge with the open fire, a few blast furnaces and a tall chimney. We'll need more than that, but that'll come later. After that, I'll add a bit of raised storage. I'll have a ground level basement and a higher layer to store all the extras that don't just sit out in the open. Materials, supplies, any finished products, all of that will be in the tall tower in the back. For the build, I decided on a block pelt that I thought would also suit the rest of the village. I use a lot of stone, stone brick, and spruce. And for the roofs, something a little bit different. I want to use brick. I feel like brick's going to add a little bit of color and it's something we definitely need to make the village look a little bit more vibrant. Also, they're non-flammable, and I'm sure that would count for something in a blacksmith shop. The tower will have a wider variety of blocks. I want to make the bottom look a bit worn, and on the front edges near the water, I'll use andesite to look like wind, and on the back side where the tower is, I want it to look like rain has run down the mountain, and the ocean breeze has made it a lot darker, perhaps even a bit muddy back there. A bit of moss growing around it would make it feel a little less looked after. Anyways, I spend a whole lot of time talking to you guys and speeding through the projects we have going on. Let's try something a bit different. I'm going to find some era appropriate music and just let it play while I build. I really hope you enjoy this episode.
I need turtle eggs to lure zombified piglins away from a platform that will become a wither skeleton farm, and I need to do it on time crunch. This is the farm, let's go build it. I flew near the wool farm and found this beach with about eight turtles and apparently one wandering trader on it. I've been collecting eggs for a little while now. I just need four for the farm, but while I'm here, I'll gather some for later. One of the other unique items you need for this farm is cobwebs. I rarely collect these for fun, so we didn't have any at home. I do have a mesa right around the corner, so it was easy to get the three that I'll need. I also did gather up a few more. We're getting into that part of the game where if I need three, I collect 30, so I don't need to keep coming back out for resources. I don't have an auto sorter yet, but we're getting closer now than ever to being able to find everything easily. I went home and put a couple more shulkers of material together that we'll need for the farm. Need to smelt another wreck, but we'll do that soon. So here's the plan. Today we're going to dig out the lower city area of my base. That's a 201 by 201 circle, and we're going to go 26 layers down, replacing the last layer with grass for about two thirds of it. Essentially, I've got to mine just over 700,000 total blocks, and I want it done before we hit day 1000. I currently have one beacon. To have any shot at completing this challenge, I'm going to need a lot more than one beacon. So we're going to build ENX-04's Wither Skeleton Farm. I don't want to spend the time spawn proofing the nether fortress area to make a farm. So we're going to make his really amazing and easy version. Should help us hit our goals within a reasonable time, and the build itself isn't all that difficult. To me, it's probably the best Wither Farm most of us can make. I do need a lot of nether rack to smelt in another brick, so we'll grab some of that. Hopefully the order I've chosen to build this world is starting to make sense. I needed a super smelter before I needed to smelt nether rack. This farm takes approximately 14 stacks of nether brick, which requires smelting 56 stacks of nether rack. That's a lot if you're using regular furnaces, but the lava smelter helped out a lot here. Not only that, I didn't waste the nearly 500 coal it would have taken to smelt this much material. As the nether brick starts coming in, I can craft the nether bricks that we're going to need. The idea behind this farm is to make a flat platform within a bounding box of a fortress, that's the outer edges. Fortress mobs like blazes and wither skeletons can then spawn on the platform, and we can lure the wither skeletons into the farm with an iron golem that only they can see. Let's grab one more inventory full of netherrack and take it back to get smelted. I do love having this super smelter here already. One day we'll make this room look nicer though. Once this batch finishes, we'll be done here. We'll have just over 13 stacks and we can use a little bit of the actual fortress, so this should be fine. I flew around in the nether until I found a fortress within a soul sand valley that was far enough from other biomes to work for this farm. Originally I was going to clean all the blocks above the fortress area, which I did for a few levels, and I realized this was kind of dumb, and decided to come back and start from the fortress itself instead. While flying back in, I had a startling revelation. This is the second fortress I found, and the second double blaze spawner. I'm not even sure how that's possible, but sadly these ones had to go. So I'm going to use this level here for the farm. I made a bit of a mistake, I should have used the wall layer as the top of the farm, but I got ahead of myself and having a bit of the platform already built was too enticing. So I measured the Y level of the wall, but actually used the Y level of the roof. Oh well, I can fix that later. The first thing I need to do here is cover four connected chunks with one giant platform made entirely of the nether bricks we smelted earlier. Fortress mobs can't spawn on dirt, soul sand, nether rack, or any other block, which is why I had to smelt all these bricks. I also do have to be kind of careful. This is still a fortress in a soul sand valley. There are a lot of wither skeletons and other mobs already wandering around below me. By the time this episode finishes, we'll have nearly a thousand days spent in this world. If you're enjoying the series or just picked it up and want to watch where I take this world, please consider subscribing. We've grown tremendously since starting this world and I really appreciate everyone being here as we expand and start to take on some really cool projects. Early game is fun, but we're about to head into some really epic farms and builds, especially once we have enough beacons to gather whatever amount of resources we need. And don't forget, only subscribers get to participate in the thousand days vote to keep the world or start fresh. At a certain point, building this farm becomes slightly more hazardous. You can see that wither skellies are already spawning on the area that I've built. I've kept the roof at too high deliberately so they can't spawn on the majority of this platform, only the areas that were exposed. Let's give them a quick whack. Dang, no skulls. Okay, that's half the platform finished. Let's whip out a bit of camera magic here. With these last few blocks placed, we can be done with this platform. To align the golem's height perfectly, we're going to start with some chests in the floor here. And to prevent magma cube spawns entirely, we're going to put walls every third block just like this. I'm using diorite walls because we will rarely ever have to see this farm again, and I had way too many from previous projects already created. I will admit the idea of bopping one of those pigs and getting them all angry was slightly scary, but at least they spawned here, not the blazes or wither skeletons. It was actually a peaceful kind of build, even though I could hear things spawning below me the whole time. I could hear the wither skellies walking around and blazes moving. Even a gas shot at me at one point when I was almost entirely underground. With the walls in place, I'll use the turtle eggs we collected at the start of the episode to lure the zombie piglins into the corners. While I'm at the AFK spot, these eggs are just slightly out of spawn range, so the piggies will walk toward them and then they'll despawn, freeing up the mob cap for more wither skeletons to spawn. I can't completely prevent blaze spawns, 
but a small jump on the AFK platform will then remove this entire platform from spawn range, so I just hop up, despawn the platform, and then more wither skeletons can come through again. This area I've built now will be for the iron golem. He'll be in here now, so I'm going to need to create a slightly higher roof area so he can spawn and the wither skeletons can see him. I know one oops click while I spawn this golem could mean the end of the world, so I was pretty careful about moving him into place. I was always ready to run instantly if he looked at me wrong. Thankfully it worked out. I love that these piglins are distracted and trying to get to the egg. It's at arm and eye level, but because it's on a wall, they simply can't reach it. I love Minecraft mechanics that don't make sense. I want to break you. I have a sword, but I simply must do it with my feet. Well, anyway, after finishing the lower section of the farm, I needed to head back to the nether roof to build the kill chamber. That's when I discovered that the entire farm build had been a mistake so far. It was at this moment that he knew. I wish I was kidding. The soul sand valley that I found below the nether roof by flying randomly around was the same soul sand valley I built my ghast farm in above the roof already. But um bump. Uh, I really wish that wasn't going to be a problem, but I know it is. When I AFK this farm, we will for sure be spawning in ghasts as well. They're going to get teleported to their kill chamber, but without me there killing them, it's going to start to take up mob cap and slow this wither skeleton farm down quite a lot. I'm sure we'll figure something out. I'm going to keep building. The kill chamber for this farm is mostly glass, so nothing can spawn. There's another portal that will connect from the chamber below to an overworld bridge back to this portal where they'll then drop down and I can kill them through a small opening here. We'll get the occasional blaze, even a skeleton or piglin can get pushed in here, but for the most part we're only going to get wither skeletons. We can light this now and head through. As always, I'm not trying to show you every block of how to build this farm, but the link is in the description. Ian's farms have powered this world since the iron farm we started with, and this is no exception, so go show him some love on the original video. Now I can just break this portal we came through. And let's use temporary blocks to go up to the bridge location. Up here we're going to build two portals that I mentioned before. Essentially one of these portals will be one block higher than the other. The lower one will then connect to the farm. The upper one will connect to the kill chamber. Yeah, nether portal connections are weird, but they do work. This is a little portal elevator and it's a pretty interesting concept. That's how the bridge looks now. I just need to add a few slabs, light the portals. I'm going to add some cobwebs right here. And I can light this portal and go through on this side. Mobs have a 15 second cooldown before they can go through another portal. We're going to use the bridge and the cobwebs to slow them down just enough to give them time they need before they reach the other portal. By the time they get there, they're ready to instantly teleport again. It's kind of the same mechanic as how the guardian farm works with the gates, if you remember that. I'm changing this door out as zombie piglets can actually break wooden ones in hardcore. As simple as that might seem, that's the wither skeleton farm done. Well, except for the part where I counted from the top of the walls and then built the spawn platform one level lower. Currently I'm 129 blocks from the platform and literally nothing can spawn down there. 200 IQ play. This was very confusing for a little while. I figured out that something must be wrong. Now you can see I'm going to start to get wither skeletons through. That proved that my idea was right. I am just one too high. I'm standing on a dirt block here on my pillar, one lower than I was before. So the entire platform is too high. That's okay. Killing this first batch of skeletons is pretty satisfying though. We even managed to get one skull from it. So I returned to my AFK spot on the pillar so I could have a think. How do I want to fix this? I did consider moving the whole thing down so it looks exactly the same as the tutorial. But honestly, I wasn't sure how the nether portal reconnection would work, or how many wither skeletons would be on the overworld side ready to murder me. So I decided to simply let the skeletons fall one extra block and lower the platform like this, extending the kill chamber down just one block as well, and now they fall here and we're back in business. This farm works very well considering I did zero actual spawn proofing or hard work. Let's see what's going on below. The wither skeletons try to get to the golem, and they go through the portal, across the bridge in the overworld, and back to me. Then I just chop them all up and we go again. This is basically now unlimited coal, bone, and wither skulls, as well as a solid source of blaze rods considering how many you need in a single player world. I could sit here farming these for hours. It's very satisfying when you normally kill wither skeletons manually to have such a great farm. I haven't had a really good wither skeleton farm in a world for a very long time, so this felt really great. But eventually I had a ton of skulls and needed to go make those into nether stars and eventually beacons. I'd like to build a wither killer here, but sadly I did all 55 of these ones manually. While I kill the withers in the background, let me explain how I fixed the gas farm problem. If you remember how the gas farm works, we actually use a composter at the gas's face to make sure it doesn't suffocate. However, a gas doesn't have to be killed by the player, so what I did was I put an extra block next to the composter that's just a solid block, and it suffocates the ghasts. Essentially, that gas farm is now always running as long as I'm running the wither farm, and I got a ton of gas tears out of it. We're never going to have to AFK that farm by itself ever again. So a bit of a mistake, but it all worked out. I really don't have to show you 55 withers dying, do I? We can just assume that you understand that I killed them all and we can move on? Cool. Let's do that. I know what some of you are going to be thinking during this project. 
Why are you hand digging this hole? Just use flying TNT dupers, you doofus. Well, you're right in one way. This is the hard way. There's one beacon set up and there's five more. We're good to go now. That's 99% coverage. Let's start the dig. So hear me out. I need the resources. I'm going to need more resources than I can even collect in this hole. If you think about the size of my outer wall alone, it's 363 circle and it took exactly 1024 blocks of wool to create this outline. That's 16 stacks. I'm building a mostly stone outer wall that will be at a minimum 20 blocks high. That's 320 stacks of stone for one side. Then there's the other side of the wall, another 300 stacks. Add in the walkways, the arches, the middle bridge, the stone I need to actually just keep building this world. I'm going to need somewhere around a thousand stacks of stone for this mega base. A thousand stacks. That's a lot. That's over 18 double chests of stone alone. TNTing and blowing up all those resources sounds really silly now, doesn't it? Yes, yes it does. Let's look at my stats real quickly before we start this project. Podzel mine, 68,000. Dirt, 50,000. Stone, just under 36,000. And none of the other stones like granite, diorite, or andesite has anything over 6,500. They're all closer to two and 3K. In total, I've mined about 45,000 of these blocks. We'll come back to statistics near the end of the video. Before I start digging though, understand that in the middle of this project, I had to store most of the blocks. I dug out the edges straight down like this so I could keep them in line easily. I occasionally needed to empty the iron farm because it would get over full. And I would smelt copper here and there to use up some of the excess lava I was accumulating. The lava farm is consistently full with me around it. It's actually over full. I was also aging a bit of the copper, but mostly I was just digging. And before you ask how I lost 55 levels, because I know somebody's going to ask, I made extra netherite picks. Most of the clips you're going to see are sped up to somewhere between 50 and 100 times their original speed. The total dig took over 26 hours of mining, repairing, and collecting the blocks. I completed that over about six days, and yes, that's a lot of mining in a very short period of time. I had over 40 hours of raw footage for this episode, and another 25 hours of replay mod footage. So if you are enjoying this episode, it would mean a lot if you'd like and subscribe. I have never done a project this large in such a short time, and I really tried to get it out for you guys. And remember, I can't take as long as I want on this dig. We started the turtle egg collection around 860 days into the world. I only have 140 in-game days to collect the materials, build the farm, get the skulls, kill the withers, and do this dig. Otherwise it wouldn't be ready for the thousand day vote, something I desperately wanted done. Every time you see the sun rise and set, rise and set, we're closing in on that timer running out on me. I definitely focused up for this project. I did nothing else. I didn't explore. I didn't sit around in AFK. I didn't do hardly anything but dig, collect, and repair. That new guardian farm came in mega clutch during the digging, and I did end up making an extra three netherite silk touch pickaxes because repairing was just too frequent before that. I should have made another five, to be honest, it would have gone faster. Oh, and just a side note, I know it can be tempting to think hardcore YouTube is often faked, so I've included nearly every block I broke during this dig. There was no slash fill air here. I think I've put the clips back in the right order, but all the footage is here for your time lapse enjoyment. If you're not interested in watching the satisfying layer removals, you can jump ahead to 21 minutes and 13 seconds to see the last section get removed and see the final statistics. For everyone else, enjoy this oddly satisfying block mining montage.
And with this last section, that'll be 26 layers now completed. In total, there are over 790,000 air blocks in this hole. The entire lower city area is now cleared out, and you can start to see how the megabase will look with the long, tall bridge going straight into the large castle with the upper and lower city regions. It's time to check those statistics that I promised. Here is the before image, 35,880 stone mined. And here's the after, 599,981. And yes, I'll go mine another 19 stone to make it 600,000. I also have over 100,000 mycelium, nearly 90,000 dirt, and I mined over 30,000 diorite, granite, and andesite. So what's left for today? I want to quickly add the dirt to the lower city so grass can start spreading. I placed some grass blocks already in the hole, outlined the bridge, now it's all about placing the dirt I need. I don't need to cover the first area closest to the castle, that's going to be for another purpose, but I do need to cover most of the rest of the lower area. As you can see, the grass will already start to spread. I'm really glad I placed those first and didn't wait until I was done. When I got closer to finishing this project, I really wanted to try and complete the dirt layer by day 950, but I couldn't quite get there. It took me an extra three days, and then you can see with the time lapse just how many days it took to place this much dirt. It was a lot more than I thought it was going to be. So this is the result of all of today's work. By the end of this video, I will have survived for a thousand days in hardcore Minecraft. Day count is a useful but very limited way to tell how a world is progressing. What can you get done in a thousand days? Well, that matters way more. When this series started, I said that after a thousand days, we would hold a community vote to decide if you wanted this world to continue, or if you wanted me to start over and try to do things differently. We'll get to that at the end, so stick around. For now, I need to show you how I finished my first 1,000 days in Hardcore Minecraft. To me, Minecraft progress is determined in three ways. What bosses have you killed and adventures you've been on? What automated farms help your world stay productive? And what aesthetic and sometimes useful buildings have you built to expand your world? On day 970, I started digging a new underground room that will house two new farms today, a stone and cobblestone generator, as well as a basalt generator. These two machines will help us easily get building blocks whenever we need them. This room is opposite my lava smelter in the main castle, so I'm going to make it roughly the same size and shape. Long term, I'll add more farms to the other side of this room and fill it. I don't want a lot of always-on farms near my base, as that will create a lot of lag, so my plan is to build as many farms and machines with on-off switches as possible. Both of these farms are very low lag producers, so they should be excellent options. Okay, let's start building. A stone generator is a very simple and useful way of obtaining a lot of common building blocks like stone, stone brick, mossy variants, cobblestone, and smooth stone. When I use silk touch in the farm, I'll get the stone. If I swap to a fortune pickaxe, I'll obviously get a lot of cobblestone instead. The farm produces both and very quickly. Later on, if I need much more cobblestone, I can use a TNT based farm. But until I finish all advancements, remember that one of our rules is I can't dupe TNT yet. This farm makes use of a few solid blocks, some trapdoors, water, and one bucket of lava. 
Otherwise, all you really need is a little bit of redstone to set up the piston clock and a haste 2 beacon nearby to instamine the stone. If you don't yet have a beacon, you can skip the redstone clock and just use this as a safe way to get a lot of stone and cobblestone manually. The two channels I've created on the left and right sides keep the water source blocks safe while the water flows over the hoppers. Later, the lava will spread over those blocks to create stone wherever the lava touches the exposed running water. Because it can't touch the source blocks when you mine the new stone, the water will flow in again first, and then the lava will turn it to stone again. Haste lets us instamine the stone, but because haste is so fast, we're left waiting around for the stone to form. By creating two columns of stone instead, we can get pushed back and forth and mine 10 stone before starting over, rather than just 5 from a single column. The delay in timing is what makes this particular farm so ridiculously effective. You're essentially mining nearly constantly. All we need to do now is add one bucket of lava in the middle here. Stone's going to start forming around all 10 of those spaces, and after the initial spread, the farm will convert the flowing water much, much faster. Now let's set up the player pusher. You'll be pushed between these two alternating pistons automatically, and can simply hold down the button or use F3 and T to automate this later. This area down here will contain a redstone clock, which is a fairly simple circuit to build. I've completed the clock and this button here will start it. I'll drop a lever on this side and then cover up the remaining redstone before adding another lever to the other piston. You'll occasionally need access to the button, so consider moving it up so you can reach it to start the farm. Let's give this a test and see how we're going. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? This is a very fast stone generator that will produce more than you ever need. The next farm I'm going to build requires five ice to get started. So of course I'm going to collect a couple stacks while I'm out here. Now this is another block generator, this time for basalt and smooth basalt. Much like the stone generator, it's a fairly low lag farm and will just sit behind the stone generator in this underground room. Basalt requires three elements to be created, lava, ice, and soul sand. Other than that, we're going to lock some hopper mine carts into the soul sand and build a very similar looking, but ultimately quite different contraption to the stone generator. Some pistons will push the soul sand down onto these mine carts that we can add to these tracks. The mine carts will ensure no matter how much basalt we're collecting, we don't lose any and overpower the hopper collection. A couple levers on these solid blocks will do the trick, and with that the hopper mine carts are now locked down. On one side of the farm now we can add a channel for the lava, and on the other the ice we collected earlier. When the lava runs toward the ice but over the soul sand, basalt will get formed. We do need to source lava for each of these, so a few buckets here from the lava farm next door. And the farm is working. I'm just going to add one more thing to fix it up. We're just going to put a slab right there. That'll let me get right up next to the basalt. And then the same as before, we can just hold down the left click, and if you want, use F3 and T if you want to automate it. And that's the basalt generator completed. Whenever you're playing Minecraft, there are little tasks you just never get done. They're the fixes, the tweaks, the extensions, and all those missing pieces that would make your world just a little nicer, but they don't drastically change that much about how it operates. For me, all those little fixes were next in the world. I don't want to go into a thousand days with a thousand little projects waiting on me. So what did I want to do? Well, I wanted to expand the iron farm storage. That's been a problem all series long. A couple double chests was often full and wasting iron. Now I've expanded the area by more than double the storage. It's not perfect, but it's a small early game iron farm that we'll replace soon. If you let me continue the series. I'm not going to spend a lot of time fixing a farm that I want to replace. I just want it a bit better. A much larger storage issue that I have is with the flushing mob farm. This farm uses two double chests at the moment, and that's nowhere near enough storage. In the 119.3 update, this farm actually breaks completely. Before that happens, I want to AFK it and store up a lot of gunpowder, bone, and string. But I can't do that with just two double chests. So for this one, I put in quite a bit more work. I went ahead and built a full item auto sorter underground, so I can easily expand the storage and add as much as I could ever want before I do an AFK session here. With kind of a larger project done, I want to go take care of the smallest little issue, but one that's been bugging me for so long. The Enderman farm is missing two pieces of carpet on the roof. I noticed it one day, but I didn't have carpet on me, and I keep forgetting. But not today. Today we're going to fix it. Just knowing that's done makes me so much happier. For my next small but smart project, I'm going to move the enchanting setup from the general mob farm to the guardian farm. There's no way I'm using this farm for XP anymore, so moving the enchanting setup is an easy must. I'll continue to enchant for things like bows, bolt pickaxes, and other tools, and any other enchantments I may need like I did with the trident and crossbow. Adding a glass walkway to access these further storage chests is also a really great idea, as this farm has way too little storage, but that's going to be a bigger project to fix on another day. With the enchanting setup moved and chests more accessible, it's time to move to the mega base island and do a bit of cleanup as well. I still have six beacons set up from the 500,000 stone dig. These are no longer needed here, and just making the island look messy, so they have to go too. What? What are you doing in my swamp? Good question. I finished all of my incomplete projects with time to spare. I still had almost 20 days to build, so I decided to make a crazy OP farm. 
However, when I figured out what it required, it was going to take over three stacks of slime balls. I had 30 at the time. Instead of messing around with killing slime for this, I changed the plan. I'm going to make a looting based slime farm in my remaining days, and then use the drops from that to make the ridiculously OP farm I had planned in the next episode. If there's the next episode. This farm is by the ever amazing ENX04, and he'll be linked in the description again. Anywho, for the last time in the first thousand days, let's time lapse this build. And just like that we have a slime farm. I wanted to see how this would work over a couple of nights so I would kill slimes at night and then I'd spend all day resource gathering. I chopped a bit of oak wood, terraform to make the farm more productive, and flew back and forth to the local spruce taiga to add more podzol to finish the farm. For no digging and no real hard work, this farm is incredible. It produced over six and a half stacks in the first night which wasn't even a full moon. Over the next few nights I was able to collect almost 30 stacks of slime balls, that's way more than I needed. At this point I was making really great progress. The slime farm took about 12 in-game days to complete, then I ran it for a few nights, but we still had a few days left before the thousand ran out. I wanted to improve this basic nether portal for as long as I've had it. I've talked about it more than once in previous episodes. Today we're going to build this into a stone and spruce gateway that will seamlessly blend into the village I've already built. I'm going to still keep the outer fence around this, I think it's a very smart precaution. I don't want to just hope my torches keep mobs out. I want to virtually guarantee a wandering creeper that wanders in from far away. Can't just sneak into the portal while I'm mining or not paying attention. I'm going to be building a much larger, more grand nether portal in my mega base, so I don't want to compete with that for attention. I just want this to be a small portal frame that can improve on the generic one that's been here for 900 days. And this is what we ended up with. It's definitely an upgrade. With time now very short, I decided to do something I've never done and make two custom trees near my house. I wanted these to be savannah native trees, mainly acacia, but not Minecraft acacia. I noticed in my research that acacia trees have some very green leaves if they're near water, so I decided to do both a dry savannah tree and this first one near a small river and oasis. Using oak leaves for this tree gave it a much greener and bushier leaves as it would in real life. While it was strange to see at first, the more I did the research, the more I realized how my acacia was as realistic, if not more so, than a Minecraft variety. So I used some non-conventional blocks in the tree as well. The more I learn about building, the more I see that a lot of great Minecraft builds are built using blocks based on how they look, not how they function. I wouldn't normally add like stone walls in the middle of a tree, but the gray looked right for the branches, so I chose to keep this here this time. These rough diagonals also seem to benefit from some stone support instead. It thinned the branches as they went up, which looked a lot more natural. Around the tree trunk I built a river and small oasis, where I planted various types of greenery, from sugarcane to bamboo, berries, wheat, and even add some lily pads to the water. It's not a desert here, but I wanted to bring a little life to the one place that could easily support it. Then I added string above the sugarcane and bamboo so it won't actually grow any taller. And this is how my small oasis looks now. I finished the other tree, built a couple of small rock outcroppings, and now we need to recap a little bit. We started at spawn on day zero with nothing but a dream to get this world to 10,000 days. Soon after I built myself a stone and spruce house which we've lived out of for the entire series so far. This has our storage, our dog, and our bed. I'd call it home. 
After that, I fed myself with a small fishing dock, a boathouse, and of course a little boat about to dock. This was my first purely aesthetic build in the world, although I did fish off it for some food. But not long after I wanted to upgrade our food production, so we built a large animal barn and a cow cooker in the back that we'll talk about more in the farm section. I then got villager trade summon with a 32 villager trading hall with all the trades we need. It also contains a small villager breeder. I do keep that turned off most of the time. From there, we spent a little while in the second aesthetic build of the world, which is a gradient tower along the shore that looks beautiful every time we return home. Recently, I built this blacksmith smeltery and tower to include more ambience in the world. The village lore feels more complete with this build now. Today, I completed the Savannah Oasis as our first natural structure, as well as a more traditional acacia tree. Around the home and village, I decided to also add several stone clusters, rock formations, and some natural terraforming. I'd like to continue adding more of these clusters as we go, I think adding a few of these small builds makes the area look a little bit more like a custom biome. And the last of our aesthetic buildings in the world so far is our renovated nether portal adding this custom frame. And this is how the village looks as a whole, from the dock to the tower and back to the blacksmith. The buildings all tie together and for a non-builder, I'm very happy with this progress. I have never built this much in a Minecraft world before. Finally, I've done more than 40 hours of work, a minimum of 120 of the in-game days, making progress on our megabase plans. I've outlined the outer walls and towers, the castle, the inner walls, and the upper city as well as digging out more than a half million blocks to prepare the lower city to be built. I still have a lot of work on this project that I would love to do. But now let's talk about all the farms we've built in this world. I built this iron farm before I had built anything in this world, and I've only ever used this farm for iron. We will upgrade this one soon, but this has done all of our iron needs so far. And I built a general mob grinder for gunpowder, bone, bow and arrows, and our first XP source in the world. We modified it to give string for scaffolding later. And we solved our early game food problems with this cow cooker and used it until we had another roof access. Now it sits quietly in the back of the barn. After that was a small cactus farm, a nano crop farm, and that solved our carrot and potato shortages for villager breeding. From small farms, I moved into this massive wool farm, which has 48 sheep and works two times faster per sheep than the traditional design, making this farm six times faster than a standard 16 sheep layout. After beating the Ender Dragon and collecting three Wither Skulls, a Wither Rose farm under the End Gateway, and an Enderman farm were next. Now I have access to real XP in this world. And this scaffolding flushing mob farm helped me get enough gunpowder to acquire full netherite and detonate an entire shulker of TNT in the nether. The bone meal also powers the nano crop farm easily. My 50 furnace lava super smelter was always going to be the next build in this world. We needed lava for future projects, and the smelting power comes in very handy. A small bee farm runs near the lava smelter so I could make use of all the work I was doing on the mushroom island. And our last XP farm upgrade is this guardian farm. After running to the enderman farm a dozen times to repair gear during the big dig project, I realized putting this in the overworld near the megabase was a great, great idea. It's actually the best idea I've ever had, maybe. Moving to the nether, I built a very small version of my lava-powered hogland farm, then a portal-based magma farm, and a magma-based gas farm. Not pictured is the Wither Skeleton farm that sits just across from the gas farm. And today we've built ourselves the last three farms, a basalt generator, a stone and cobblestone generator, and of course the slime farm that we just finished. That's all the builds and farms in the world already, and as far as the other criteria, I've defeated all three bosses, the Ender Dragon, the Wither, and Elder Guardians of course, I've completed 87% of all advancements. But that's the sun setting behind me on day 999. Now it's over to you. I'm going to link the community poll as the first link in the description, and now you get to decide, do I get to keep this world or should I start again? The first 1000 days have taken 240 hours to record, nearly 500 hours of footage including replay mod, and hundreds of hours to edit and upload. If you made it this far, please do like, comment, and subscribe. I look forward to the vote results no matter what they tell me, and for now, goodbye. Thank you so much for watching that video, I really appreciate it. These are bonus scenes shot with the complimentary shaders turned on. Thought I'd give you guys a little something extra if you made it this far. I'll see you soon. Goodbye.